Chapter One of the Reign of Queen Anne, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Reign of Queen Anne, Volume One, by Justin McCarthy. Chapter One The Woman Born to Be Queen. One of the poets of the later Victorian literature, William Morris, has told in his melodious verse the story of the man born to be king, the idea of which is taken from that rich treasure house of fantasy, the Gesta Romanorum. The story, however, is very different from that which begins under the heading of this first chapter, the story of the woman born to be queen. William Morris's hero becomes king in default of every hereditary claim to such a position, and in despite of all disadvantages, difficulties, and seeming impossibilities, just because nature had endowed him with the special gifts which are sure to win for their owner a complete success. Queen Anne, on the contrary, was born to be a queen, and under no other conditions could have had the slightest chance of becoming the ruler of a great monarchy. Anne was the last of the Stuart sovereigns. She was the second daughter of James the Second by his first wife, Anne Hyde, who was the daughter of Edward Hyde, afterwards Earl of Clarendon, the famous lawyer, politician, and historian. The marriage between James and Anne Hyde was one of the sensations, indeed in a certain sense, one of the conventional scandals of the time, for public opinion was much shocked when it became known that a marriage secretly contracted had been carried out between the daughter of a man who, no matter what his capacity, was born a commoner, and James, the Duke of York, as he then was, heir presumptive to the throne of England. Edward Hyde was known to have felt, or at all events to have feigned, great indignation when he found that his daughter had allowed the Duke of York to contract an alliance with one who was not a princess. Anne was born at Twickenham on February 6th, 1664, and she came into the world at a time as full of threatening change and movement at home and abroad, politically, morally, and intellectually, as a history of England can picture. The child thus born was destined to a place in history which may well be described as unique. The mere mention of her name brings with it to the mind of everyone who has had any education, or even any opportunity of desultory reading, the idea of an age illustrious in war, in politics, in literature, and in art. It brings with it, too, the thought of an age which became a turning point, not only in the history of England, but in the history of Europe. The old world of political life seems to have closed for England, and the world of modern politics to have begun with the reign of Queen Anne. Parliamentary government, says Lord Macaulay, is government by talking, and the true reign of debate, as the overmastering power in parliamentary and political life, established itself with the reign of Queen Anne. England never, perhaps, had so great a soldier as Marlborough. Except for the name of Wellington, there is no name to be compared with his in the modern history of England. English political history down to the latest days, recalls the name of no parliamentary debater, greater on the whole than Bolingbroke. The reign of Anne saw the most momentous struggle in which England was ever engaged on the continent of Europe, until we come to the days of the French Revolution and the first Napoleon. The age of Queen Anne stands out a distinct epoch in the history of the world, it takes rank with the age of Pericles in Greece, with the Augustan era in Rome, with the Elizabethan era in England. 
the mere mention of any one of these eras brings with it the thought of a peculiar success as great in the achievements of peace as in the achievements of war, as great in arts as in arms. But in such instances as those, when we associate an era with one name, we bear with us the natural and well-sustained impression that the owner of the name had at least something to do with the greatness of the era. When we speak of the age of Queen Anne, we cannot possibly associate the greatness of the era with any genius of inspiration coming from the woman whose name it bears. Anne was born to a great era just as she was born to a crown and had no more to do personally with the making of its greatness than if she had been born in a garret to a life of commonplace obscurity. Even the worst faults of Elizabeth may be seen to have had some share in creating much of the picturesque greatness, at least which belongs to the Elizabethan age. But even the best virtues of Anne had little or nothing to do with the inspiration or the promotion of the greatness which marks her reign. The writer has thought it not amiss to begin his survey of Queen Anne's life and reign by observations which might naturally have seemed to belong rather to a closing review of the whole, because he is anxious to direct the reader's attention from the very outset to the curious contrast which the history of the reign presents between the extraordinary character of the age and the utterly commonplace character of the woman whose name it bears. In more than one fairy legend we read of a princess over whom a magical spell has been cast and who sleeps all her life away in an aerial tower while wars are carried on in her name and conquests are added to her domain and wonders of art and letters are accomplished in her capital and all the world knows of these thrilling and marvelous doings except the poor princess herself who reigns but does not know it. The story of Queen Anne might, in a certain sense, seem to belong almost as completely to the world of enchantment. The sleeping princess in the magical tower had about as much to do with the great triumphs which were accomplished in every field during her reign and in her name as Queen Anne, in the whole course of her mature life, had to do directly and personally with the achievements of England abroad and at home. History has done stern justice to the rule and to the policy of James the Second, but it has not done justice to his motives or to his personal character. As to his rule and his policy, there can hardly be a second opinion among responsible historians and impartial critics anywhere. But there seems a great deal to be said for the personal character and the public motives of the man which most historians and critics and popular opinion generally in our own days and earlier have left altogether unsaid. The history of Europe hardly contains the name of any ruler who is so completely out of public favor. Richard III has found his champions, but no such stroke of good luck has fallen to the fortune of James II. Charles I has even still a select circle of devotees in England, and his has always been a picturesque figure, which romance and drama have loved to illustrate. Macaulay said with great truth that Van Dyck's brush created for generations a hero whom the judgments of history could never dethrone. Some of the most uncompromising opponents of the divine right theory are quite ready to recognize good qualities in Charles the Second, to see that he was a man of wit and culture with better education than that of most princes of his time and after, and with at least some generous instincts and enlightened purposes. But hardly any one has a word to say in favor of James the Second. In Ireland, where so many brave men laid down their lives in defense of his cause, it has become an accepted legend that James was a positive coward and that the Battle of the Boyne might have ended quite differently if James 
had had to sustain him one spark of the courage possessed by William the Dutchman. Yet it is certain that James in his earlier days was highly praised for his courage by the great Turenne, under whom he served, and who can surely be regarded as competent to form an opinion on the merits of a soldier. There is a common impression in England that James was a man of no principles, although it is certain that at more than one crisis of his life the Stuart cause might have had a fair chance of success if James could have been prevailed upon to change his religion, or even to announce that he had changed it. The fact probably is that James meets with universal condemnation because the principle which he advocated is either universally condemned or wholly out of fashion among Englishmen. In order to do anything like justice to the unfortunate James, we must judge his personal character and his personal doings by the light of his own principles and not by the light of ours. It is not too much to say for him that he was a sincere martyr to the cause of divine right. It is so hard for a reasonable Englishman of our day to get into his mind the possibility of any sane person sincerely believing in the right of a king to govern a people exactly according to his own liking, that he can only explain James's conduct by assuming that James was an utterly insincere and self-seeking personage. But all that we read of James, even in the writings of those who most strongly condemn his policy, will give warrant for the conviction that he was an unqualified believer in the principle of divine right, as Richard Cobden was in the doctrine of free trade, or Father Matthew in the doctrine of total abstinence from intoxicating liquors. James was a fanatic in his way, and a fanatic whom evil fortune for himself and others had put in a position to do immense harm by the enforcement of his doctrine, but we may at least concede to him the merit of being sincere in his fanaticism. There is absolutely nothing to be said in defense of James's system of rule unless it be said by those, if any there be at present among civilized men, who not only believe in the principle of divine right, but also believe that a king thus called to the throne can never do wrong. It would hardly be possible to find in history the accredited records of any sovereign who governed, when he had the chance, with a more absolute disregard for all the principles and practices of constitutional liberty, even as these were recognized in the England of his time. Then again, in his private life, he was quite as immoral as Charles II, and indeed many chapters of his personal history would seem as if they might have been suitably chronicled by Saint-Simon. Even his marriage his first marriage, that is to say, was contracted under conditions which make it a sort of public scandal. James had large families of children, legitimate and illegitimate, but among the children born to him by both his wives, very few attained to anything like maturity. After the death of his eldest daughter Mary, who reigned with William the Third and became heir to the English crown. Of her father's character and temperament, Anne seems to have inherited little more than a strong inclination toward the doctrine of divine right, especially when that right was illustrated in the claims of the House of Stuart. None of her father's worst qualities seem to have descended to her. If she had as little sense of humor as he had, and if she showed that she could sometimes be as silently obstinate as he habitually was, she had none of his moral corruptness, and happily for the people over whom she came to rule, she had none of his self-conceit. It is necessary to enter a protest against the unqualified and unconditional censure which history in general has pronounced upon James the Second but the protest only refers to certain articles of the censure. 
James has often been set down as a coward, which he certainly was not, and he has been almost universally accused of insincerity and of mere self-seeking when he was positively acting in his wrong-headed, narrow-minded way under the influence of what he firmly believed to be his divine right to rule his people. Anne had not been fortunate in the husband whom fate and family convenience had imposed upon her. She was married in her twentieth year to Prince George of Denmark, brother of the reigning sovereign of that country, and Prince George was perhaps as characteristic a specimen of the good-for-nothing as any age or condition could have produced. He was not exactly a bad man, but nobody seemed to find anything to say in his praise. He had no opportunity of doing much harm during his lifetime, and he kept himself for the most part conveniently in the background. Historical controversy has not troubled itself about him. It is said that he was the occasion of the one only joke ever made by his father-in-law, James the Second. The story goes that when James, in his hours of political danger, was receiving successive announcements that this, that, or the other public man had gone over to the side of the invader William, Prince George always greeted the news with the words, Est-il possible? The hour came at last when George himself went over to the side of the invader, and then King James asked with a smile, Has est-il possible gone to? Anne was brought up in the Protestant faith and always adhered to it. When the great crisis came, she abandoned the cause of her father, which had indeed become already quite hopeless, and in 1689 the crown of Great Britain was settled upon her in succession to William III by the Bill of Rights, as the act making the decree was called. Anne had a large family of children, but all except one died at birth or in mere infancy, and even the one surviving child, the little Duke of Gloucester, looked upon the earth but for a few years. Therefore, when William's wife Mary, eldest sister of Anne, died and left her husband a childless widower, it became necessary to cast about for some new arrangement which might secure the succession in such a manner as to exclude the exiled Stuart claimants. Not often in history has this sort of quest been rendered necessary, and in thinking it over one is sometimes reminded oddly of the story based on some historical evidence that the rightful successor to a Byzantine throne was absolutely advertised for by public proclamation. In the instance of the English monarch, the quest was rendered all the more embarrassing because there were so many relatives and connections of English royal families scattered all over the continent of Europe. The object was to hit upon some order of succession which should seem to have a legitimate and reasonable claim to justify it, and at the same time should shut out as strictly as possible any connection with the banished Stuarts. This end was at last accomplished by selecting the electress Sophia of Hanover, who had on her mother's side some family connection with Charles I, and who was the head of a German house which was not likely to have much sympathy with Charles I's exiled and proscribed descendants. The electress Sophia had a son, George, and therefore, if she should accept the arrangement, there seemed good reason to count on continuity of succession. The electress Sophia was not particularly anxious to assume the responsibilities imposed upon her, but she was a shrewd, clever woman, and although at first she saw no reason why she should accept the offer, yet by the force of thinking the matter out, she made up her mind that there was no reason why she should not accept it, and that it might, on the whole, bring many advantages to her family. The matter was therefore satisfactorily arranged by the Act of Settlement, which was passed on March 12, 1701. 
Anne had not long to wait for her succession to the throne. William III was in very feeble health. His physical frame was thoroughly worn out by a life of what the Scotch balladist calls sturt and strife. No one, however, expected his immediate death, and indeed for some little time it had been thought that his health was improving. One evening, in the end of February, 1702, he rode out, as he had lately been in the habit of doing, to Hampton Court. On the way, the king's horse stumbled over a molehill, and William was thrown to the ground and broke his collarbone. He never recovered from the effects of this accident, and he died at Kensington Palace on March 8, 1702, in the fifty-second year of his age, an early death if estimated according to the ordinary rate of human life, but not too early for the accomplishment of a great revolution in the history of England. Anne was then Queen of England. She had but lately entered her thirty-eighth year. Bishop Burnet tells us that upon the king's death, the Privy Council came in a body to wait on the new queen. She received them with a well-considered speech. In this well-considered speech, she expressed great respect to the memory of the late king, in whose steps she intended to go for preserving both church and state, in opposition to the growing power of France, and for maintaining the succession in the Protestant line. She pronounced this as she did all her other speeches, with great weight and authority, and with a softness of voice and sweetness in the pronunciation that added much life to all she spoke. The two Houses of Parliament met that same day and agreed to send addresses to her, full of respect and duty, as Burnet describes them. The Queen answered both very favorably, and she received all that came to her in so gracious a manner that they went from her highly satisfied with her goodness and her obliging deportment, for she hearkened with attention to everything that was said to her. It does not even need the high authority of Bishop Burnet to make us well assured that the capacity to be or seem to be a good listener is an invaluable quality in a new sovereign. Two days after, Burnet tells us, she went to the Parliament, which, to the great happiness of the nation and to the advantage of her government, was now continued to sit, notwithstanding the king's demise, by the act that was made five years before upon the discovery of the assassination plot. In her speech she repeated, but more copiously, what she had said to the council upon her first accession to the throne. There were two passages in this speech that were thought not so well considered. She assured them her heart was entirely English. This was looked on as a reflection on the late king. She also added that they might depend on her word. Both these expressions had been in her father's first speech, how little soever they were afterwards minded by him. Bishop Burnet lays some stress on the fact that these two passages produced an unsatisfactory impression, and his remark would be worthy of citation, if only that it illustrates a difficulty which beset Queen Anne from the very outset of her career. If anything, she happened to say should remind the public of her father, the majority of people might be filled with the dread that she was likely to prove just such another sovereign as he had been, and if her style of reply seemed obviously and purposely unlike his mode of speech, a certain number of other people would be sure to set her down as an ungrateful daughter who was only too anxious to stand aloof from any manner of association with her father who had died dethroned and exiled. If one were to compare the ruling capacity of Queen Anne with that of the sovereign whom she followed on the throne of England, it might seem as if an anticlimax had come to pass, not less strange and striking than that which was seen when the rule of Oliver Cromwell was followed by the rule of Richard Cromwell. 
The mere mention of the names, however, is enough to illustrate the difference between the one succession and the other. The name of Richard Cromwell means an ignoble blank in English history following immediately after the masterful and momentous domination of the great protector. The reign of Queen Anne must be forever memorable in the history of the English constitution, of English letters, and of English arms, even though it came immediately after the reign of William the Third. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Reign of Queen Anne, Volume One by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. What the Queen Came to at Home. Now that Queen Anne has been solemnly enthroned as sovereign of Great Britain and is receiving addresses of loyal congratulation from various cities and towns and corporate bodies of all kinds, it is well to take a rapid survey of the political and social conditions presented for her study, if she had the capacity or inclination to study them, by the England of that day. Anne, the last of the Stuart sovereigns, may fairly be described as the first of the constitutional sovereigns in these countries. William the Third had indeed laid the foundations of the constitutional system by which we mean the political system that depends avowedly on some sort of representative principle and is not merely the expression and realization of the sovereign's will and pleasure. But William had not much time or opportunity to settle down into the sheltered condition of a constitutional ruler. He had had to fight in order to gain his throne, he had to fight in order to maintain it, he had to fight in order to secure for England that place among the states of Europe which he believed her entitled to assert, and it was still not by any means out of the question, that he might have had to resist a counter-revolution at home. He was a great statesman as well as a great soldier, he could read the signs of the times, and he saw clearly enough that the day of absolute monarchy was gone by for England. He saw, however, much more than that. He saw how the new constitution was to be constructed and how it was to act in the future. He was like the inventor and the constructor of some new model of sailing ship who has got the vessel ready for sea and has even taken the command, but is for a time prevented by stress of weather from giving his experiment a fair trial, and is cut off by death before the ship can make her first trial. Parliament in the days of Queen Anne was more like the Parliament which we know in our own times than any of its predecessors had ever been. The conditions under which William the Third had settled into the sovereign position gave to the parliamentary chambers a power of control over the will of the sovereign which had not existed during any previous reign. The king could no longer maintain his army except through supplies which were voted by parliament, and therefore the king was no longer able to put off the summoning of a parliament as long as it was his royal pleasure to act for himself, without taking the trouble to consult the parliamentary representatives. The relations between the sovereign and his ministers had now for the first time taken the form in which they are familiar to the political life of our own generation. Up to the time of William the Third, the institution which we now know as the Cabinet had not yet come into existence. At the present day, it would be hard indeed to find any legislative authority establishing the existence and defining the functions which are as certain, as practical, and as essential to the working of our political constitution as any other part of our whole parliamentary system. In the days before William the Third, the king consulted with such of his ministers as he thought fit 
and left some of them out of the consultation altogether according as his humour directed him. The king entrusted any one of his ministers with such duties as he thought that minister most likely to discharge in a manner satisfactory to the royal purposes. A favourite minister was often entrusted with negotiations or other business of the utmost importance concerning which his companions in office, for they could hardly be called his colleagues, were favoured with no information whatever. There was no collective responsibility involving all the ministers, even those who formed what may be called the inner circle of the king's advisers. There was, in point of fact, no recognised and official prime minister as we now understand the meaning of the title. The prime minister and the cabinet became established and recognised realities about that time in English history when Queen Anne was called to the throne. The policy of the state in home or foreign affairs could no longer be settled by the sovereign's own will and pleasure or by the decision of the sovereign acting in consultation with this or that member of the ministry. There was a prime minister and there was a cabinet of ministers, every one of whom was entitled to be consulted on each great question coming up for decision and every one of whom was understood to have his share in the responsibility which each decision brought with it. There was, therefore, a body of men having seats in one or the other House of Parliament who were responsible for the defence and maintenance of their policy in either assembly, who could be questioned as to their policy and attacked because of it, or censured because of it if they failed to command support enough to sustain them, or fail to convince their habitual opponents that in this particular instance their policy was just. Parliamentary debate was therefore growing more and more to be one of the vital forces in the working of the constitutional system. Then again, that which we are accustomed in more modern times to speak of as the power of the press had been endowed with something like a reasonable freedom of utterance during the reign of William the Third, It was no longer part of the recognized system of government to come down with sharp and sometimes savage punishments on any audacious offender who presumed to put into print some opinions of his own which seemed offensive or even untimely to men in power, of course, there were severe laws in existence against newspaper criticism of personages in high office for many generations after Queen Anne had passed away and down to a time not far remote from our own. But the legislation by virtue of which William III had been able to secure his place on the throne of England had distinctly conferred a degree of tolerance to printed comment and criticism which did not exist under the Stuart dynasty or in the days of the Commonwealth. During Queen Anne's reign, the political air may be said to have been thick, with whole flights of pamphleteering criticism coming from all quarters and descending on every field of politics, letters, art, and social life. Most of these, although certainly not all, were allowed to go unpunished. Much of the work of criticism which is done by the daily or weekly newspaper now was done by the pamphlet in the time of Queen Anne. The most casual and cursory reader can observe the difference in all that concerned political and parliamentary debate between the reign of Queen Anne and that of James the Second. Queen Anne's reign seems, in this part of its history at least, like the opening of some new chapter in civilization. The centre of public interest is no longer in the palace of the sovereign, but is within the precincts of Parliament. The statesman who desires to maintain his place must now carry along with him the public opinion of the country, and can no longer silence by the mere threat of his prohibition 
the voices of any critics who might feel audacious enough to disparage his policy or to question his motives. The place from which he can best command the attention of the public is his place in the House of Commons or the House of Lords, and if he has in him the genuine capacity for debate, he is only too glad to throw his whole energy and his whole soul into the splendid parliamentary battle. The power of eloquence is, in fact, resuming that place in the government of states which it had held in the days of Pericles and in the days of Julius Caesar, and had lost during the long ages when kings and soldiers managed the government of states among them. It is not too much to say that we can picture several of the leading figures of Queen Anne's Parliament in many of the great parliamentary debates of Queen Victoria's reign, just as we can imagine Sir Roger de Coverley taking a turn in the Temple Gardens with Colonel Newcombe. The awakening power of the English Parliament was accompanied by a corresponding activity on the part of the English press. The press, however, as has been said already, made its activity felt more through the influence of the pamphlet than of the newspaper. We shall have occasion to notice how one of the greatest Englishmen of his time, in his own field of literature, one of the greatest Englishmen of any time, Daniel Defoe, made himself a genuine popular power in the political and religious controversy of the day. We hear a good deal about Daniel Defoe in the commentary of Bishop Burnet on some of the great questions, the burning questions, as they would have been called at a later day, which were occupying the attention of Parliament and came under the special notice of the historian of the Reformation, with whom these pages have more to do as the author of The History of My Own Times. The name of Bishop Burnet is almost as completely identified with the life and politics of Queen Anne's reign as that of Daniel Defoe himself or any other of the eminent writers whose literature helps to make up the glory of that reign in one way, as did the genius of Marlborough in another. Bishop Burnet was not a great man in the nobler sense, and perhaps we are not entitled to give him any higher position as a chronicler of the reigns of William the Third and Anne than that which Boswell holds in regard to Samuel Johnson. But just as we have to construct our Samuel Johnson with the help of the illumination shed by Boswell, so we are compelled in a great measure to form our ideas as to the men and the movements of the reign of William and of Anne under Bishop Burnet's guidance. Bishop Burnet's history has become a sort of classical authority, in a certain sense, with all readers who study the events and the persons belonging to the reigns of King William III and Queen Anne. The good bishop called his book A History of My Own Times, but the more modern editions of the book and the references to it by more modern writers almost invariably entitle it for some unexplained reason as Burnet's History of His Own Times. The book is undoubtedly a work of great historical value. Burnet's views are not always quite impartial, and even his statements of mere fact are occasionally inaccurate. The estimates he forms and the conclusions he draws are not always in keeping with the judgment which events unknown to Burnet, events which could not have been known in his time, have compelled later historians and readers to adopt. But the value of the book to any careful student of history is not much depreciated by Burnet's occasional mistakes as to fact or misconceptions as to character. The history has the inestimable advantage of being a history of the man's own times, and even when we can clearly see that he was mistaken in this or that statement or opinion, it is nevertheless a matter of the greatest importance to the reader to know that such were the impressions formed and the opinions accepted by an observer who was living and moving among the scenes and the persons described in the work. 
when Bishop Burnet tells us casually that he conversed with King William on this or that event the day after it happened, or that he received directly from Queen Anne such opinions as she thought fit to give him on some question of importance at the time, we cannot help feeling that anything coming from such a man must have a distinct value quite apart from the narrator's own capacity to form an impartial historical judgment. No figure is more often made the mark of satire than the self-sufficient person who settles every question relating to the condition or the ways of any foreign country by the declaration that he has been there and ought to know. In private life to this day we are apt to be put out by the dogmatic self-satisfaction of this authoritative personage, and we are for that reason often inclined to attach little importance to his testimony, even when we have no positive evidence to discredit his statements. Perhaps one feels sometimes inclined to entertain a like sentiment toward the good Bishop Burnet when he invites us to believe that he understands the characters and the motives of all the illustrious men and women whom he was in the habit of meeting. It is certain that in his own days he was the object of much sarcasm from the satirists and wits of the time, and that men like Pope and Swift were not slow to make it clear that they saw a very comic side to his character. Still, it is no less certain that Burnet continues to be regarded as an authority on the history of his own times, and that the clever things which Pope and Swift said about him are forgotten by the great majority of readers. Anyone who reads the book will easily see for himself the principal weaknesses of Bishop Burnet's nature and temperament, just as anybody can see for himself the principal weaknesses in the character of Mr. Pepys. But we can hardly understand to the full the history of the court of Charles the Second without taking into account the testimony of Mr. Pepys, and in the same way, to a still greater extent, we should fail to understand the real history of the reigns of William the Third and Anne, if we failed to give due weight to the testimony of Bishop Burnet. The history of my own times has a fascination for the reader which does not depend on vivacity of narrative or beauty of style. There is no reason to question the sincerity and the good faith of the man who lived in such times and moved among such personages. We can always take it that he is giving us what he believes to be genuine evidence. His own personal, political, and religious partialities are made so clear to us that we can easily allow for any bias in his judgment, and we are not likely to follow him into wrong conclusions because he has allowed his own judgment to grow color-blind here and there, or to be led astray from the main track because he has occasionally made an unsuccessful attempt at a shortcut in his eagerness to show that he knew the right way better than anyone else could know it. The realm over which Queen Anne came to reign could not be described in any sense as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Scotland had her own parliament and her own laws, and even claimed a distinct and separate order of succession to her sovereigns. There was almost as much rivalry of trading and commercial interest between England and Scotland as between England and the United Provinces of the Netherlands. We shall presently see that these very jealousies and rivalries of trade and shipping had more to do than even political influences with the condition of things which was soon to force on public attention the momentous question whether England and Scotland were really to unite into one political system or were actually to separate into rival states. Ireland was still merely a conquered country, held by force under the dominion of the English sovereign. Ireland was still suffering severely from the effects of the iron rule and the remorseless conquests of Oliver Cromwell. In the interesting and really instructive life of the great protector by the distinguished American soldier and politician Theodore Roosevelt, now President of the United States, the author 
whose admiration of Cromwell is never allowed to interfere with his impartial judgment, tells us that the only excuse for Cromwell's dealings with Ireland is to be found in the fact that other English rulers before and after Cromwell had dealt as severely with what is commonly called the Sister Island. The fact is that at the time of Queen Anne's accession, the greater part of the Irish population were in sympathy with the claims of the Stuarts, merely because they still remembered with bitterness and passion the manner in which Cromwell had dealt with their country, and were willing to welcome as a friend the descendant of the sovereign who had been dethroned and done to death by the overmastering protector. The people, as we understand the expression in our modern days, could hardly be said to have any influence on political movements at the time when the reign of Queen Anne opened. The voice of what might perhaps be called the people occasionally made itself heard in approval or disapproval through the lungs of noisy mobs in some of the larger cities or towns, but there was no clear idea of any such thing as popular representation or even of any popular organization which might represent in political and social controversy the views and the interests of the working classes. The bitterness of dispute among the various religious denominations was keen and sometimes even ferocious. Many an English Protestant seemed to be in serious doubt as to the grave question whether he ought to dread and hate the Roman Catholics more than the dissenters or the dissenters more than the Roman Catholics. Readers of this generation, looking composedly back over the history of Queen Anne's reign, are naturally inclined to set it down as a matter of fact that the principle of constitutional government has been generated by the process of political evolution and that there can be no return on the part of England to the earlier stage of historical development. But even the shrewdest observers who were contemporaries of Bishop Burnet and Daniel Defoe could not be expected to regard the existing state of things as a finally accomplished stage of political growth from which there could be no retrogression and to which there could be no interruption. The struggle for the Stuart family was, in fact, a struggle for the principle of the divine right of kings. A devotion, personal, sentimental, and religious for the Stuarts, had much to do with the persevering adhesion of so many in England, Scotland, and Ireland to the cause of the family which went into exile with James the Second. But there was more involved, although to a great extent unconsciously, than any question of personal or even of religious achievement. The time had come when the principle of divine right had to give place to the principle of hereditary succession, originating avowedly in the national choice and not in any supposed investiture of the sovereign and his successor by divine ordination. So far as the formal choice of the country itself was concerned, there was perhaps not much more to be said for the principle of hereditary succession than for that of succession by divine right. It would be impossible to contend that the great majority of Englishmen Irishmen, Scotchmen, or Welshmen had been in any way invited to consultation and decision on the question whether the crown of these realms was to be given thenceforth to those who represented the House of Orange-Nassau and not to those who represented the House of Stuart. But the idea of inviting the majority of the people to any consultation as to the form of government had not then come up in the state affairs of modern Europe, and the choice of the nation was always assumed to be determined by the relative influence of leading statesmen and leading families on the one side of the question or the other. The weakness of the Stuart cause consisted in the fact that England had by this time outlived the principle of divine right. That principle had become an anachronism and was no more to be maintained against the newer principle of hereditary succession than, at a much later day, 
the old world fashion of travelling by horse-drawn carriages could be maintained against the newer practice of travelling on lines of railway. There was much blood yet to be shed in defence of the divine right principle. It had for many succeeding generations large masses of followers devoted to its cause, and indeed there are even in our own age and in these countries intelligent men and women who still believe in the divine right of the Stuarts to go on governing the realm after their own fashion. But so far as practical politics in these countries were concerned, the divine right system was outworn and was already becoming a mere tradition of the past. A power stronger than that of any mere set of Whig statesmen was against the old-fashioned system, the process of political evolution was the enemy against which no courage or self-sacrifice on the part of those who still upheld the Stuart dynasty could possibly prevail. In order to understand fully the whole story of Queen Anne's reign, we must bear in mind that to those who were living at the time it was still quite an unsettled question whether the fortunes of the House of Stuart might not yet rise to a restoration of the dynasty for all that had come and gone. We can often read, even in the writings of grave historians who came along after Queen Anne had passed away, dissertations on what might have happened if only this or that event had not happened, if James the Second could have been prevailed upon to renounce his religious principles and become a Protestant, if Queen Anne had made up her mind resolutely a little earlier, if she had trusted herself altogether to this and not to that set of statesmen. We can easily see at this distance of time that it was after all mainly a question of political evolution and that the English world had outgrown the principle of divine right. But when we have to study the character of Queen Anne herself, and the comparative capacity and trustworthiness of the statesmen who struggled for ascendancy in her time, we must always remember that even to the shrewdest and most far-seeing on either side of the political field, it still seemed quite within the range of ordinary possibilities that some sudden turn of events, the influence of some daring energy, or even the mere chapter of accidents, might bring the Stuarts to the front again, and set up a divine right sovereign once more upon the throne of England. There was, it is almost needless to say, no sentimental passion attaching anywhere in England to the memory of William the Third, or to the order of succession which his reign had established. William the Dutchman, as he was commonly called for generations after by those who belonged to the opposite party, had never been particularly popular in the country over which he came to rule. He was a foreigner to begin with, and his ways were not the ways of Englishmen. He had not even a son to succeed him, and the hereditary principle could not therefore work by its own direct movement. A new arrangement, a new compromise of some kind, had to be sought out and adopted in order to keep the new principle in continuous action, if William the Third had been the father of some prince who gave promise of being another Henry the Fifth, or even another William the Third, then everything might have gone steadily and naturally on, and there would have been little chance for the exiled representatives of the Stuart cause. But it was a serious crisis for England when it became apparent that nothing had been definitively settled by the kingship of William the Third, and that it required no less than a new act of settlement to keep the hereditary government going on. Then it soon became apparent also that the only practical way of attempting any reasonable form of adjustment was by accepting for the time a sovereign who belonged to the House of Stuart and taking the opportunity of her childless condition to arrange for a succession which should declare the Stuart family cut off forever. Seldom has there been in the history of any modern state a crisis more serious, and if we may use an expression which seems to carry something of a triviality with it, a crisis more peculiarly inconvenient. England had been impressed, 
so far as statesmanship could affect the impression, with the belief that the coming of William of Nassau would bring with it a rule of steady and abiding government, and would get rid of the Stuart claims, the Stuart succession, and all the essential conditions of the disturbance forever. Now it had to be admitted by King William's own chosen followers that it would be necessary to accept the succession of a Stuart princess and to devise some arrangement by means of which other princes, but not the Stuarts, must be brought from abroad to occupy in their turn the throne of England. Therefore, even when the Act of Settlement had been passed, the Hanoverian line had been invested in anticipation with the succession to the English throne, and the work, so far as the agreement among recognized statesmen and the decree of Parliament could secure it, had been accomplished. The mind of Anne herself and of many around her must have had frequent anxious hours. At any moment, the Stuart claimant might come over from France and land on the Scottish coast and obtain the help of the Scottish clans to make good his claim by force of arms. The England Queen Anne had come to rule was a country which, even if we include Wales, must have had a population of somewhat under seven millions. With the exception of London and perhaps Bristol, there were really no large cities according to the proportions of modern estimates. It has to be noticed as a curious characteristic of the time that in the opening of Queen Anne's reign, the populous and busy communities were found in the south and in the east of the kingdom. In our times, it is very much the other way. With the exception of London alone, the great manufacturing cities, the strongholds of the country's business and population, are found in the northern counties, in Manchester and Liverpool, and the great and growing towns which cluster around them, or in such places as Birmingham and other parts of the Midlands. Bristol was the great seaport of Queen Anne's time, and now its shipping hardly comes into consideration when we speak of the docks and the merchant fleets of Liverpool. It is not so much that Bristol has gone down as that Liverpool has gone up. At the time of Queen Anne's accession, the most important towns after London itself were Bristol, York, Nottingham, Exeter, Shrewsbury, Winchester, and Canterbury. Bath has indeed to be mentioned, but only because of its claims to recognition as a watering place and because of its history going back to the time of the Roman conquest, and by no means for any importance which it could profess to have as a center of manufactures or of commerce. Bath had always been regarded as a specially endowed health resort, so far back as the history of its existence can be traced, but it was only in the first year of Queen Anne's reign that it acquired its fashionable reputation and became recognized as the place which everybody ought to visit who desired to claim a position in what would now be called smart society. The once celebrated Bow Nash may be said to have created the fame of Bath for this particular purpose, and it made its influence felt in this way through the literature of Queen Anne and in that of Jane Austen and Charles Dickens. London itself was then a city of what may fairly be called enormous size when we consider the proportion of its inhabitants to the whole population of England. The great metropolis, at the opening of Queen Anne's reign, contained a population approaching in number to very nearly three-quarters of a million, or rather more than a tenth of the population which the best calculations give to England and Wales. In the years which have passed since that time, London has not merely maintained her relative supremacy, but has positively increased it, for the proportion of her population is even higher now, when compared with that of the whole country, from the Scottish border to the English Channel, than it was in the days when Anne came to the throne. London and Westminster were then two separate communities, divided from each other by distance as well as by name. The city of Westminster contained the famous historic abbey and the Houses of Parliament, while the centre of London life was the exchange. 
the stranger who in the present year happens to be in the lobby at the close of a night sitting in the house of commons will hear the words called out in stentorian tones who goes home through all parts of the building thus recalling to his mind the distant days when such an invitation was necessary in order that members might make up parties to journey home together through the dangerous roads which lay between westminster and london the tendency of fashion in the capital was then as it has ever since been and as it shows itself in most cities to grow westward but the fashionable london of those days would be regarded as a midland region at best by the dwellers of our west end of the present century london and westminster were miserably lighted by few and wretched oil lamps and there was no police force to take efficient charge of belated travellers the only organized protection which the wayfarers knew was that afforded by the incompetent and miserable civic watch which the local authorities provided in order to keep something like an appearance of security for those who had to make use of the public thoroughfares at night in gay's trivia in the spectator in some of swift's letters and in various records at the time we find ample and telling evidence of the nightly dangers which beset the path of the luckless ones who had to seek their homes unguarded by a retinue of servants after darkness had fallen upon the streets of london and westminster to add to the troubles of those days it should be said that london had not yet recovered from the effects of the great fire in sixteen sixty six and some of the new streets which it had been found necessary to begin at once after the wrecks of the conflagration had been cleared away had not yet been brought to what even in those days would have been regarded as a state of completion the england of queen anne's early reign held more than a million and a quarter of pauper inhabitants pauperism thus in fact absorbing about one-fifth of the whole population for a long time in the history of england the poverty of the country when the laborer had ceased to be a mere serf was left to the ministrations of private charity so far as it obtained any ministration at all the monasteries and other religious houses did the work of charity and after the suppression of the monasteries the clergy and the landlords of the parishes either did the work or left it undone in the reign of henry the eighth the statute of vagrants as it was called made some attempt to deal with the vast mass of idle pauperism which indiscriminate almsgiving was encouraging and even calling into existence by enacting that sturdy beggars who were able to work and would not work might be whipped for their idleness then there came the statute of elizabeth which dealt even more severely with the sturdy vagrant by enacting that he should not merely be liable to whipping but that he might be taken as a sort of serf and set to work compulsorily by any one who wanted to make use of his services but in the meantime laws were passed which set up something like a system for the employment of the poor who were willing to work and could not find work for themselves the poor law of henry the eighth recognized the fact that it was the duty of the state to make some provision for the deserving poor in order that suitable employment should be found for them or that relief should be given to them if they were physically unable to work disabled by old age or by weakness in that they should be kept alive either out of doors or in some sort of parochial institution the statute of elizabeth further extended and organized this system of relief and made it the duty of church wardens and overseers to provide work build poor houses and apprentice paupers not much change was made in this system until the great impulse to economical and social reform which set in with political reorganization in the reign of william the fourth the new reign had some bright omens to welcome its opening a wonderful era of literature had begun along with it the new era was not indeed one of great originality in poetry of a high order but it will always be remembered for its masterpieces in every department of prose we shall have to tell in later chapters of the men of literature who contributed so much 
to make Queen Anne's reign immortal, and we now only stop to note the fact that the new reign and the new era of literature may be said to have begun together. End of chapter 2「What the Queen Came to Abroad Queen Anne came in for an inheritance of continental war. The sovereignty created by William III had been born in bitterness and nurtured in convulsion. The political principles of his time had not allowed William to settle steadily down to the work of keeping his own kingdom safe and strong against any efforts which might be made by the dethroned Stuarts. Even so great a soldier and statesman as he might have found it hard business enough to make efficient preparation against all such attempts and possibilities and at the same time to foster and watch over the internal prosperity of his new kingdom. It was his fate to have to take part in a great continental war, which may be said to have involved the whole of the European states at one time or another in the long struggle. That war, of which we shall have to speak more fully a little later, was not one which, according to the ideas of the present day, had any direct bearing on the interests of England. Some impulse was undoubtedly given to the war spirit in England by the utterly unwise provocation which came from the King of France when he recognized the son of the exiled James the Second as the legitimate sovereign of England. But even if no such provocation had been given, it may be regarded as almost certain that under the conditions of the times, England would have been drawn into the great struggle which was then convulsing the continent for the maintenance of what was called the balance of power. That was the struggle which Queen Anne inherited, and she assumed it to be a necessary part of her duty and her business to carry it on. It had divided itself into two great military and political chapters, one of which came to an end before William's death, but the second chapter may be described as a necessary development of the first. The one great endeavor of the statesmanship of Europe seemed then to be the endeavor to maintain the balance of power on the European continent. We hear but little of the balance of power in our own days, and many years have passed since it was the subject of any serious account in the parliamentary debates of Westminster Palace. It is perhaps not unreasonable to say that it ceased to occupy the attention of the Houses of Parliament since the doctrine of nationalities came to be accounted a living principle in political affairs. There was a time, however, when statesmanship distracted its brains with schemes for the maintenance or the redress of the balance of power. It would not be easy to reduce the principle to any theory capable of definite expression, and perhaps even the rival statesmen who disputed in Parliament about the balance of power would have found it as difficult to agree on the precise meaning of the words as they found it difficult to agree on the practical application of the doctrine. Yet it may safely be said that during a long period of European history the balance of power had quite as much to do with the promotion of war as the passion for conquest or the rival claims of dynasties. The central idea, however, of the policy which went in for adjusting the balance of power was the idea that certain European states had acquired, rightly or wrongly, by fair means or by foul, a title to divide the continent of Europe among them, and that an innovation made by any of them or by any new power arising outside them or within them was an unlawful attempt 
to disturb the recognized order of things and ought to be immediately put down by force. It was perhaps the doctrine of divine right breaking out upon the world in a new form and under a new name. The embodied statesmanship of the ages, which succeeded the recognized reign of mere conquest for the avowed purpose of conquest, would seem to have set itself to find some basis of compromise and arrangement, and to have found it in the principle of the balance of power. This newer statesmanship said to itself, Behold, here we have Europe divided practically among three or four great predominant states, and this arrangement must undoubtedly be the direct dispensation of providence. Let it therefore be regarded as an act of impiety as well as of wanton destructiveness for any one to interfere with the order of things which we find established, and let us treat any attempt at interference with it as an overt act of war. The great recognized powers of Europe were then England, France, Spain, and the Austrian Empire. Russia was slowly coming to a knowledge of her own strength and was beginning to assert her claim to a share in the arbitration of the balance of power. Spain had reached her zenith and was distinctly going down. If Russia had not yet recognized her own strength, Spain, on the other hand, had decidedly outgrown and exhausted hers. Spain had, not long before, stretched her empire farther over the world than the empires of the Caesars had ever reached, and indeed Spain may be said to have accomplished what Alexander the Great only wished for, the discovery of new worlds to conquer. The decay of Spain's greatness as a conquering and domineering power has been described by Macaulay in some of his most picturesque and characteristic pages as the result of her bad system of government at home. No one can deny that every word said by Macaulay about the evil systems of government into which the rulers of Spain caused their country to sink is well deserved. Spain's misgovernment of her Flemish subjects forced on that revolt of the Netherlands which was maintained by generation after generation until the oppressed at last succeeded in making themselves free. Something like the same story might be told of other provinces where the Spanish rulers by sheer misgovernment and oppression made the yoke of Spain unbearable and led to new disruptions of the Spanish Empire. But it is coming of late to be recognized that there is a natural principle of growth and decay in great states which seems to be almost a part of the physical system of nature. The life of a state would appear to have its allotted season of growth and decay like the life of a man. At all events, it may be reasonably contended that the greatness of a state, its season of supremacy over its region of the world, must have its natural time of decay as it had its time of development, and that no state can overshadow all its neighbors for an indefinite lapse of time. No form of government, however enlightened, practical, and beneficent, could have made the Roman Empire endure down to our own time, and although Spain might have lasted longer than she did if her system of government had been founded on better principles, it seems quite clear now that in Queen Anne's time, Spain was sinking into the inevitable decrepitude of old age. Holland was then one of the rising countries of Europe, and as she had no pretension or desire to become one of the conquering states, she could safely look forward to a long life of quiet prosperity if only her neighbors would let her alone. Sweden had lately begun to distinguish herself in war, but her fitful, brilliant incursions into the battlefields of Europe had only amazed and startled the world as the invasion of some northern pirate fleet might have amazed and startled a French or English seaport. The Turk was still a trouble to Europe, but the days when it was feared that he might overrun half the continent had evidently passed away. Italy was divided among various 
lords and masters, and indeed her very name was only as Metternich long after declared it to be, a geographical definition. The growing greatness of France and the sinking condition of Spain were the facts which in the mind of statesmanship at that time seemed most seriously and immediately to threaten the balance of power in Europe. The statesmen of England were then, as at most other times, particularly anxious and watchful about the growth of the influence of France on the European continent. Every succeeding year of Spanish decay seemed only to offer new invitations and opportunities to France for the disturbance of the balance of power. We shall the better understand the feeling of England toward France at that time if we carry our recollections back to what we all know to have been the feeling of many English statesmen only a few years ago with regard to the growing power of Russia, there was then a nervous anxiety about every movement made by Russia. With certain of our statesmen, it did not need evidence of actual preparations against any of England's eastern possessions to make them convinced that Russia's very existence threatened danger to England and that it would be a part of the patriotic duty of Englishmen to make common cause with the very Turk himself if only by such companionship we could check the ambition of the Muscovite power. The time may possibly come when readers of history will find it as hard to understand what business England had in promoting and taking part in the Crimean War as matter-of-fact readers find it now to understand what business England had during the early years of Queen Anne's reign to trouble herself about the attitude of France with regard to the vacancy in the succession to the crown of Spain. The quarrel, as has been stated, was none of Queen Anne's seeking. Anne may be said to have inherited it, just as she inherited the throne, for it would hardly have been possible for her, under all the conditions, to strike out a new policy of her own, even if she had had the mind or the strength for a new policy. The war to which Anne succeeded began out of the rivalry between the aggressive policy of France and the defensive policy of other states on the European continent. Louis the Fourteenth was then King of France, and during his reign the kingdom over which he ruled had risen to such a position in letters and arts as it had never enjoyed before, and to such a place in arms as it never held again until the days of the great Napoleon. The constant dread of other continental states was that France might be tempted at any moment to extend her territories this way or that on one pretext or another by the mere force of conquest. William the Third was naturally a close observer of the policy of France and watched with anxious and jealous eye every movement on the part of Louis the Fourteenth, which seemed to threaten fresh annexation. William was a shrewd and crafty politician as well as a soldier, and he did not scruple, on more occasions than one, to enter into terms with Louis, to pack cards with him, if we may adopt the language of Shakespeare's Mark Antony, for the purpose of making some arrangement which might at least postpone a threatening war, even though the arrangement were to be made at the expense of some smaller state. There came a crisis, however, when William found it impossible any longer to deal with the policy of Louis by other means than the arbitration of war. Spain was then ruled by one of the weakest and least capable of monarchs or men, Charles the Second. The immediate trouble was that Charles was childless, and that, in his condition of health, it might be taken for granted that he must die without leaving any direct heir to follow him in the line of succession. In the year 1700, Charles died childless, and then came the momentous question, who is to have the throne of Spain? No difficulty whatever arose in this instance, from the lack or scarcity of claimants. The throne of Spain was not by any means going a-begging. 
The trouble was that there were too many claimants and that each claimant had too many backers. One of the claimants was the Dauphin of France, another was the Emperor of Germany, and yet another was Joseph, the Electoral Prince of Bavaria. Now in the case alike of the Dauphin and the Electoral Prince, all right of succession to the throne of Spain had been formally renounced by the parents of both at the time of their marriage, because if such renunciation had not been made, the union of these pairs would have been regarded by all Europe as boding threats of intolerable disturbance to the balance of power. With regard to the family of the emperor, there had been no such formal renunciation, but then the claim of the emperor's family by its degree of relationship to the dead king of Spain was the weakest of the three, and in any case it must have been evident to all the world that the successor to the imperial throne of Germany would never be allowed to enter into peaceful possession of the Spanish throne as well. On the other hand, it was hardly in the nature of things that the heir to the monarchy of France could be quietly allowed to establish himself as the king of Spain, even if there had been no formal renunciation of his claim at the time when his parents were married. The two rising rival powers on the European continent were then the monarchy of France and the curiously constructed, partly federated, partly despotic empire of Germany. It was out of the question to suppose that the other states of Europe would look calmly on and see either France or Germany become owner of the vast territorial possessions of Spain. It might be said, indeed, that there were two states of Europe, England and Holland, which had but little direct concern in the disputed inheritance. The people of the United Provinces, as the Dutch and Flemish populations were then termed, were essentially a trading and navigating people who had not long succeeded in establishing their independence who had no ambition to extend their territory, were only anxious to be let alone and to follow the occupations in which they were becoming more and more successful, and who could have sailed the seas and sold their merchandise just as well though France or Germany became master of Spain. But the trouble with Holland was exactly that, which has been concisely described by Schiller's Wilhelm Tell, one must be ever in trouble when one has bad neighbors. Holland was always, and not unnaturally, on the watch against encroachments from some of her neighbors, and she knew well enough that the stronger this or that neighbor became, the more likely he would be to grasp at new acquisitions of territory. Holland, therefore, from the first, showed herself most active in all the endeavors that were made to bring about something like a final and satisfactory settlement of the claims to the Spanish succession. England, on the other hand, would appear to have but little direct interest in the dispute. Even if the heir to the King of France were to succeed at once to the crown of Spain, and thus in time become King of France and Spain together, it was hardly probable that his wildest schemes of aggression would lead him to contemplate the annexation of England. William might, of course, have kept to his island sovereignty, looked about the prosperity of his people and the strengthening of his dynasty, and left the continental powers to settle among themselves by force of arms the future ownership of Spain, but even if William had been endowed by nature with the temperament of a philosopher, it is not likely that he could have given full scope to the impulses of such a temperament at a time when the balance of power was still a dominating principle in the politics of Europe. William, however, was not left to settle the question in his own mind by a statesmanlike study of the possible effects which the crisis might bring with it to the balance of power, a sudden and apparently a spontaneous act of insult and defiance on the part of the King of France brought William at once to his feet and into the great quarrel. 
James II had been for a long time in exile in France, and his claims to the English succession as well as his personal bearing had made an impression on the mind of Louis XIV. When James came to die, the heart of Louis was touched, and in an impulse of something like quixotic generosity, he formally recognized James's son, the old pretender, as he was called in later days, as King of England. When the news of this audacious stroke of policy was brought to England, it created such a storm of anger all over the country that William would have had much difficulty in holding his people back from war, even if it had been his purpose to keep them within the lines of peace. Of late years the English people had had rather too much of continental embroilments. William, who had warred against France up to the settlement of Riswick, had since then received but slender encouragement to carry out the strong and enterprising policy which he believed best suited to maintain England's place among the great powers of Europe. Now he found in a moment that he could count on the full support of his people in a forward policy. The insult of the King of France, as it was then regarded by the vast majority of Englishmen, had done it all. The existing Parliament, which had been slow to vote the supplies William thought necessary to carry out his military plans, was dismissed, and a new Parliament was summoned which showed itself ready to maintain him to the full in any course of action he might deem it statesmanlike and patriotic to follow. Even before this had come about, the English ambassador had been recalled from France, and the ambassador of King Louis dismissed from London. By the energy and the influence of William, the alliance was restored and England, the German Empire, and the United Provinces of Holland pledged themselves to resist the aggressive policy of France and to prevent the kingdoms of France and Spain from being united under one sovereign. This was the Grand Alliance, the crowning work of William's ever active life. The reader who contemplates this particular chapter of history will see one fact at least clearly established amid all the confusion of claims to succession and counterclaims, and all the rival and conflicting interests of dynasties and of systems. The political development of England had advanced one step beyond that of France. In France, the recognized head of the state was able to pledge his people to the cause of divine right, while the ruler of England only occupied his throne by virtue of a principle of hereditary succession which recognized the right of the people to have something to say in the settlement of their monarchical line. England had indeed to go on a quest among the royal families of Europe in order to find the one which could claim the nearest relationship to some royal house of England, while at the same time disclaiming any title which identified it with the pretensions of the House of Stuart. The Bill of Rights and the Act of Settlement admitted and represented some claim on the part of the state and the people to institute a new line of succession, maintaining, when it had been instituted, the principle of hereditary descent. France still held to the divine right of kings, a right which was maintained until the Great Revolution went to work with a new experiment. The European struggle which we know as the War of the Spanish Succession was, with her kingdom, the inheritance of Queen Anne. William did not live to carry it on. Seldom in the history of any country has an entirely inexperienced sovereign come in for so tremendous a crisis with the creation of which the new sovereign had absolutely nothing to do, and probably no other woman sovereign has ever come so suddenly into an inheritance of such portentous responsibility. The relative value of the rival claims made to the throne of Spain is a matter of but slight account to the readers of history now. There was so much of intermarrying among members of the continental houses that it was hardly possible for any sovereign to die childless without leaving his kingdom open 
to the competing claims of various aspirants, each of whom contended, with some plausible array of argument, that his birth brought him nearest to the order of divine right. None of the continental sovereigns, or of the statesmen who served them, thought for a moment of settling the question by any reference to the wishes or the interests of the Spanish people themselves, nor was there any way of settling the controversy by an appeal to some international areopagus. Strokes must arbitrate. The rival claimants must fight it out, with such help as each of them could get from neighbors who had no direct and personal interests in the quarrel. No question of principle, either in statesmanship or morals, was concerned in the controversy, or could be invoked as a direct influence on its settlement. It was a dispute of grasping princes to be settled on battlefields and on seas by armies and fleets. Such was the war which was just breaking out when Queen Anne succeeded to the English throne. Louis the Fourteenth was then at the height of his power. Under his rule, although certainly not because of any fostering qualities in him, France had reached the highest position in arms and in arts which she had yet attained in history. The age of Louis the Fourteenth was on the whole the greatest age of French literature. We cannot trace the sudden and splendid uprising of that literature to any inspiring influence which came from King Louis. It may well be doubted whether the birth and the growth of genius owe much in any case to the influence of a monarch and the effect of royal patronage is shown quite as often in the encouragement of the art that is fictitious and fleeting as in the encouragement of the art that is genuine and destined to make its enduring mark. Perhaps we may take it for granted that true art will find its expression, whether it be favored and patronized by royal influence or not. But in any case, Louis the Fourteenth does not seem the kind of sovereign whose intellect and education would have enabled him to point with his scepter at the right man to fill the foremost place in literature or in art. Louis the Fourteenth was so fortunate as to live at a time when French literature and art commanded the admiration of the whole civilized world, and he had himself done much in obeying the impulses of his own vainglorious ambition to make France the dread and wonder of Europe in politics and in war. At the same time, and by the very same qualities, he had opened the way for the great troubles, domestic and foreign, which were to culminate in the French Revolution. By the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, he had compelled some of the best and bravest of his subjects to seek shelter in foreign lands and to add to the intellectual, industrial, and military strength of peoples who were afterwards to be the rivals of France. He was a narrow-minded bigot on all questions of religion, but the devotion to his own religion which he professed and which he endeavored to enforce upon others never restrained him from the indulgence of his own selfish and sensuous vices. The very defects, the very worst qualities of his character, only helped the more to make his reign a subject of deep and inexhaustible interest for the students of history and of character, for the writers and the readers of romance. Here and there one may come on some episode or incident of his reign which has supplied matter for study, for speculation, and for psychological puzzle to all succeeding generations. Few historical mysteries have ever excited more curiosity, given occasion for more controversy, or started more plausible explanations than the story of the Iron Mask, for which George Agar Ellis, the English author and diplomatist, afterwards Lord Dover, appears to have been the first to find the true solution. Perhaps the highest praise that the critical historian can well give to Louis the Fourteenth, Louis the Great, as he was called, is that when we contrast him with his successor, Louis the Fifteenth, we are inclined to think that the figure of the elder ruler seems stately and king-like in comparison. 
and the reign of the latter Louis seems an anticlimax when we study its history after that of his predecessor. The most striking figure among continental sovereigns at the time, which we are now describing, was undoubtedly that of the Russian Tsar. Peter the Great has been well described by the first Lord Lytton as one of the greatest sovereigns ever born to a throne. Julius Caesar, Cromwell, Napoleon, these were not born to thrones, but Peter the Great began his career at the point where other conquerors have commonly reached their climax. The ambition of Peter was to make himself a great man and his realm a great country, and he accomplished both his objects. He was determined that Russia should become a naval power, and he had first to turn his attention to the means by which he could be enabled to extend her territory to the sea. Augustus found his city of brick and left it of marble. Peter the Great found a land-locked dominion and made a way for it to the sea. He devoted himself with indomitable energy and patience to the study and practice of mechanical arts which might help him in the accomplishment of his purposes. He traveled through foreign countries. He worked at ship carpentering in the dockyards of Holland. He studied the building of vessels under the shadow of the Tower of London. Bishop Burnet had some talks with Peter while the Tsar was pursuing his practical studies in London, and seems to think him a sort of rough semi-savage. Indeed, the bishop appears to have been rather at a loss to understand how Providence could have placed such a man at the head of a great and rising state. As sovereign of Russia, he made his country for the first time an influence and a power in the politics of Europe, and beyond all question he laid the foundations of that vast military and maritime empire which counts for so much in the history of the modern world and does not even yet suggest the limits of its possible development. The character of Peter was disfigured by almost savage defects of temper, by utter unscrupulousness, by sensuous vices, and by a cruelty which was sometimes implacable. He appears to have had in him something of the Oriental nature, the craft, the cruelty, the sudden contrasts of generosity and ferocity, of clemency and severity, of noble impulse and of selfish freak, which we associate with the conventional portraiture of an Eastern despot. But whatever his personal defects, it is certain that the Tsar Peter was one of the greatest men living at a time when there were many great men, and that he was creating a powerful and a developing state, while other sovereigns were unconsciously doing their very worst to bring to ruin the fabric which had been bequeathed to them by their predecessors. Charles the Twelfth of Sweden was in his meteoric course when Queen Anne came to the throne of England. Charles was one of the most brilliant and picturesque figures then to be seen on the battlegrounds of Europe. He was a very Quixote of national ambition and adventure. He amazed and even bewildered Europe by his genius and audacity. Statesmen and soldiers of the older school did not know where to look for him or how to deal with him when he suddenly flashed his searchlight upon their political combinations and their territorial schemes. Blushing glory had not yet to hide Poltava's day, as Johnson put it in those lines from his Vanity of Human Wishes, which will be remembered when the most elaborate essays of the Rambler have ceased to find even specialist readers. The dominions of the German emperor were made up of Austria itself and of the federated states, as they may be called, which belonged to the Germanic system. There were nine electoral princes called electors who asserted and exercised the right to choose the emperor of Germany. That empire still claimed to be the representative of the Holy Roman Empire, whose head was crowned at Rome by Pope John the Twelfth. The elector of Brandenburg was now king of Prussia. The Germanic system may be described as made up of three estates, 
the electors who chose the emperor, the nobles and bishops and governors who constituted in a certain sense a house of peers, and then something like a popular organization supposed to represent the interests and feelings of the general community. Already the German Empire, in its historic sense, was growing to be but the shadow of the Holy Roman Empire, and it could not have needed much foresight to discern that the electors of Brandenburg as kings of Prussia would come before long to contend for the leadership of the Germanic peoples. The emperor of Germany was still, however, a sovereign whose power on the European continent might compete with that of France. The alliance which brought England, Germany, and the United Provinces into an engagement to resist to the uttermost the attempt of Louis the Fourteenth to make Spain a part of the French kingdom was one which even the ambition and arrogance of Louis himself could hardly have contemplated without some sense of grave responsibility. Louis was ready to brave all. His declaration that there are no more Pyrenees has become one of the famous sayings of history, but its fame is fully equaled by its fallacy, and the Pyrenees, crossed and recrossed since that time, are still the dividing line between France and Spain. Poland was still a kingdom, a kingdom troublesome to itself and to the world in general, a kingdom which, under all its changes, seemed ever to have been endowed by fatality, with a constitution unsuited to its own conditions and the conditions of succeeding epochs. But Poland has a brave, gifted, and patriotic race for its people, and through its many changes has been able to win for itself the sympathy and good wishes of all lovers of liberty. For some time yet it is to appear and reappear as a nationality and a political force in the struggles of European dynasties and peoples. Its efforts to maintain its independence as a nation and a state are to be sung by poets and pictured by romancists from most of the civilized countries of the world, and the sword of many a foreign volunteer is to fight for its cause on all its battlefields. Thus may rapidly be described the principal actors and influences in the great struggle on which Europe was about to enter when Queen Anne announced to her Parliament her resolve that England should declare war against France. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Reign of Queen Anne, Volume One by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Those Around Queen Anne. Among those who stood around the Queen at the time of her accession to the throne, the most conspicuous and greatest figure was that of John Churchill, then earl and soon after duke of marlborough never was a man born into a time more peculiarly fitted to prepare for him a stage suited to the full development and display of his commanding qualities never was a man better gifted by nature with the faculties which enable him to find or make such a stage in describing the character of marlborough the first difficulty is to know how to give the full measure of praise or blame without seeming to attempt the accomplishment of that task which is in the language of Shakespeare to solder close impossibilities and make them kiss. The public and private faults of Marlborough, even if we tax them down to the most rigid limits that impartial history will admit, are such that they would seem to put the character of him who possessed them out of the reach of most men's sympathy. Yet, on the other hand, if we do the barest justice to the better parts of the man's nature, we must admit that he had qualities in him which would have gained affection and admiration from minds of the most diverse constitution, even if he had not been the greatest soldier and, in many qualities, the greatest hero of his time. 
we can all remember the old story of the two knights who fell into a fierce quarrel about the color of a certain shield, which the one declared to be white and the other maintained to be black. After the disputants had fought long and fiercely over this question, some friends at last intervened and the argument was referred to the arbitration of the shield itself when it was found by the easiest inspection that the shield was black on one side and white on the other. It might appear within the range of possibilities that the same dispute could long be maintained with perfect sincerity about the character of Marlborough, provided each disputant were so absorbed in his own view of the question as to look only on that side of the shield which had suggested his first conclusions. Concentrate your attention for a time on the dark side of Marlborough's character, and it may well appear all black. Fasten your gaze upon the brighter side, and you may become satisfied that it is all white. About Marlborough's genius there is, at all events, no possibility of dispute. He was the greatest European general of his time, and he was probably the greatest English general known to history up to our own time. It would be hardly too much to say that he combined in himself all the qualities of daring, foresight, energy, enterprise, imagination, minute power of observation, cool calculating sagacity, and indomitable patience, which must be united in order to make a consummate military commander. The controlling power which he could exercise over the minds of men and over the hearts of women was in itself a sort of genius. Nature had given him appearance and manners which well fitted him for the task of attracting those who came within the range of his influence and molding them to his will. He was singularly handsome of face and graceful of form. In any crowd of men, in any society, he would have been singled out in a moment as the most attractive figure. No stranger could come near him without feeling an instant desire to know who he was and to learn all about him. We read in classic legend that when Momus had racked his sarcastic brain in order to find some word of disparagement to say about Venus, he could think of no fault to find with the goddess, but that her feet made too loud a sound when she walked. The most disparaging critics of Marlborough's physical charms seemed to find nothing worse to say of him than his voice was sometimes untuneful in its tone. Marlborough belonged to a Devonshire family and started in life without much fortune to carry him on. He entered the army and after a while found advancement at the court of James the Second, partly it is painful and pitiful to relate, through the influence of his sister, Arabella Churchill, who had been mistress to the king when he was Duke of York. He served in one of the wars against the Dutch, and served for a time under Turenne himself, who saw almost at a glance the young man's genius for war. Returning to England, he began to rise steadily in the king's service. Meanwhile, he had secretly married the beautiful and imperious Sarah Jennings, who was destined to exercise through her influence over him and over Queen Anne a directing power for a long time in the movement of English history. James II endeavored to induce Marlborough to become a Roman Catholic, Perhaps the young soldier saw, even at that time, that such a conversion would not be likely to bring him to the winning side. At any rate, he held to the newer order of ideas. Marlborough had clearly made up his mind from the very first that his mission in life was to secure a career for himself and that no doubts or scruples were to interfere with that object. He had no hesitation about accepting the patronage of the Duke of York, although he knew by what influence that patronage had been secured. Unless the stories told of him from time to time, and believed by his friends, 
as well as by his enemies, were all untrue, Marlborough turned even his love affairs to practical account for the advancement of his own self-interest. As might easily be supposed, he was much admired by women, and he was not above accepting handsome presents of money from ladies who also honored him with other favors. It was said of him in his earlier days that he used to lay down as a maxim for the guidance of young lovers that a woman who is really fond of a man will be all the fonder of him if he consents to accept her money. Marlborough held to James the Second as long as it seemed convenient to his own self-interest to act the part of a loyal and devoted follower. When William of Orange was about to invade England with the object of dethroning James the Second, Marlborough was appointed to high command against the invader. Marlborough, however, saw that his hour had come, and he went straightway over to the service of William and lent the help of his energy and his military genius to dethrone his former master. This was not the first act of treachery, as it was not the last, which Marlborough committed against the man who, for whatever reason, had taken earliest notice of him, had become his patron, and put him on his way to success at court and in camp. Marlborough devoted himself to the service of William, with as much fidelity as his peculiar temperament allowed. The path to preferment was for a time clear before him, and no considerations of self-interest interposed to tempt him from the straight way. He had many opportunities under William of proving his great capacity as a soldier, and throughout the whole of his career he made it evident that he was no less a statesman than a soldier. His influence over the Princess Anne had always been very great, owing chiefly to the fact that his wife, Sarah Jennings, had obtained and for a long time held such a complete dominion over the mind and heart of Anne as one woman rarely obtains over the mind and heart of another. King William appointed Marlborough to be governor over the young Duke of Gloucester, the only one of Anne's numerous progeny who gave any promise of living to maturity, and it is said that William went so far out of his ordinary way of precise and literal address as to speak to Marlborough on that occasion in the language of high compliment. The king told Marlborough that if he could make the young prince anything like Marlborough himself, he would have fulfilled the highest wishes of the boy's mother and of the sovereign. Any hopes that were founded on the life of the poor young Duke of Gloucester were soon destined to disappointment. The young prince, who had Marlborough for his governor and Bishop Burnet for his preceptor, was not allowed by the fates to have much opportunity of showing that he had benefited by so exceptional a course of education. When Anne came to the throne, she may fairly be described as under the absolute dominion of Marlborough and his wife, but of Marlborough chiefly through the medium of his masterful and far-reaching consort. Few chapters of personal history can be more curious or more interesting than that which tells of the strange supremacy so long exercised over the mind of Anne by Marlborough's wife. Whole volumes of correspondence preserve the story, of this extraordinary friendship. On the marriage of Anne with Prince George of Denmark, Lady Churchill, as the future Duchess of Marlborough was then titled, was appointed a lady of her bedchamber. Throughout the whole of her life, it was an inherent quality of Anne's nature that she must depend upon somebody, take her orders from somebody, have her path of life and even her ways of thinking pointed out to her by somebody and for many years this occupation was uncompromisingly undertaken by Lady Churchill. There is something touching, something pathetic, in the affectation of mystery, often ridiculous enough in itself, with which these two women were pleased dramatically to unfold their close and constant correspondence. 
it was arranged that Anne should be known in this scheme of letter-writing by the name of Mrs. Morley, and Lady Churchill by that of Mrs. Freeman, and other eminent personages had their identity disguised to as little practical purpose by equally unpretending appellations. In the history of the reign of Queen Anne by John Hill Burton, there is a sentence quoted from one of Anne's letters to Lady Churchill, written at a time when some difficulties arose which led Marlborough to threaten that he might have to resign his position in the Queen's service. As for your poor unfortunate Morley, Anne writes, she could not bear it, for if ever you should forsake me, I should have nothing more to do with the world but make another abdication. For where is a crown when the support of it is gone? In the same volume is a letter written by Anne to Lord Godolphin at a point of time between her father's death and her own accession. For the Lord Godolphin, Windsor, Tuesday night. I cannot let your servant go back without returning my thanks for the letter he brought me and assuring you it is a very great satisfaction to me to find you agree with Mrs. Morley concerning the ill-natured, cruel proceedings of Mr. Caliban, which vexes me more than you can imagine, and I am out of all patience, when I think I must do so monstrous a thing as not to put my lodgings in mourning for my father. I hope if you get a copy of the will, Lord Manchester says he will send over, you will be so kind as to let me see it and ever believe me your faithful servant." Anne's spelling is somewhat peculiar, but it was not any worse than that of many men and women of her time who made profession of higher literary accomplishments than she ever claimed as her own. The reader will naturally be curious to know something of the identity of the person described as Mr. Caliban. At the time of her life when the letter was written, Anne was in the habit of describing William III with that Shakespearean appellation. Indeed, we find in Cox's Life of Marlborough that among her intimate friends, she occasionally called the king the monster, Caliban, or the Dutch abortion. It appears, however, quite certain that the Caliban phrase, as applied to King William, was the boasted invention of Mrs. Freeman, and was only adopted by the obedient Mrs. Morley. Until her accession to the throne, Anne led a quiet and almost secluded life, concerning herself but little with all that was going on in the great world around her, and content to be taught how she ought to think and feel by the clever and brilliant woman who exercised for many years an unqualified dominion over her. Now, if Marlborough had any one strong feeling suffusing and inspiring his whole nature outside his mere self-interest, his love of glory, and his desire to give his genius a fair field for its exercise, it was assuredly his devoted and passionate attachment to his wife. That splendid quality of patience which stood him in such good stead during the interruptions and delays put in his way by hostile fortune and by the shortcomings of his allies and his supporters during his great campaigns, enabled him to bear the changeful temper and domineering ways of his wife without showing any signs of irritability or resentment. It was to be said in bare justice to Queen Anne that she must have had some capacity of her own which enabled her to comprehend the genius of Marlborough quite independently of the influence exercised over her by Marlborough's wife, for it was not until after Anne came into the responsibility of royal position that Marlborough was enabled to prove himself equal to one of the most momentous tasks ever imposed upon a military commander. Sidney, Lord Godolphin, was one of the most prominent and influential statesmen of the time, and he had the advantage of being in close alliance and friendship with Marlborough. Through the influence of Marlborough, Godolphin was appointed to the office of Lord High Treasurer, a function which has no exact equivalent in the political business of our modern days, but may be described as a sort of combination 
of the rank of Prime Minister with the functions of Chancellor of the Exchequer. We shall, of course, meet with Godolphin again and again in the chapters of this history, and it is now only necessary to say of him that he was undoubtedly one of the most careful and capable managers of the public funds an English sovereign has ever appointed to office, and that in providing for the long and perilous war which had to be undertaken, his financial skill combined the maximum of efficiency with the minimum of waste. Marlborough and Godolphin were both members of the Tory party, but the word Tory, as it was understood in those days, would hardly serve as a description for any Tory party in more modern times, when political parties are created by principles and by interests which have nothing to do with the question of royal succession. Our modern ideas of a Tory would naturally represent him as a man who believed that the best interests of the country were served by entrusting the task of its government as much as possible to the hands of the aristocratic classes, and by resisting, as far as possible, the growth of democracy. Our typical Whig, on the other hand, if we take him as he began to show himself during the reign of George the Third, would be a man who believed that the object of a patriotic party was to introduce, as far as might seem expedient, the representative principle into the work of government, and to give the people in general some share in the making of the laws. We have outgrown of late the Whigs and the Tories even of George the Third's day, and the Whig may be said to have passed altogether into history. The Whig is now either a liberal or a radical. The Tory still retains his old name unless he prefers to be called a conservative, and although he has necessarily advanced with the times, he still keeps to his old business of resisting, as long as he can, the spread of the democratic movement. But the Whigs and Tories, in the days of Marlborough and Godolphin, had political purposes to occupy them which are unknown in our times. The Tory had in his heart a partiality for divine right and the Stuart dynasty, while the Whig looked forward to hereditary succession on the lines established by the reign of William III and the Act of Settlement. In the Tory party, at the time of Queen Anne's accession, the two leading men were Robert Harley, afterwards Earl of Oxford, and Henry St. John, afterwards Viscount Bolingbroke. Harley was the man of capacity, Bolingbroke was the man of genius. If the enthusiastic eulogy bestowed by a poet could be taken as creating a picture which posterity might accept as a faithful likeness, then surely the praise bestowed by Alexander Pope would give Harley a place in history as a model of public and private virtue. Pope ascribes to Harley, A soul supreme in each hard instance tried, above all pain or passion and all pride, and other lines to the same effect, which have nevertheless not established themselves as the pronouncement of posterity. Pope poured forth raptures of admiration upon Bolingbroke. Down to very recent days there was hardly any line of English poetry more familiar in the mouths of men, the majority of whom, even when they quoted the line, had not the least idea of its personal application than the feast of reason and the flow of soul. It was St. John, the poet tells us, who mingles with my friendly bowl, that feast of reason and flow of soul, which until our own days and quite lately became too much the recognized property of after-dinner orators. Even an admiring poet, however, could hardly go too far in paying a tribute to the genius of Bolingbroke. Pope tells us how nobly pensive St. John sat and thought, We do not now 
usually contemplate St. John as sitting and thinking in this nobly pensive mood, we think of him as the brilliant orator, the almost unrivaled parliamentary debater, the great prose writer, the fascinating man of fashion, the reckless libertine, the versatile political conspirator. In an age of commanding political figures, his was one of the most commanding. In an age of great prose writers, he wrote many pages which will live with the best. The uncertain temper, the disturbed principles and practices of the time can hardly find better illustration than in the story of a supposed discovery that was made shortly after the accession of Queen Anne. Some of those around the Queen put into circulation a report that a number of private papers had been found soon after the death of William III, which showed that the late King had a plan, or it might be called a plot, in hand for the removal of Anne from her place in the dynasty, and even, it was said, for her imprisonment or banishment, and for placing the head of the Hanover family on the throne of England. This story found so many serious believers that at last it was thought necessary to make an official inquiry into the alleged facts. A commission was actually appointed, one of whose members was Marlborough himself, to search the whole of the late King's papers and to report to the Queen and to Parliament whether they contained any evidence of such a design. A careful search was made among all the letters and papers, of whatever kind, which William had left behind, and, of course, the result of the inquiry was that nothing could be discovered which gave any support, suggestion, or excuse for the diffusion of such extraordinary statements. Then the professed friends of the Queen, who had been helping to spread these utterly groundless reports, grew suddenly ashamed of the encouragement which they had given to the rumors and went about emphatically disclaiming any belief in them and protesting that even when they talked privately about the existence of this scheme, they had only done so for the purpose of protesting their utter disbelief in it. On the other hand, there were found many persons, as there always will be found when such a controversy arises, who shook their heads gravely over the official report of the inquiry, and cautiously but with persistency and with increasing emphasis declared their sad suspicion that there was a great deal more in the matter than those in high places were willing to admit. They did their best to establish a belief that the official report had been nothing but a deliberate arrangement to avert a national scandal and to prevent the purpose of the late king from being made known to the country. A strong effort was made by some of those who accepted the report of the commission and who had never believed in the whole story to get some steps taken for bringing to public trial and punishment those who had had a prominent part in spreading abroad the story of the alleged scheme. Nothing came of it, however, and the controversy was allowed to pass away without recourse to any process of law. There were times in Queen Anne's life when she seemed willing to believe in anything which told her that the late king had been filled with an unconquerable distrust and dislike for her, and had been, up to the last, quite capable of approving any scheme which might prevent her from maintaining her position on the throne of England. It was an age of conspiracy and counter-conspiracy in political life, at home and abroad, an age when families were divided against themselves by political passions and dynastic interest, and nobody could have known better than Queen Anne did how little even blood relationship, to say nothing of family connections, could be relied upon as a guarantee for enduring loyalty, political integrity, and personal affection. The country was now on the eve of a great crisis. The Queen had announced to Parliament her determination to carry out the policy of William III and her resolve to declare war against France. Her allies were to be the Emperor of Germany, with such of the electoral German states as were willing to become active supporters of the Emperor's policy, and the United Provinces of Holland. 
the Queen conferred on Marlborough the office of commander-in-chief over all the forces of England on land and sea. Marlborough was now, in fact, only at the opening of his great career. He had fought on many a battlefield before this time, and wherever he had found an opportunity of proving his military capacity, he had given ample promise of a genius for command. Up to this time, he had not had a chance of showing to his country and to the world that he possessed the qualities which would enable him to take rank among the greatest soldiers in history. He was now more than fifty years of age, and the Marlborough of immortal fame had yet to assert himself and to prove himself. If the Grand Alliance had not been reconstructed by Anne, and if England had followed what would probably have been the policy of a later age and allowed the dynastic quarrels of continental states to settle themselves without the intervention of English armies and fleets, the world might never have come to know that the foremost supporter of the new queen was a soldier qualified to rank with the greatest military commanders in ancient or modern history. The woman, born to be queen, was not much given to profound reflection and had but little of the imaginative power which can foresee the greatness of a national crisis or comprehend the qualities of men near to her who are destined to make history. But Mrs. Morley was devoted to Mrs. Freeman, and she had probably some faint conception of the part which Mrs. Freeman's husband was to fill in the reign of Queen Anne. It may be said, while we are dealing with this part of our subject, that Sarah Jennings was for many generations believed to be the Atossa satirized by Alexander Pope in his moral essays. More recently, a theory has been started that Pope did not intend his satirical poetry as the picture of Sarah Jennings, but as that of another woman who held a high rank about the same time, unless, however, there are very convincing grounds for rejecting what may be called the contemporary belief as to the original of a satirical sketch, it is safer to assume that contemporary opinion guessed rightly and to accept Atossa as Pope's pen sketch of John Churchill's adored and domineering wife. The coronation of Queen Anne took place in the year of her accession and was attended with all the splendor of ceremonial and all the array of heraldic symbolism in its minutest details, which for many succeeding generations have been considered essential components of a coronation. Westminster Hall and the majestic abbey, which stands near it, were the principal scenes of the historic display. The queen herself was in very weak health and had to be carried or supported during the greater part of the ceremonies. We shall not enter into much detail of description, but there are some parts of the day's pageantry which may have an awakened interest for readers of the present day. There were two accompaniments of this coronation which became for the first time a part of the ceremony. These were the parliamentary test and the coronation oath. They were introduced and adopted for the avowed purpose of proclaiming to the world that the revolution had established new conditions under which and under which alone the sovereign of England could hold the throne and demand the allegiance of the English people. They constituted, in fact, a legal declaration that the old doctrine of divine right was done with forever and that the sovereign had to enter into special and solemn agreements in order to obtain the position of ruler. Just as a subject accepting office under the crown was compelled to make certain professions of allegiance as a condition of his obtaining such a place. So, in the new constitutional system, the sovereign was required to make publicly known the acceptance of certain conditions before the right to the throne could be formally acknowledged by Parliament and the people. The parliamentary test, which Queen Anne had to submit to and accept as her declaration, embodied the profession of the sovereign's faith. This oath has within very recent times become a subject of public discussion and some strong and natural disapproval. I do solemnly and sincerely, 
in the presence of God, profess, testify, and declare, thus ran the words of the announcement, that I do believe that in this sacrament of the Lord's Supper there is not any transubstantiation of the elements of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, at or after the consecration thereof, by any person whatsoever, and that the invocation or adoration of the Virgin Mary, or any other saint, and that the sacrifice of the Mass, as they are now used in the Church of Rome, are superstitious and idolatrous. And I do solemnly, in the presence of God, profess, testify, and declare that I do make this declaration, and every part thereof, in the plain and ordinary sense of the words read unto me, as they are commonly understood by English Protestants, without any evasive equivocations or mental reservations whatsoever, and without any dispensation already granted me for this purpose by the Pope, or any other authority, or person whatsoever, or without any hope of any such dispensation from any person or authority whatsoever, or without thinking that I am or may be acquitted before God or man, or absolved of this declaration or any part thereof, although the Pope or any other person or persons or power whatsoever should dispense with or annul the same, or declare that it was null and void from the beginning. When the Queen had made the required declaration and the ceremonies belonging to the coronation had been completed, a benediction was pronounced upon her by the Archbishop of York, which in the midst of all the splendor and all the public rejoicing must have fallen sadly on the ears of the Queen, when it evoked for her the blessing of the Lord that she might have a numerous posterity to rule these kingdoms after you by succession in all ages. The woman, doomed to leave no child behind her, and for whom it had been necessary to seek a successor in a foreign family and a foreign state, must have found only a melancholy reminder of her condition in this futile passage of the ceremonial benediction. During the great dinner in Westminster Hall, just before the second course, Charles de Mok, Esquire, Her Majesty's Champion in Complete Armour, between the Lord High Constable and Earl Marshal, performed the challenge, after which the kings of arms and heralds proclaimed Her Majesty's style in Latin, French, and English. This was, of course, the historical challenge to any daring claimant or representative of a claimant who should venture to dispute Her Majesty's right to the throne. Then was the time for any such person, if any such there were, to come forward and make good his claim against the mounted and mailed representative of royal authority, in presence of the guests assembled at those dinner tables. No such rash intruder came forward to dispute the sovereignty of Queen Anne, but it may be remembered that at a later coronation there were romantic stories of a plot to take up the challenger's glove, and thus at least testified to the world that there existed a rival claimant to the throne of England in the person of a still surviving representative of the royal Stuart line. It might have seemed more in accordance with the fitness of things, or at all events with the artistic fitness of things, if such a challenge, supposing it to have been seriously planned at all, even for the sake of theatric effect, had been delivered on this occasion when the last of the Stuarts were seated on the throne, and arrangements had been made for the succession of a foreign family, rather than at the later day when the new dynasty was actually in possession. Queen Anne, however, does not seem to have been a sovereign with whom dramatic or romantic effects had much to do, and her coronation as that of avowedly the last of the Stuart sovereigns, was allowed to pass off without a challenge. End of chapter 4
Chapter 5 of The Reign of Queen Anne, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Descent and Defoe. The religious troubles which beset the Queen on her accession to power were not by any means fully represented in the Declaration which contained her disavowal of all sympathy with certain beliefs and practices of the Church of Rome. There were questions of religious conformity which had nothing to do with the faith adopted by James II. Dissent among Protestants themselves was beginning to be a subject of most serious controversy and drove many who professed a horror of the spiritual servitude enjoined by the Church of Rome into a constant clamor for the intervention of the criminal law in order to put down all freedom of private judgment among Protestant denominations. Not to speak for the moment of the fierce controversies concerning the maintenance or the suppression of Presbyterianism in the Kingdom of Scotland, there was a storm rising against Protestant nonconformists in England itself which might have roused a feeling of satisfaction in the breast of the least vindictive papist sufferer for his belief. An agitation was going on all through England, which had for its object the most rigid exclusion from all public office of every one who not merely showed any lack of enthusiasm for the doctrine of the state church, but who failed to make his full acceptance of all these doctrines known by a sufficient number of public and formal protestations in the proper places during certain specified terms of each year. It was not thought by any means enough that an aspirant to public office should have given no sign whatever of conscientious objection to any tenant of the state church. It was insisted that unless he made known his absolute conformity, by a certain number of public professions, within a specified time, he ought not to be considered a fit person to be entrusted with the duties of any office held under the control of the established authorities. Even so sound a churchman as Bishop Burnet was sometimes astonished, and often not a little amused, at the alarm and passion aroused in the minds of many respectable and intelligent Protestants by the existence and growth of dissenting denominations in England. Such persons were constantly asked whether, after all, it had really profited anything to get rid of the Pope, the Jesuits, and the Stuart dynasty if here at home in England men were allowed to go about and start new theories concerning ecclesiastical discipline, and even to hold meetings and conferences and to preach sermons in support of heterodox and dissenting opinions. What was the use of the Reformation, it was asked? What was the good of establishing a state church if men were to be allowed without interference on the part of the law to form themselves into nonconformist congregations, to hold religious services of their own, to choose their pastors, and to give so-called religious instruction to their families without any regard for the authority of the state episcopate or the decisions of convocation? Nothing could be more certain than the fact that dissent was growing and spreading day after day among English communities. Nothing, indeed, could have been more natural among all the changing conditions of the time. Within the memory of living men not yet old, there had been a king who professed the faith of the Church of Rome, followed by a king who professed the faith of the Church of England, and now by a queen who, while proclaiming her conformity with the doctrines of the English state church, was believed to be secretly in sympathy with the dynastic claims of that Stuart family to which she herself belonged, and whose immediate and intimate friends were shrewdly suspected of participation in political schemes for a counter-revolution and for the restoration of the exiled princes. Everyone must have seen that Marlborough was the devoted servant of James the Second, until it suited his interests to go suddenly over and become the devoted servant of William the Third. And after he had made that remarkable change, 
and had greatly profited by it, he was still believed to be in constant communication with the representatives of the discarded dynasty. On the other hand, these very fluctuations of opinion and of allegiance among those with whom dynastic interest or merely personal self-interest was the principal guiding force only made the sincere among all denominations more devoted than ever to their own convictions and more ready to take alarm at anything which boded the predominance of antagonistic ideas. The dissenters and nonconformists of all sects were beginning to revolt more and more against the rigid rule of the state church. These dissenters and nonconformists were not content with holding their own opinions and keeping them quietly to themselves, but they must take to the convening of meetings for the diffusion of their heterodox views. There were associations which might almost be called public springing up everywhere for the teaching of dissenting doctrine and the enrollment of dissenting citizens. The growth of such organizations aroused alarm and wrath among the less tolerant of the churchmen, and a clamor was raised for the intervention of the crown and parliament. What to do with the dissenters became, in fact, the great question of the day among all zealous churchmen. It was insisted that they should not be allowed to go on as they were going, if the rule of the state church were to be maintained, and zealous churchmen forgot all about the perils of papistry when they contemplated the dangers of dissent. The crisis seemed to call for the right man, and some eager churchmen were allowed to believe during a short space of time that the right man had come to the front. It was certain, at least, that a man had made his appearance who professed his capacity to show the public the readiest and most masterful way of dealing with the dissenters. This man was destined for a time to be the most talked-of personage of his day, but even while his name was on the lips of every one, none could have predicted the real fame he was destined to win. Daniel Defoe was an Englishman by birth and ancestry, despite the foreign suggestion conveyed by his name. The name of his father was in fact simply Foe, and the son Daniel had changed it into De Foe, or De Foe, more than twenty years after his birth. He was the son of a butcher in an obscure part of the city of London, but he obtained a good education at a school established for dissenters, and when still a young man started in business as a maker and vendor of stockings. Those were troublous times, and it is not surprising to learn that Daniel Defoe was believed to have been out in Monmouth's rebellion. He afterwards took service in King William's army and appears to have traveled in France and Spain. He was concerned later in various business occupations and enterprises, and at one time he became bankrupt, but he seems conscientiously to have paid all his debts by slow degrees. Even while engaged in his business projects, Defoe's mind troubled itself constantly about political and religious questions, and he was a firm supporter of King William's policy. Defoe found a way of supporting that policy which was more practical and more wide-reaching than any casual interchange of argument with his daily companions in business could have been. He became a pamphleteer, and thus availed himself of the one department of the public press which was most effective in those days. He was soon known as a pamphleteer of a special vigor, even in that age of vigorous prose and active pamphleteering. He seems from the very opening of this part of his career to have had a remarkable capacity for adapting himself to the level of any controversy in which he felt inclined to engage. His opinions were unquestionably genuine and were all his own, but he had the faculty, wanting to many a controversialist, of being able to enter thoroughly into the feelings of his antagonists, and thus to meet them with the kind of argument which it was most difficult for them either to refute or leave unnoticed. He always put forth his case in such a manner that it neither went over the heads of his opponents nor fell unnoticed at their feet. In fact, 
that power of imagination which enabled him later in some of his immortal works to picture scenes which he had never looked upon and to describe with all semblance of reality troubles which he had never undergone enabled him at the opening of his career as a writer to create for himself the form of attack likely to tell most heavily upon the peculiar forces which he had to encounter defoe's early training and his ways of thought had made him a strong supporter of the claims set up by the dissenting bodies for the right to conduct their own form of worship according to their own conscience and he could not see why a state church established by law in england should have an autocratic power to dictate men's faith to them when the very men who claimed for it such a right were foremost in their repudiation of the spiritual jurisdiction of rome the hostility which was growing so much against dissenters and what may be called the privileged classes had become so strong that nothing short of some parliamentary action against nonconformity could possibly satisfy it defoe had written poems with a political purpose one of these called the true-born englishman was a pamphlet in verse in defence of the policy and the reign of william the third defoe had not much of the poetic gift the indescribable quality which apart from mere skill in melody distinguishes genuine poetry from even the finest prose was not bestowed upon him the main object of this rhymed pamphlet was to argue down the still popular feeling which made men hold aloof from complete loyalty to william simply because he was a foreigner defoe argued with much common sense and good feeling that every true-born englishman ought to recognize the claims of the sovereign who had been called to the throne and whose policy was to make england prosperous and great even though a foreign country had given him birth the good of subjects is the end of kings defoe pointed out and when this end is labored for and accomplished by a sovereign he is then truly entitled to rank as an english monarch the pamphlet gave great satisfaction to william who showed his good feeling toward defoe in many ways and the writer then seemed fairly on the road to advancement when king william died and anne succeeded him defoe had a new political task to undertake before that he had had to champion the policy of a king against the opposition which proclaimed itself in consequence of william's foreign birth training and descent now he had to champion the claims of the dissenters against what was popularly believed to be the sentiment of the queen anne was known to have strong convictions in favor of the claims made out by churchmen clerical and lay for the supremacy of that form of protestantism which had been established as the religion of the state defoe hit upon a most effective method of vindicating the cause of the dissenters and holding up to public condemnation those who were striving to bring all the powers of the law to bear against their demands for liberty of conscience he issued a pamphlet called the shortest way with the dissenters this famous pamphlet was a piece of the most elaborate and powerful satire defoe transformed himself for the time into a domineering and unyielding high churchman and he professed to advocate all the views of such a personage with uncompromising and unlimited conviction his argument was that the dissenters deserved no favor and even deserved no toleration he contended that whenever dissenters had any power they invariably exerted it to suppress all liberty of conscience which was not that precise liberty of conscience suited to their own beliefs and their own interests every attempt had been made by presbyterianism in scotland to vindicate its own claims he described as a deliberate attempt to crush out all freedom of religious thought and all unorthodox forms of religious worship it may perhaps be owned that the intolerance sometimes displayed by presbyterians in scotland lent more semblance of justification to this part of defoe's argument 
than Defoe himself could have intended or would have admitted. Defoe had, of course, stood up stoutly in his own person before this as a defender of the moderation and tolerance shown by Scottish Presbyterianism when it had power to oppose the religious belief of those with whom it was not in agreement. But when Defoe set himself to present the case for the English state church as an English churchman might have presented it, we can easily understand how he made himself for the time a representative of the extreme spirit of the churchman and allowed himself to argue down even his own genuine conviction. The spirit of the novelist was there as well as that of the mere satirist. If he had been putting himself for artistic purposes into the form of a religious hypocrite, he would no doubt have entered into the very spirit of a tartuffe. If he had been engaged in a vindication of Moll Flanders or Colonel Jack, he would not have hesitated to push his case beyond the bounds of reasonable and logical defense. So, when he put himself into the shape of an intolerant high churchman, it was no part of his task to make the arguments of the high churchman consistent with the arguments of Daniel Defoe. The pamphlet begins with a studied moderation of tone and grows gradually more and more vehement, passionate, and arbitrary as the work proceeds. This was part of Defoe's plan. He makes his churchman, whose self-assumed task it is to set forth the shortest way with dissenters, begin with an affectation of Christian-like forbearance, and then grow by degrees hotter and hotter as he expounds his views until toward the end he loses his temper altogether and shows himself what he really is intended to be, an overbearing and merciless tyrant. In this mood he replies to some possible objections which might be raised as to the cruelty of the measures by which he proposes to deal with dissenters. He considerately admits that it may be cruelty to kill a snake or a toad in cold blood, but then he goes on to point out that the poison of their nature makes it a charity to our neighbors to destroy these creatures, not for any personal injury received, but for prevention, not for the evil they have done, but the evil they may do. Such creatures as serpents, toads, and vipers, he goes on to say, are noxious to the body and poison the sensitive life. These poison the soul, corrupt our posterity, ensnare our children, and destroy the vitals of our happiness, our future felicity, and contaminate the whole mass. If, he declares, one severe law were made and punctually executed, that whoever was found at a conventicle should be banished the nation and the preacher be hanged, we should soon see an end of the tale. In this spirit and tone, Defoe set out his plan for dealing in the shortest way with dissenters who would not accept the principle of absolute conformity. The pamphlet was a capital piece of satirical extravaganza. It illustrated the very extreme of the temper which would tolerate nothing in Protestantism that did not show a complete submission to the doctrines and rules of worship ordained by the state church. The pamphlet was anonymous, and it was for a while accepted by many people as a sincere and deliberate exposition of the policy which its author believed to be called for by all who held that there was only one true way to maintain the church in its proper position, and that that one way was the suppression of all independent belief and all non-conforming practices. Some of those who felt in sympathy with what they understood to be the author's exposition of his belief thought that perhaps he had gone a little too far in his controversial fervor, but they still sympathized with its general object and were willing to overlook the occasional excesses into which he might have been tempted by his conscientious desire to secure the predominance of the church. Many, of course, understood and appreciated the satire from the very first and welcomed the pamphlet as a masterly reductio ad absurdum of the arguments by which two zealous churchmen had been endeavoring to force the queen in the parliament 
into a policy for the suppression of all dissent. When the real meaning of the writer began to be universally understood, and the pamphlet was recognized as an audacious satire, a positive storm of fury raged around his devoted head. The high church party in general regarded the pamphlet as a scandalous libel and offered a large reward for the discovery and apprehension of the perpetrator. A motion was carried in the House of Commons that the book should be burned by the common hangman and the government, yielding to the pressure from without and from within, issued a proclamation which is in every way worth reproduction as a piece of history illustrating the condition and temper of the times, and indeed is worthy of reproduction if only for its personal description of one of England's greatest authors. The proclamation set forth. Whereas Daniel Defoe, alias Defoe, is charged with writing a scandalous and seditious pamphlet entitled The Shortest Way with the Dissenters, he is a middle-sized spare man about forty years old, of a brown complexion and dark brown-colored hair, but wears a wig, a hooked nose, a sharp chin, gray eyes, and a large mole near his mouth. Was born in London and for many years was a hose factor in Freeman's Yard in Cornhill, and now is owner of the brick and pantile work near Tilbury Ford in Essex. Whoever shall discover the said Daniel Defoe to one of Her Majesty's principal secretaries of state, or any of Her Majesty's justices of peace, so as he may be apprehended, shall receive a reward of fifty pounds to be paid upon such discovery. There was not much chance of Defoe's trying to escape, even if he had been inclined to make any effort to escape, after such a description of his person, his occupation, and his whereabouts, and it seems only bare justice to the literary intelligence of the age to say that nobody who had any acquaintance with the pamphleteering issues of the day could have had the slightest doubt as to the identity of the author. Defoe was quickly and easily captured. He was put on his trial in the Old Bailey for a seditious libel, and as there was no possibility of his disclaiming the charge or offering any defense which could have availed him in the eyes of the law at such a time, he decided on taking the situation as he found it and merely pleading guilty. Perhaps he may have thought that this course would obtain for him some consideration from his judges, but if he had any such hope, it was destined to instant disappointment. He was sentenced to stand three times in the pillory, and after that to be imprisoned until he should pay a large fine and find security to be of good behavior for seven years. Thus, as he says to himself, was I a second time ruined, for by this affair I lost above three thousand five hundred pounds. Savage and brutal as was the treatment awarded to Defoe, he appears to have been treated with more leniency during his imprisonment than he might have been at a later period of English history. While he was in prison in Newgate, he was allowed to publish poems and pamphlets and to prepare for the issue of a periodical, a sort of newspaper, the contents of which were written solely by himself, and which he continued to issue two or three times a week for many years after he had been set at liberty. Defoe was kept in prison for more than a year. Anne was by no means wanting in feelings of humanity, and she could hardly have had much sympathy with the kind of policy which had found its illustration in the treatment inflicted on Defoe. There were some men in the land even then who had courage enough to plead for a mitigation of his term of imprisonment and influence enough to commend their views to the notice of the Queen's ministers. William Penn, the famous Quaker, the founder of the state of Pennsylvania, was then at the height of his renown. He had accomplished his great work in the spread of Christian doctrine. He had settled that establishment in the new world which would in itself have made his name immortal, and he occupied himself earnestly in attempting to obtain a mitigation of Defoe's sentence. John Hill Burton, in his Reign of Queen Anne, 
publishes some documents which have a curious interest and have given rise to some conflicting explanations in connection with Penn's humane efforts for the release of Defoe. One of these is a private letter from Godolphin to the Earl of Nottingham, one of the secretaries of state, which notes the fact that Mr. William Penn came to tell me he had acquainted my Lord Privy Seal that Defoe was ready to make oath to your lordship of all that he knew and to give an account of all his accomplices in whatsoever he has been concerned, provided by so doing he may be screened from the punishment of the pillory and not produced as an evidence against any person whatsoever. And upon my acquainting the Queen with this just now, at noon, Her Majesty was pleased to tell me she had received the same account from my Lord Privy Seal, and seemed to think this, if there were no other occasion for the Cabinet Council to reach here tomorrow, and has commanded me to tell you so. Burton is inclined to believe that Defoe was really willing to give an account of all his accomplices, provided he might be relieved from the punishment of the pillory and not produced as a public witness against his friends. Godolphin's document, he thinks, must touch the fame of Defoe in the eyes of all who may not believe that the chief advisers of the sovereign had conspired with her to blacken it. One can imagine, he says, a touch of comic risibility gleaming in Defoe's thoughts when he succeeded in sending the sternly earnest Quaker on such an errand. Then he goes on to say, There will be the less to surprise us in this affair when we make better acquaintance with Defoe, and perhaps find that whatever wealth of virtues he possessed, scrupulosity as a public man was not among them. Most readers, however, will be rather inclined to believe that Godolphin was willing to get out of a troublesome business as soon and easily as possible, and that he somewhat exaggerated the nature of the suggestion which Penn described himself as authorized to make on the part of Defoe. The word of William Penn is wholly beyond doubt, and there is certainly no reason to believe that Defoe could possibly be guilty of the mean and craven suggestion described in Godolphin's letter. Nothing came of Penn's interference at that time. Defoe was kept in prison for more than a year, and then Harley, who had become Secretary of State, used his influence with the Queen to obtain the prisoner's liberation. Anne was not inclined to keep up the rigor of Defoe's punishment any longer, and it appears that she was so greatly touched by the condition of distress in which Defoe's wife was placed that she sent her a gift of money and, after some further delay, ordered the remission of the fine and gave back to liberty the author of the pamphlet, which had created such a political convulsion. We learn on Defoe's own authority that he was afterwards employed by Harley and by Godolphin in the service of the Queen, and we know that in 1706 he was sent by Godolphin, with the approval of the Queen, to occupy himself in Scotland for the promotion of the Parliamentary Union. Defoe never rose to his full fame during the reign of Queen Anne. The production of Robinson Crusoe was wanting to the literary glory of that reign, so rich in masterpieces of prose and poetry. The effort made by William Penn to obtain Defoe's exemption from the disgraceful punishment decreed for him is an appropriate illustration of Penn's whole career, and indeed of the work which Penn's co-religionists appear always to have marked out for themselves. The Quakers are hardly to be classed among the dissenting bodies of Queen Anne's reign. Theirs was the very dissidence of dissent. It cannot be said that their hand was against that of every other community in the religious world, but it may almost be said that the hand of every other religious community was against them. They only saved themselves from the worst of persecution by that course of non-resistance, or at all events passive resistance, which their religious principles prescribed for them. It was hardly possible, even in the days of roughest religious controversy, to keep inflicting bodily punishment on men who were pledged never to defend themselves by force of arms. 
the Quakers carried out the principles of Christianity according to their own definitions of those principles with a rigid fidelity which might often have put the disciples of other Christian sects to shame. They strove with undismayed perseverance to maintain peace among men, to treat all men as their equals and their brothers, where justice had to be administered, and where charity could find work to do. The story of Penn's life belongs to earlier days than those of Queen Anne. His best work had been done, and his fame as a philanthropist had been secured before the opportunity came for him to intervene on behalf of Daniel Defoe in the feudal hope of saving him from the ignominy which, after all, only inflicted disgrace upon the age and could not inflict any dishonor on Defoe. There is, however, a peculiar fitness in the historical chance which associates in such a manner the names of Daniel Defoe and of William Penn. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Reign of Queen Anne, Volume One by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. On the Rough Edge of Battle. While the three dissenting bodies, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and the Independents or Congregationalists, are fighting their battles against the more aggressive of the churchmen, and the Quakers are standing aloof from each and all, the war has opened and is going on, and Marlborough is commander-in-chief of the Allied forces in Holland. We must study the field and survey the forces arrayed on either side. The position of Marlborough could not be better described than in the lines which Shakespeare has put into the mouth of Ulysses when he is addressing Agamemnon. Thou great commander, nerve and bone of Greece, heart of our numbers, soul and only spirit, in whom the tempers and the minds of all should be shut up. Ulysses, indeed, addresses Agamemnon in language of studied flattery, but the words which he uses might be employed to describe with literal accuracy the position of Marlborough at the head of his allied forces. Other words used by Ulysses in the same scene may be employed to illustrate, no less faithfully, some of the conditions which tended most to interfere with Marlborough's work and to delay the execution of his finest plans. And look how many Grecian tents do stand, hollow upon this plain, so many hollow factions. It is not too much to say that while the avowed object of the Allies was one and the same, the maintenance of the Spanish monarchy against the policy of Louis the Fourteenth, which demanded its absorption into his own possessions, each of the states forming the alliance had its own separate end to serve and was unwilling to spend its resources for any purpose outside the range of its own immediate interests. England and France might be regarded as opponents brought face to face with each other by a direct and long-standing antagonism. These two states had been enemies in the open field again and again. England had won some of her greatest military triumphs on the soil of France and had annexed French territory and proclaimed it part of the dominion of the English crown. France had old scores to pay off with England, and Louis the Fourteenth had come to understand only too clearly that his ambition could never have full satisfaction on the continent of Europe while England remained strong enough to assert the right of interfering with his aggressive schemes. These two opponents may be said to stand up to each other in the spirit described by the Homeric line, in which one rival declares to another that either you must overthrow me or I will overthrow you. 
agreements and even alliances between England and France had been tried from time to time, but no lasting principle of companionship could be found for such a rivalry. Therefore, it might be safely taken for granted that England and France would have to fight out their contest to the bitter end, and that neither would swerve from any responsibility or hold back from any expenditure until the contest had been positively decided and one or the other had to submit. But the armies on both sides had taken the field under very different conditions. The foremost of England's allies was the Emperor of Germany, and the Empire of Germany had become by this time something like the hereditary possession of the House of Habsburg. The position of Emperor was still indeed treated as elective, and whenever a vacancy took place the electors assembled in due form in the historic chamber at Frankfurt on the Main, and solemnly went through the ceremony of choosing the supreme representative of the German states. During many generations, and even during centuries, there had been no substantial opposition to the claims of the House of Habsburg, and the German, or as we may call him, the Austrian Emperor, was as certain of his succession as if the dignity had been one of hereditary descent. Readers may remember that there was a time in the history of the Caliphate when the principle of election was vaguely supposed to govern the succession, although in point of fact the right of hereditary descent was invariably recognized in the commanders of the faithful. The electors of the empire at the time with which we are now dealing were nine in number. Three of these held their right as representatives of ecclesiastical power, the archbishops of Mayence, Treves, and Cologne, and then there were the electors of Saxony, Bohemia, Brandenburg, Bavaria, the Palatinate, and the Duke of Hanover, whose family had by this time been chosen to succeed to the throne of England. Two of these electors, Cologne and Bavaria, had taken the side of France. The electors of Mayence and Treves maintained a neutral position. Brandenburg, the Palatinate, and Hanover sided with England and Holland against France. The electorate of Brandenburg had long been growing in strength and influence, and just before the opening of the war, Frederick the Elector demanded that the Emperor, in return for his promised support, should sustain his claim to be created a king. The Emperor and his ministers believed that it would not be for their advantage to resist the claim, because if they did so, they might lose the powerful support of Brandenburg. Frederick, therefore, was made King of Prussia. This was the first recognition of that great German power, which during so many generations disputed for supremacy with the Empire of Austria and achieved its full triumph within the memory of most of us as the result of the War of 1866, that seven weeks' war which ended in the defeat of Austria at Sadova. Frederick, the first king of Prussia, was the grandfather of Frederick the Great. The elector of Saxony had become king of Poland, an electoral appointment also, and he had quite enough to do in trying to maintain his position by force of arms to prevent him from rendering any assistance to the alliance against France. Thus it will be easily seen that the German supporters of the Grand Alliance had interests of their own to consider, which kept them from throwing themselves heart and soul into the policy represented by England and Holland. France was likely to continue a powerful and dangerous enemy in any case, all the more dangerous because she must be a neighbor as well as an enemy. 
nothing short of her complete overthrow, which could hardly be counted upon in any scheme of human policy, could seem a sufficient guarantee to the German princes for a thorough adhesion to a course which, even if it secured the object of England and of Holland, might, at any crisis or after any settlement, leave these German princes open to France's future purposes of retaliation. The determination of England and Holland was that the King of France should not absorb into his dominions the Kingdom of Spain, but even if their object were to be fully accomplished and the ambitious designs of Louis the Fourteenth in that direction were to be frustrated forever, France might still be left with ample power to revenge herself on some of the German states which had taken up arms against her. Even as regarded England and Holland, although the main and avowed purpose of both were identical, it could not possibly be held that they had quite the same interest in opposing the projects of King Louis for the absorption of Spain. Let the war end as it might, Holland, like the German states, would be left with France a dangerous neighbor, while England might well regard herself as destined to hold her own under all conditions against the most ambitious and reckless of French sovereigns. Holland, moreover, had but little interest in warlike enterprise. Shipping, commerce, and handicrafts were her sources of prosperity, revenue, and renown. She was already one of the most active colonizing states in Europe, but she sought to carry out her schemes of colonization by her ships and her traders, and not by force of arms. She had been drawn into antagonism to France, because unless the ambition of French sovereigns should receive some emphatic check, she could not count on being able to conduct in safety her work of commerce and colonization. It will be seen during the course of this narrative that in the diversity of interests which inspired the Grand Alliance, even Holland often found herself reluctant or unable to lend all the help to Marlborough which was demanded by the simple and straightforward policy he had to carry out. When the war began, Leopold I was the emperor. He was then an old man, having occupied the imperial throne for not much less than half a century, and before the campaigns had come to their close he died. The imperial power passed to his son Joseph, a soldier and a man of genuine capacity, who was much esteemed by his own people for his high character and sincere regard for the interests of his subjects. Joseph's brother, Charles, was the man whom the Grand Alliance had chosen as the claimant best entitled to the succession in Spain. Before the war had gone on very long, the Grand Alliance received the accession of two other members. One of these, was Victor Amadeus, the second Duke of Savoy, who may be regarded as the founder of the present Kingdom of Italy. Victor Amadeus had in his character much of the heroic temperament, the spirit of enterprise, and the gift of acquiring popularity among his subjects, which the world has long been accustomed to associate with the princes of the House of Savoy. He had suffered so much from the intolerance and the arrogance of Louis the Fourteenth, that he was almost literally driven to take up arms on the side of the Grand Alliance, although the interests of his people and his own inclinations might well have enabled a less overbearing and unscrupulous sovereign than Louis the Fourteenth to secure his cooperation for the armies of France. Louis had acted toward him on more than one occasion on the impulse of the same aggressive spirit which had dictated to him the ostentatious recognition of the exiled Stuart prince, and thus forced William III to take up arms against France. The other ally who joined England and Holland about the same time as the Duke of Savoy was the King of Portugal. Bishop Burnet traces in a few lines 
the history of the earlier negotiations with the King of Portugal to induce him to enter into a treaty of alliance with England. The narrative would be interesting, if only as an illustration of the fluctuations of principle and policy which were common among the sovereigns and ministers of continental states about the time when the Grand Alliance was in process of formation. The King of Portugal's ministers, Burnet tells us, were in the French interests, but he himself inclined to the Austrian family. He, for some time, affected retirement and avoided the giving audience to foreign ministers. He saw no good prospect from England, so being pressed to an alliance with France, his ministers got leave from him to propose one on terms of such advantage to him that, as it was not expected they could be granted, so it was hoped this would run into a long negotiation. But the French were as liberal in making large promises as they were perfidious and not observing them, so the King of France agreed to all that was proposed and signed a treaty pursuant to it and published it to the world. Yet the King of Portugal denied that he had consented to any such project, and he was so hardly brought to sign the treaty that when it was brought to him, he threw it down and kicked it about the room as our envoy wrote over. In conclusion, however, he was prevailed on to sign it, but it was generally thought that when he should see a good fleet come from the Allies, he would observe this treaty with the French as they had done their treaties with all the rest of the world. The general expectation was fully borne out by the result. Sir Paul Methuen, the English envoy at the court of Portugal, succeeded in prevailing on the king to cast in his lot with the states who were able to offer him the most advantageous terms. The situation might be illustrated fairly enough in a few lines from Sheridan's immortal comedy, The Critic. The scene is that in which Tilburina endeavors to win over her father, the governor, to her plans. She offers him a retreat in Spain, to which he rejoins, Outlawry here, a title, she suggests. And he replies indignantly, Honor, a pension, she suggests, and his proud answer is, Conscience. Then she comes to the point more effectively and asks him what he thinks of a thousand pounds, to which he replies, Ha, thou hast touched me nearly. Methuen, the English envoy, offered to the King of Portugal a commercial treaty with England, giving the wine of Portugal an immense advantage in the English market over the wine of France. This inducement touched the monarch and his ministers so very nearly that it may be said to have finished the negotiations. The arrangement then made is famous in history as the Methuen Treaty that part of the bargain which had most interest for coming generations was the condition that the tax upon Portuguese wines imported into England should be one-third less than that imposed on wines coming from France, and in return for this concession, Portugal was to import all her woolen goods from England. The treaty had a very decided effect on the English upper and middle classes. Up to that time, the favorite drinks in England among those who could afford to drink wines at all were the clarets and burgundies of France. But the cheap admission of the stronger wine from Oporto, the wine which has always since been known in these countries as port, soon made it the habit and the delight of a large proportion of Englishmen and Scotchmen. The ancestors of the present generation continued for long years to indulge themselves freely in this powerful wine, and seeing that those who came to love it indulged in it quite as freely as they had allowed themselves to do in claret, the influence of the Methuen Treaty had anything but a wholesome effect on the heads and the habits of Englishmen and Scotchmen. If there had been a British Anacreon at any time during the following half-century, he must have sung the praises of good old port, and indeed the liquid may be said to have established itself in literature as well as in actual life among contemporary English institutions. 
it was recognized as a good old gentlemanly habit in the days of Dr. Johnson and in the days of the younger Pitt to be able to drink a quantity of port every day which would have proved utterly beyond the powers of a more recent generation. Even the medical faculty got into the way of prescribing a liberal allowance of port as an essential part of the true Britain's daily diet. On the other hand, it is only fair to say that the milder wines of France had still their champions. There are some famous lines which describe the effect of the new importation on the habits and nerves of the population of this island who lived on the north side of the Tweed. Often as the lines have been quoted, we cannot resist the temptation to quote them once more. Firm and erect the Caledonian stood, Sweet was his mutton and his claret good. Thou shalt drink port, the English statesman cried. He drank the poison and his spirit died. The treaty was afterwards modified and altered in several particulars from time to time, but it remained for Mr. Gladstone, within the memory of men now living, to give back to the wines of France their admission on cheaper terms into these countries, and thus to effect a genuine and a wholesome change in the daily habits of the wine-drinking population. The alliance between Great Britain and Portugal was more durable, however, than it could have been made by any conditions which merely dealt with the importation of wines. England proved the trusty friend of Portugal during many a change and on many a battlefield in days long after the war of the Spanish succession had become merely a matter of history. Louis of France had really no allies of any importance in this great war. The elector of Bavaria had been brought over to the side of France, but even he had not committed himself to the alliance at the time when the war began. Another ally of Louis was the Bavarian elector's brother, the elector of Cologne, but the assistance which such a state could give in such a struggle brought little or no serious advantage with it. King Louis had some great soldiers in his army. One was his famous marshal, the Duke of Vendôme, the extraordinary soldier whom Macaulay has described in some vigorous and vivacious passages. This man, says Macaulay, was distinguished by the filthiness of his person by the brutality of his demeanor, by the gross buffoonery of his conversation, and by the impudence with which he abandoned himself to the most nauseous of all vices. His sluggishness was almost incredible. Even when engaged in a campaign, he often passed whole days in his bed. His strange torpidity had been the cause of some of the most serious disasters which the armies of the House of Bourbon had sustained. But when he was roused by any great emergency, his resources, his energy, and his presence of mind were such as had been found in no French general since the death of Luxembourg. Another of Louis' great commanders was the Duke of Berwick, the illegitimate son of James the Second, last Stuart King of England, by Arabella Churchill, Marlborough's sister. It was a strange stroke of fate which thus brought Marlborough into antagonism with the son of his own sister, but the son of James the Second was undoubtedly in his fitting place when he led a French army against the soldiers of the new dynasty in England. Berwick was in his way a great soldier. As a commander, he was cool, calculating, cautious. He was not made up of surprising contrasts and paradoxical qualities like Vendôme. He had not Vendôme's brilliant flashes of military genius and moods of overwhelming energy, but he proved himself a commander who could put to trial even the foremost of the generals whom England sent to meet him on the battlefield. France had some obvious advantages for the coming struggle. She was, as a whole, obedient to one supreme will. Louis XIV was a despotic monarch, and under him 
despotic monarchy had become an almost absolute power. In all that great region which acknowledged his control, King Louis had only to issue his commands, and he had no fear of divided councils among the generals and the forces to whom he issued them. He had a large standing army, well accustomed to war, an army which of late years had grown habituated to victory. Nothing is more difficult than to obtain a trustworthy estimate as to the number of troops which the belligerents on either side could bring into the field, but so far as one can form an opinion, it would appear that France could put at the disposal of King Louis a larger force than the members of the Grand Alliance taken together could set in opposition to him. The few allies who had been induced to pledge themselves to his support, counted for almost nothing in the great approaching campaign, and whether they stood by him or deserted him or actually turned against him, could have made but little difference in the ultimate fortunes of the war. England, on the other hand, could not yet feel herself secure against the chance of a movement in Scotland to restore the Stuart dynasty. Ere the king's crown go down, there are heads to be broke, are the words which Walter Scott put into the mouth of Claverhouse, whom he pictured in his last efforts to restore the fortunes of the Stuarts, and the words might well have applied to the desperate resolve of many adherents to the fallen dynasty in the early days of Queen Anne, and in days much later still. The condition of Scotland at the time when the armies of the Grand Alliance were taking the field was still far from satisfactory to the English government, and no one could venture to say what the result might be if a French force were to effect a landing at some seaport north of the Tweed. But the intolerant policy of Louis had created a movement among the populations who inhabited the regions of the Cévennes Mountains, which threatened a serious trouble to his plans at a moment singularly inopportune for him. The Cévennes Mountains stretch for a certain distance almost side by side with the Rhône, and then turn toward the Pyrenees, which, though not of great height there, are rugged and steep, and had at that time much marsh and much forest spreading toward the Mediterranean. This extensive country seemed as if it were marked out by nature as a region in which a fighting and desperate population, even though small in numbers, could hold out long against the forces of a well-disciplined army, no matter what its superior strength. The population of the Cévennes Mountain District had suffered much by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, for it was a strongly Protestant population, and was not in the least disposed to give in to the decree of barbarous intolerance which King Louis had proclaimed. The inhabitants of this region belonged, for the most part, to a simple and sturdy peasantry who had all the faith of fanaticism in their resentment of the outrageous policy put in force against them, and they soon found leaders capable of inspiring and guiding their desperate resistance. Almost immediately after war had been proclaimed between England and France, a rising which was begun at first by a very small number of men broke out into organized resistance to the persecuting policy of King Louis. Bishop Burnet describes the rising as an unlooked-for accident, but to those who can survey the events from the clearer point of view which later years command, it would seem by no means an accident or anything unlooked for, but the natural and very justifiable result of the policy which the French king had consented to put in force. When it first broke out, says Burnet, it was looked on as the effect of oppression and despair, which would quickly end in a scene of blood. But it had a much longer continuance than was expected, and it had a considerable effect on the affairs of France, for an army of ten or twelve thousand men, who were designed either for Italy or Spain, was employed without any immediate success in reducing them. 
In a later passage of his history, Burnet tells us that the rising in the Cévennes had not been yet subdued, though Mariscal Montraval was sent with an army to reduce or destroy them. He committed great barbarities, and not only on those he found in arms, but on whole villages, because they, as he was informed, favored them. They came often down out of their hills in parties, ravaging the country, and they engaged the king's troops with much resolution and sometimes with great advantage. They seemed resolved to accept of nothing less than the restoring their edicts to them, for a connivance at their own way of worship was offered them. They had many among them who seemed qualified in a very singular manner to be the teachers of the rest. They had a great measure of zeal without any learning. They scarcely had any education at all. The good Bishop Burnet does not seem to have been very enthusiastic in the cause of men who might well be regarded as his co-religionists. He appears to have been rather surprised that they could not see their way to come to terms when what he describes as a connivance at their own way of worship was generously tendered to them on the part of King Louis. The remainder of this passage from Bishop Burnet is well worthy of a place here, for it illustrates very effectively the condition of the times and the spirit which animated the men of the Cévennes Mountains. I spoke with the person who, by the Queen's order, sent one among them to know the state of their affairs, I read some of the letters which he brought from them, full of a sublime zeal and piety. The bishop seems by this time to become awake to the deeper realities of the rising, expressing a courage and confidence that could not be daunted. One instance of this was that they all agreed that if any of them were so wounded in an engagement with the enemy that he could not be brought off, he should be shot dead rather than be left alive to fall into the enemy's hands. It was not possible then to form a judgment of that insurrection. The reports about it were so various and uncertain, it being as much magnified by some as it was undervalued by others. The whole number that they could reckon on was 4,000 men, but they had not arms and clothes for half that number, so they used these by turns while the rest were left at home to follow their labor. They put the country all about them in a great fright and to a vast expense, while no intelligence could be had of their designs, and they broke out in so many different places that all who lay within their reach were in a perpetual agitation. It was a lamentable thing that they lay so far within the country that it was not possible to send supplies to them unless the Duke of Savoy should be in a condition to break into Dauphiny, and therefore advices were sent them to accept of such terms as could be had and to reserve themselves for better times. We can judge from this passage that Queen Anne's advisers were willing to make the best use they could of the Cévennes insurgents, but the insurgents do not seem to have been inclined to adopt the prudential advice offered to them and to reserve themselves for better times. The rising came to be known as the rebellion of the camisards, or wearers of the shirt, camisa, a kind of blouse or smock-frock, which most of them wore in the first instance as a mere matter of accident or convenience, which became adopted as an easy means of recognition by sympathizers during the progress of the struggle, and afterwards was accepted as the recognized uniform and emblem of the whole insurrection. They had some resolute and capable leaders. The most distinguished among them was Jean Cavalier. We shall hear more of the insurrection and of this leader before long. At present, it is only necessary to describe its origin and its purposes in order to call attention to one serious trouble which beset the King of France at the very opening of the war, a trouble which, like many others of his reign, he would never have had to encounter if he had not yielded himself wholly to that policy of persecution which his favorites pressed upon him. It is a fact worth noticing in further illustration of this point 
that the command of the English and Portuguese forces sent by the Grand Alliance to the west of Europe was given to a French Protestant, the Earl of Galway, who had renounced his allegiance to the French sovereign in consequence of the persecuting policy exercised over the Protestants of France, had accepted a commission from King William, and now, honoured with an Irish peerage, was to render brilliant service to the cause of the Allies against Louis the Fourteenth. On the other hand, the German emperor was weakened to a great extent by the effects of a like policy of persecution. The provinces of Hungary and Transylvania had long been disaffected toward the imperial rule by the fact that the Protestant populations who resented bitterly the manner in which they had been oppressed because of their religion were always looking out for any alliance which might give them a chance of rising against the imperial rule and were positively craving for any opportunity of accomplishing a complete separation from Austria. Nor can it be forgotten that England, by her treatment of the Catholics in Ireland, had driven the Irish people into sympathy with the Stuart cause, and by her treatment of the Scottish Presbyterians, was at that very time arousing the sentiment in Scotland which made that country a favorable arena for any attempt at a restoration of the exiled dynasty. More than one English historical writer has deduced an obvious lesson as to the political consequences of religious persecution from the manner in which France was weakened by her treatment of the Huguenots after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and the German Empire was enfeebled by its treatment of the Protestants in Hungary. But these writers have failed to draw any moral from the fact that England herself was suffering because of the manner in which she had oppressed the Catholics in Ireland and the Presbyterians in Scotland. The truth is that in those times there was not much to choose, so far as the policy of religious persecution was concerned, between one state and another, between one sovereign and his rival. End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of The Reign of Queen Anne, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Campaign, Blenheim. The story of the war has to divide itself into two parts, the operations in the Low Countries and Germany, and those which were carried on in the southwest of the European continent. The Dutch people had of their own free will, and on the inspiration of their best national advisers, agreed to place their forces under the command of the Duke of Marlborough. They had recognized from the first the great military and political capacity of Marlborough, who had indeed made himself well known and very popular among the Dutch people, and they saw the immense advantage of having the full control of the armies operating in that part of Europe placed in the hands of one leader, especially when that leader was endowed with such gifts for the conduct of a war as they could not but acknowledge to be the possession of Marlborough. As the war went on, it brought out a whole group of generals whose names have taken an enduring place in history. Marlborough himself, Prince Eugene of Savoy, Peterborough, and many others on the side of the Grand Alliance, Vendome, Berwick, and others on the side of France. It was a war of navies as well as of armies, and on the sea the Grand Alliance naturally made a splendid show, the feats of Rook alone having raised monuments of English victory which are holding their firm place up to the present hour. No such war was ever seen in Europe from that time until the outbreak of the French Revolution, when the policy of European states, in endeavoring to overbear the national impulse of the French people, 
opened a field for the genius of the first Napoleon. The War of the Succession proved itself a test for the national endurance and resolve of peoples, alike for the genius of commanders and the discipline of armies. It was a struggle in which the survival of the fittest was amply and we might almost say scientifically illustrated and demonstrated. It exhibited a series of campaigns under the most varying conditions and the lessons to be learned from all the wars of former and succeeding days might be studied in the history of that one tremendous struggle. Many of the predictions which were most confidently made at the opening of the campaign were falsified before it had nearly come to a close. In quarters where weakness of resistance had been generally taken for granted, an unconquerable resolve to hold out to the very last compelled universal recognition. On the other hand, the very difficulties at the outset considered most formidable gave way with a suddenness which reduced to mere confusion all previous calculations. The war was great as a magnificent military pageant, but it can hardly be called great in its abiding results. When all was done, it left the political arrangements of the European continent very much as it had found them. England, of course, although she took the leading part in the struggle, was safe enough in her insular position and in the strength of her armies and her fleets not to be exposed to the risk of any lasting disadvantage from the greatest successes her enemies could obtain in the field. She had a stronghold to which, at the worst, she could always retire and bid defiance to the vengeful malice of her bitterest foes. The enemies which could not stand against Marlborough and his English troops on the continental battlefields were not likely to have any chance of doing better if they were to attempt an invasion of England. Even if we leave England out of the calculation, it must be observed that France and the Empire found themselves, after the close of the war, in very much the same conditions as before its opening. It was reserved for other events and for a much later time to call into existence that newer German Empire which superseded Austria as the representative of the German-speaking populations and to create that kingdom of Italy which was welcomed with so much enthusiasm by modern civilization. The force which England sent to serve under Marlborough in that part of the campaign which was to be conducted in the Low Countries was to consist of 40,000 men. A separate force was to be sent by England to Portugal, and 40,000 men were voted for the navy. The Emperor and the German states, which acted on his side, were to furnish 120,000 men. England had to make great efforts in order to obtain the requisite number of troops for her army, and the statute book for this part of Queen Anne's reign bears testimony still to the new measures which had to be adopted in order to tempt recruits to enter the military service. The armies of France were understood to bring into the field a number much larger than those provided by England and her allies. The object of Marlborough was to capture at once as many as possible of the strong places which France had obtained by former campaigns in the region of the Low Countries and Germany, and thus to secure a vantage ground as a starting point for his movements, and at the same time to establish a safe barrier between the operations of his Dutch allies and the operations of their French enemies. His policy was to make a sudden rush at the opening of the war, and thus at once to impress the enemy with a recognition of his military energy and power. To upset all the calculations which his enemies had formed as to their means of directing the campaign, and to keep the Dutch forces perfectly free for the arrangement and development of their own movements. In the history of the war, we shall find that there were two distinct orders of generalship. 
one class of leaders relied mainly on slow and steady movement, on the old familiar Fabian policy of patient endurance, waiting for the right opportunity to strike a heavy blow and holding out against all difficulties and disasters. The other, a policy of sudden rush, bewildering the antagonist by its unlooked-for impulse and energy. In times, within the recollection of living men, we have seen how in two great campaigns the Prussian generalship first displayed against the Austrians, and not long afterwards against the French, succeeded in thus upsetting all the preliminary calculations of the enemy and making the first blow struck in the campaign an omen of the final and decisive victory. The generalship of Marlborough shone with equal brilliancy in each mode of warfare. Marlborough was great alike in a plan of sudden, unforeseen rush and in slow, steady, patient movement. He was always open to the suggestions and the advice of those who acted in alliance with him, and if he saw any plan which he believed to be superior to his own, he was ready to adopt it. He entered fully into its spirit and carried it out to better effect than its authors could themselves have done. But it need hardly be said that throughout the whole of his campaigns he very seldom met with instances of this kind. And after a prompt but full consideration of all the plans, he almost always saw that his own was best adapted for its purpose. Like Clive at his council of war, he gave every suggestion its due consideration and then quietly adopted the advice of his own judgment and acted upon it. We shall see during the course of the war that he could show under the most adverse conditions that sublime patience, that slow, unconquerable power of mere endurance, which a great soldier of modern times, General Grant, afterwards President of the United States, once described to the author of these volumes as the most essential quality for successful command. By a series of sudden and daring movements, Marlborough captured a number of the French strongholds and thus made the ground which they had occupied a most convenient theatre for the exercise of his own operations. The capture of some of these towns and strong places was accompanied by picturesque incidents of bravery which have won a place never to be forgotten in the history of modern warfare. Marlborough himself on one occasion escaped by the merest chance and by a curious stroke of good fortune the fate of falling into the hands of his French enemies. For a time the appalling news spread through the Dutch people in the Low Countries that the commander-in-chief had been taken prisoner by the French, and the consternation spread by this report was only outdone by the exultation which followed the certain and prompt news that he and his allies had been saved from such a disaster. Marlborough was, indeed, an innovator on the old-fashioned forms of campaigning which had for some time prevailed on the continent of Europe. The slow and steady etiquette, for it may almost be called so, which had governed the plans of regular campaign was totally upset, was put to complete confusion and disorder by the daring inspiration of Marlborough's military genius. On the other hand, the enemies who had begun to look for sudden movements and surprises were trying to shape their own plans in order to counteract such a policy found their calculations often reduced to bewildering nothingness when it suited Marlborough to remain quiet and motionless until some special opportunity on which he had been carefully calculating afforded him the means of making the decisive stroke which it had been his object all through to accomplish. Thus the French commanders began to have the conviction borne in upon them that there was no counting on Marlborough that when they had made their plans to resist some sudden onward movement, their hopes were utterly disappointed, and Marlborough frustrated all their arrangements by a course of deliberation and delay, 
and then made his sudden stroke from some direction which no foresight of theirs had led them to anticipate and guard against. With the capture by storm of Liège, then a town nominally independent but garrisoned by the French, the English commander completed his plan for clearing and securing an advantageous basis of operations for himself and his Dutch allies. The lower valley of the Rhine was now one of the frontiers of what may be called Marlborough's camping ground. This was the first genuine discomfiture which the French had received for many years in their movements of aggression on the field of continental warfare, and the news was received with unbounded exultation in England. It was for that successful enterprise that Marlborough received his dukedom and Queen Anne herself attended a solemn ceremonial in St. Paul's to celebrate the victory. The desire and the obvious policy of Marlborough were that he should follow up his advantage by a series of bold movements, and that he should make an attack on the city of Antwerp itself. But he was greatly hampered in the execution of his plans by the delays in council and the difficulties put in the way of his prompt action by his Dutch allies. The generals of the Dutch forces were accompanied by a number of delegates from the central authorities of the United Provinces, whose business it was to consult with the commanding officers on every military plan, and to insist that their own suggestions and their own advice should be listened to before any active step was taken. In point of fact, Marlborough found himself thus accompanied everywhere by what may be called a civilian council of war, and the civilian council appears to have been actuated by a business-like anxiety to consider the cost and the risk of every movement before giving it approval. Such a course of proceeding might have been highly reasonable and prudent in the commercial transactions of life, and a cautious trader might fairly have been allowed to satisfy himself that the possible profits of an undertaking would be worth the certain risk and expense before committing himself to its execution. Even in ordinary commercial transactions, however, it might easily happen that the too slow and cautious speculator would find the possible opportunity secured in advance by some more enterprising rival. And in the business of war, the more successful rival is not likely to be content with merely securing the gain for himself, but will aim at the complete destruction of his opponent. Marlborough was to a great extent dependent on his Dutch allies for supplies and for forces, and he had to know over and over again that while the chances of this or that plan were the subject of slow and steady discussion, the opportunity for carrying it out was passing away, and encouragement was given to the enemy to make a forward movement of his own on the delaying English and Dutch allies. A large part of what is now the Kingdom of Belgium was at this time still under the dominion of Spain, and as far as regards the purposes of the war, might be considered in the enemy's country. The capture of Antwerp would have made Marlborough master of a splendid field for the operation of his further plans, but owing to the hampering influence of his allies, he found that it would be hopeless for him to undertake such an enterprise at that time, and he had therefore to content himself with obtaining possession of Bunn on the Rhine, and thus securing still further his expanded vantage ground. Meanwhile there had been some spirited fighting in North Italy, and a victory won at Cremona over the French forces had made the empire safe for a time against any invasion of the armies of King Louis from that quarter. The victory of Cremona was won by Prince Eugene of Savoy, who commanded the Allied armies in the northern parts of Italy. Up to this time, Marlborough and Eugene had never met, but from this time Marlborough began to see in Eugene the promise of a military cooperation and comradeship which might well be worth cultivating, and a confidential communication set in between the two generals whose names were destined to be afterwards linked together in fame. 
even with such a distance between them, Marlborough could follow the movements of Prince Eugene's game. Prince Eugene, der Edelritte of German song, was one of the heroic soldiers of the war. His name will always be associated with that of Marlborough. As we have already said, he was a younger son of the House of Savoy. He was the youngest son of the Prince of Savoy Carignan, and his mother was a niece of Cardinal Mazarin. From his birth, he thus may be said to have combined two nationalities, for he was born in Paris, he was brought up in the court of Louis the Fourteenth, and he was intended for the priesthood. But he had no calling whatever for the clerical profession, and even in his boyish studies showed already his taste for a military life and his determination to be a soldier. Indeed, if destiny ever had marked out a young man for the business of the camp and the battlefield, Eugene of Savoy may be said to have had his destiny thus forecast for him. After the death of his father, some estrangement arose between Louis the Fourteenth and the widow of the Savoy prince. In those days and in that sphere, it was no uncommon thing that the favored courtier of one week might be the discredited exile of the next, and Eugene's mother was banished from the court. King Louis refused the application which Eugene had made for a commission in the royal army, spoke slightingly of him as a little abbe, and made it only too clear to him that he must expect no toleration from the court of France. Eugene from that time ceased to regard himself as a Frenchman, renounced his allegiance to the King of France, and took service under the Emperor. He got his first taste of warfare in an expedition against the Turks, in which he displayed all the courage and ability that his most admiring comrades of former days could have expected of him. When the Emperor was engaged in war against Louis the Fourteenth in Italy, Prince Eugene had opportunities of paying off some of his old scores against the Grand Monarch. And at a later day, he won European renown by the defeats which he inflicted on the Turks in Hungary, defeats which may be said to have formed a decisive chapter in the history of Turkish aggression. His success in this campaign gave him the foremost position among the commanders in the imperial service. When the War of the Spanish Succession began, Eugene was put in command of the imperial forces, and the conditions of the campaign brought him into cooperation with Marlborough. Between Marlborough and Eugene, a friendship soon sprang up, which only deepened as time went on. The two men were not by any means alike in character and temperament. Eugene had the single-mindedness and the romantic nature of the knight-errant. Marlborough, with many noble qualities, was capable of almost any act of treachery where he saw his way to secure some prize and believed the prize to be worth the temporary sacrifice of principle and honor. The two men differed from each other as much in military disposition as in personal character. Eugene was all compact of headlong courage and almost heedless impetuosity. His motto was, ever forward. His men would have followed him anywhere, and it has to be said that he would have led them anywhere, no matter how impossible the success of the enterprise might be, if the passion took him for the rush of an onward movement. He had none of Marlborough's superb patience, none of his calm, steady foresight, none of his comprehensive calculating power. Eugene, in fact, was a splendid leader of cavalry, a knight without fear and without reproach. But Marlborough was one of the greatest commanders whose names live in history. The two men, however, were thoroughly in sympathy. Eugene appreciated the supreme qualities of Marlborough, and Marlborough understood Eugene's noble nature and the extent and the limits of his military capacity. Marlborough always said 
that there was nothing that he could not trust to Eugene, and nothing that Eugene could not do if he only got a fair opportunity. During many stages of the campaign, they were divided from each other by wide distances and were often compelled to act as if in absolute independence. But whenever it was possible for them to keep in touch with each other, they did thus keep in touch, and the genius of Marlborough was enabled at once to direct the energies and to profit by the suggestions of Eugene. A serious crisis intervened for the time in the plans of Marlborough, owing to the continuous obstacles interposed in his way by the slowness, the unwillingness, and the incessant counselings of his Dutch allies, he found it impossible to carry out his enterprise for the capture of Antwerp. The armies of the allies in other parts of the continental field of campaign had received some serious checks from the French, which even the brilliant success of Prince Eugene at Cremona had not done much to counterbalance. King Louis could only see that Marlborough was not keeping up his sudden forward movement. He had yet no means of divining that the delay was owing entirely to the slowness and hesitation of the Dutch commissioners, and he seems to have taken it for granted that the delay denoted some hesitation on the part of Marlborough himself. The result was that Louis began to feel greatly encouraged as to the prospects of the campaign and was forming schemes in his mind for a forward and daring movement on the part of the main French army. Marlborough probably guessed, by instinct, that King Louis was meditating some decisive movement which for the moment he could do nothing to prevent or even discourage. At that time he felt so disgusted by the enforced inaction to which he saw himself doomed for the moment, but he was actually making up his mind to resign his command and to leave the Grand Alliance to try what it could do without him. He went so far as to let the home government know that he was unwilling to assume the responsibility any further, and it required all the assurances and the pressure of Godolphin to prevail on him not to resign his command. Marlborough had great faith in the judgment and resources of Godolphin, and so long as he could feel assured that he might rely upon the home government for full support in any enterprise he might decide upon, he was not the man to give way before adverse conditions. Marlborough's hands were very full about this time. He was the political as well as the military adviser of the English government, of the emperor, and of the United Provinces. He was unceasingly engaged in efforts to bring about a better understanding between the emperor and the Protestants of Hungary. He was doing all he could to stimulate and make use of the rising in the Cévennes. Marlborough hated nothing so much as the writing of letters, and only the pressure of actual necessity could compel him to send home dispatches sufficiently long for the information of Queen Anne's ministers. Yet it should be said that even in his seasons of greatest stress he could always find time to write love letters to the imperious wife whom he adored, and to assure her that in the midst of all his battles, his sieges, and his various other troubles, he was always her devoted admirer and her faithful servant. The rising in the Cévennes had assumed very serious proportions. The efforts of Louis to put down this movement by mere slaughter and cruelty had proved wholly ineffectual. Jean Cavalier and his commissar were not men to be crushed into submission. They had risen in rebellion for a cause which was much dearer to them than life. In an appeal which they addressed to the governments of England and of Holland, they set forth their purpose and their resolves in the most straightforward and manly terms. We are ourselves, they said, not in rebellion against our lawful prince, but merely to defend a right of nature. We follow but the dictates of our conscience. We are not to be frightened by numbers, however superior to our own. We desire to harm no persons who do not strive to harm us. But we shall not hesitate to make just reprisals against our persecutors, 
as we are sanctioned in doing by the common laws of nations, by the common practice, and also by the word of God. Sometimes it may be admitted that the reprisals which they did attempt and carry out were undoubtedly cruel and severe, but they were driven to positive desperation by the savage cruelties inflicted on them and on all around who encouraged and supported, or were believed to encourage and support them. Their course, in fact, was clear. They were determined that so long as any of them remained alive to fight for their cause, they would fight for it to the bitter end. It became evident that nothing but a war of extermination could bring the rising to a close. Jean Cavalier showed the true spirit of a gallant and unconquerable soldier. Louis at last sent against them one of his greatest military commanders, Marshal Villars, but Villars, who was a man of keen judgment and on the whole of enlightened views, soon saw that the only way to success must lie in keeping up the fight until the last of the commissaires had been done to death, and he knew what such a policy as this must cost his royal master, and he was not the man to enter on it except as the last possible resource. He saw and thoroughly appreciated the military genius of Cavalier, and he ventured on his own account to make overtures which showed his willingness to enter into conditions that might lead to a lasting peace. He offered to open negotiations with Cavalier. The result was that arrangements were made by which, under certain conditions, something like liberty of conscience was guaranteed to the rebels, with a free pardon to all of them who were willing to accept the terms, and immunity for the region from the oppressive taxation, until that part of the country should have had some breathing time to recover from the cruel effects of the previous devastation. Cavalier accepted the conditions, although he had much difficulty in prevailing upon some of his followers to be guided by him and to act upon his decision, so deeply rooted was the terror with which the hitherto remorseless policy of Louis had filled their minds and hearts. Cavalier, however, was influential enough to have his way with the main body of the insurgents, and the result was that although the rebellion still held out for a time, it greatly lost its force, and after a while the large majority of the inhabitants were enabled to return to their industrial occupations and to live in peace. It must be added that in some instances the terms of the treaty were carried out by the French government in a grudging and niggardly spirit, and that a large emigration from the oppressed district set in. For the time, the struggle was over, and Cavalier accepted service under the government of Queen Anne. He was dispatched into Spain, and in command of a gallant band of his commissaires, he bore a brave part afterwards in the memorable Battle of Almanza. Cavalier himself, leading a desperate charge, was severely wounded and was left for dead on the battlefield. He recovered and was made a general in the English army, and in the service of England he continued until his death. When peace was restored, he was appointed governor of Jersey and afterwards of the Isle of Wight and died quietly in Chelsea in the May of 1740. We are anticipating time and events in order to complete at once the story of this brave and noble career. For the present, we must turn to the position of Marlborough as he found himself after he had made up his mind to go on with his command to the last. In the meantime, Prince Eugene and his forces had come into Bavaria, and Marlborough was thus enabled to enter into frequent communication with the gallant Prince of Savoy. The two commanders met for the first time in the Duchy of Württemberg, and there they spent some days together and arranged their plans for an active and decisive cooperation. King Louis, as we have already said, had become inspired by the resolve to make a supreme effort which should utterly confound the whole policy of the English and the Dutch. His project was to invade the empire itself and to make a forward movement which was to end in nothing less 
than the siege and capture of the emperor's capital, Vienna. Marlborough seems to have divined his purpose by one of those instinctive impulses of military genius and inspiration which did him such splendid service during the whole of his career. Louis put into the field all the forces he could command, but he kept on sending separate armies on different expeditions, threatening this or that member of the Grand Alliance in order to divert attention from the masterstroke of military enterprise which it was his purpose and his hope to direct to a complete success. Marlborough thoroughly appreciated the plan. It was just such a plan as he himself under like conditions would have made up his mind to put into action. He felt sure that he understood the king's intentions and that he knew the best way to frustrate them. In the famous words which Grattan applied to Edmund Burke, he saw everything, he foresaw everything. He determined to force the French into a great pitched battle and to upset all their calculations by a signal victory. The policy of the French had up to this time been to evade anything like a decisive encounter on a grand scale, to play a sort of waiting game, and to take all the advantage which they possibly could from the difficulties put in Marlborough's way by the slowness of his allies, and by the manner in which the forces of the Grand Alliance were compelled to act on so many and so widely separated fields. Marlborough forced the councils in the hands of his Dutch allies. He suddenly crossed the Neckar, and directed his movements right through Germany toward the Danube, forming a junction with the army of the emperor under the Prince of Baden, stormed the heights which were guarded by some of the French allies, crossed the Danube itself and made his way into Bavaria. There he encountered the French forces, strengthened by the coming of Marshal Tallard on the scene to the assistance of the Bavarian troops. Marlborough effected a junction with the forces commanded by Prince Eugene. Marshal Tallard had at his back an army of more than 30,000 men, who, when joined with the troops under the command of the Bavarian prince, numbered about 60,000, and thus the forces of King Louis were strengthened so far as to give him an advantage in numbers over those of the Grand Alliance. The Allied armies now had at that place and time a number of about 52,000 fighting men, but Tallard was strongly entrenched, and in the matter of artillery was much stronger than his opponents. The French were still anxious to avoid at all events to postpone a great engagement, which it was Marlborough's determination to force on them at once. This resolve was Marlborough's own policy altogether. There were some of the officers, even under his own command, who tried to persuade him that his policy was not only dangerous but desperate. The mind of Marlborough was clearly made up. He assured them that a great engagement was necessary to their united purpose, that he could trust to the bravery and energy of the Allied troops to carry all before them, and that now was the time and in front of them lay the field where the great battle must be fought, and as he felt convinced, could actually be won. Night was approaching, and Marlborough spent part of that night in prayer and the remaining hours in close counsel with Prince Eugene. When the first rays of light began to show themselves in the summer sky on the morning of August 13th, the English commander gave the signal for a forward movement. The scene of action enclosed the little village of Blenheim, the name of which is destined to be as famous in history as that of Waterloo. The village of Blenheim stands on the north bank of the Danube, which is there broad, deep, and very rapid. At a point not far below the village, a small stream, the Nebel, runs into the great river. The land there was at that time almost all swampy, but crossed by some well-wooded hills. Prince Eugene, in accordance with the directions of Marlborough, made the first movement. Marlborough was at the center of the English forces. The first business of the English commander was to accomplish the crossing of the Nebel streamlet. 
Tayard seems to have taken the enemy's movements rather too easily and confidently. He probably thought either that they could not succeed in crossing the stream, or that if they did cross it and get into the marshy and hilly regions beyond, they would become so much disordered by the effort that to crush them in their disarray would be an easy piece of work for him. Talard, as a soldier, belonged rather to the old school. He was a believer in a deliberate and methodical policy, governed by ancient and well-established rules, and did not count on the perfect order which the troops of Marlborough had learned to maintain, even in the fiercest rush of a sudden onward movement. On the right of Marlborough's center, one force of the Allies had made an attack and were encountered, delayed, and actually driven back for a time by the impetuous rush of the Irish Brigade. This Irish Brigade was made up of a large number of exiles from Ireland, who had been trained on many battlefields and taken service under the King of France. During generations in the past and for some time to come, there was hardly a battle fought between an army of England and an army of France in which the French cause was not brilliantly sustained by a regiment of Irishmen, whom the policy of successive English governments had driven from the service of England and had forced to take arms on the side of England's great enemy. The news was soon brought to Marlborough that the line of the English troops had been broken by the bold rush of the Irish Brigade, and that there was even a possibility of all communication with the troops under Prince Eugene being cut off. This was just the crisis to call into action the genius of a commander like Marlborough, if indeed any other commander of that age could be said to be like Marlborough. Marlborough took the field at once, drove back the Irish brigade, and before the evening had far advanced, the whole of his cavalry had been brought across the stream. Marlborough ordered a general advance of his main body against the lines of the defending French. Then the great battle took place, and it did not last long. The French were completely defeated, and Marshal Tallard himself was made a prisoner while endeavoring to find shelter in Blenheim. Marlborough behaved with gracious courtesy to the distinguished prisoner, put his own carriage at Tallard's disposal, and saw that the French marshal was secured against all danger. Then he found time to write the dispatch which is still preserved and makes a part of English history. The dispatch was dated August 13th, 1704. These were its words. I have not time to say more, but to beg you will give my duty to the Queen and let her know her army has had a glorious victory. Monsieur Tallard and two other generals are in my coach, and I am following the rest. The bearer, my aide-de-camp, Colonel Parker, will give her an account of what has passed. I shall do, he thus wrote in his old-fashioned spelling, it in a day or two by another more at large. The dispatch was signed Marlborough. The village of Blenheim itself had still to be captured by the forces of the Allies. Blenheim had been occupied by some French battalions, and these were as yet in possession of the place. It was not a fortified place, was not a stronghold in any sense of the word. It was a convenient possession for the French commander as a starting point for the conduct of his operations, and if he could only have cleared Marlborough and Eugene out of the field, it would have been a convenient place to return to, and would have served as the scene of new preparations. The French troops who fell back upon it and occupied it after the defeat of the main army soon found that it was impossible to hold it as a place of arms. They had the English army in front and the Danube behind. Many tried to swim the river and lost their lives in the attempt. Marlborough's troops kept up a continual firing on the French troops who were thus beleaguered and gave them little opportunity to escape. The French behaved bravely, and many of the officers and men were well inclined to stand the final assault of the Allied forces and give up their lives rather than yield the place. More prudent counsels, however, prevailed. To hold out would have led to a mere slaughter. The capture of the place was inevitable, Further resistance only meant the futile destruction of brave men in masses. The surrender was made, and the battle was over. 
According to the most accurate accounts which can be obtained, Marlborough and his allies had about 52,000 men in the field, while the French had somewhat more than 60,000. The loss of the English and their allies in killed, wounded, and missing was about 11,000, and that of the French amounted to more than 40,000 killed or taken prisoners, to say nothing of the large numbers who were not likely to answer any roll call, but were wandering as stragglers and fugitives over the face of the country. Bishop Burnet's concise account of the great battle is of the highest value because it is taken for the most part at first hand and on the best authority. I will not, says the bishop modestly, venture on a particular relation of that great day, but then he goes on to say that he has seen a copious account of it prepared by the Duke of Marlborough's orders that will be printed some time or other, but there are some passages in it which make him not think it fit to be published presently. He told me he never saw more evident characters of a special providence than appeared that day, a signal one related to his own person, a cannonball went into the ground so near him that he was sometime quite covered with the cloud of dust and earth that it raised about him. Then the bishop proceeds, as he says, to sum up the action in a few words. Our men quickly passed the brook. The French made no opposition. This was a fatal error and was laid wholly to Tallard's charge. The action that followed was for some time very hot. Many fell on both sides. Ten battalions of the French stood their ground but were in a manner mowed down in their ranks. Upon that the horse ran many of them into the Danube, most of these perished. Talar himself was taken prisoner. The rest of his troops were posted in the village of Blenheim, these seeing all lost, and that some bodies were advancing upon them, which seemed to them to be thicker than indeed they were, and apprehending that it was impossible to break through, they did not attempt it, though brave men might have made their way. Instead of that, when our men came up to set fire to the village, the Earl of Orkney first beating a parley, they hearkened to it very easily and were all made prisoners of war. There were about 1,300 officers and 12,000 common soldiers who laid down their arms and were now in our hands. Thus all Talat's army was either killed in the action, drowned in the Danube, or became prisoners by capitulation. Things went not so easily on Prince Eugene's side where the elector and Marsan commanded. He was repulsed in three attacks, but carried the fourth and broke in, and so he was master of their camp, cannon, and baggage. The enemy retired in some order, and he pursued them as far as men wearied with an action of about six hours in an extremely hot day could go. Thus we gained an entire victory." In this action there were on our side about 12,000 killed and wounded, but the French and the Elector lost about 40,000 killed, wounded, and taken. Bishop Burnet seems to have been inclined to disparage the spirit with which the French who occupied the village of Blenheim were disposed to encounter their enemies. Many accounts of that part of the day's events, given by observers on the English side, bear willing and generous testimony to the courage displayed by the French and to the fact that the French officers in command had some difficulty in prevailing on their men not to struggle on to the very last. It is even stated that one French regiment burnt its colors when the order for surrender was given. Nothing seems to be more certain than the fact that any further resistance would have been utterly futile and that Blenheim would have been taken all the same, no matter how those who defended it were captured or were slain. Thus ended the first great battle between the armies led by Marlborough and the forces of King Louis. The glory of the victory was essentially Marlborough's own. The great commander was indeed splendidly seconded by Prince Eugene. Great praise the Duke of Marlborough won, and our good Prince Eugene, as the words go in Southey's rather feeble poem, and he was supported by the indomitable bravery of the troops who acted under his orders. But not merely was the plan of the battle his own, but the plans which brought about the battle and forced it on the enemy. Indeed, the whole policy which made that particular region a field of battle 
and thus shattered the enterprise which King Louis had hoped to carry out, was the creation of Marlborough's own genius. To win a chance of putting his policy to any test, he had to surmount difficulties created by his own allies, which were hardly less formidable and less destructive at one time than any that could have been thrown across his path by his embattled enemies. The news of this great victory was received in England with a very natural outburst of exultation. The estate of Woodstock, where Blenheim Palace was afterwards built, was bestowed upon Marlborough in grateful recognition of his services. The emperor expressed a strong desire to confer upon Marlborough some signal and special honor in acknowledgment of the work he had done and offered to create him a prince of the German Empire. Marlborough declined to accept this dignity until he should have entered into communication with Queen Anne and obtained her permission for one of her own subjects in command of her army to become a prince of a foreign state. The Queen graciously accorded her permission. Marlborough, therefore, obtained the privilege, extraordinary for an English subject, of becoming a prince of a foreign empire, and not long after the emperor made him a gift of the province of Mindelsheim in Bavaria, as the principality which was to enable him to sustain his new title. At home the building of the palace of Blenheim was begun on the royal manor of Woodstock. It was to be the possession of him and his heirs, and a perpetual monument of the gratitude felt for him by the queen and the country. Another honor, too, awaited him, which is likely to be remembered through all history. An outburst of versified glorification in honor of Marlborough's name and services came from many English writers, but the English ministers, anticipating correctly the decision of time, did not consider any of these rhythmical laudations quite equal to the occasion. Godolphin, who was then what we should now call the prime minister, was not quite the man to discover by his own literary judgment the fitting English laureate for such a triumph, but he consulted with some of his friends who knew rather more about poets and poetry than he did. He was advised to apply to a rising poet and essayist named Joseph Addison, then about thirty years of age, and at his request Addison was prevailed upon to attempt a poetic celebration of the victory. This he did in the famous poem called The Campaign, some lines of which have since become the subject of incessant quotation. This poem shows how at the crisis of the battle great Marlborough's mighty soul was proved, how he inspired repulsed battalions to engage and taught the doubtful battle where to rage, how calm and serene he drives the furious blast and pleased the Almighty's orders to perform, rides in the whirlwind and directs the storm. This passage is by far the finest and the most characteristic of the whole poem, and gives it indeed its title to immortality. Perhaps it is not too much to say that Addison's own fame and the greatest part of his career began with this poetic tribute, which recognized so thoroughly the master qualities of the great commander who had then for the first time, given full proof of his genius for command. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of the Reign of Queen Anne, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami Peterborough in Spain The military and naval operations in and around Spain must form a chapter in this story quite distinct from that which describes the operations of Marlborough in the Low Countries and in Germany. Although the object of both campaigns was the same, Yet, owing to the difference of locality and conditions, the movements were carried on in absolute independence of each other, and it was, in fact, as if England had been engaged in two separate wars for distinct purposes in two different quarters of the globe. The command of the English expedition to Spain 
was given to the Duke of Ormond, a man who had shown courage and soldierly energy in former campaigns, but had none of the qualities which make a great general. There was, as a matter of course, a contingent of Dutch allies who had a general of their own nationality. The jealousies between the Dutch and the other troops, the difficulties about agreeing quickly upon any plan of combined action, which it had taken all the authority and all the patience of Marlborough to deal with on his fields of campaign, proved entirely too much for Ormond's management. The task which the Allied forces had to undertake would not have been easy for any commander. The Allied forces were understood to be acting in the interests of Spain and in order to rescue that country from being converted into a mere province or vassal of the French monarchy. But the population of Spain could hardly be called a declared party to the dispute of the rival princes who claimed the succession and of the foreign states which supported one claim and opposed the other. Then again, the armies and fleets of England and Holland had to begin their work of pacification by capturing Spanish towns and landing troops on the Spanish coast. To the mind of the ordinary Spaniard, it might well have seemed that a foreign army of occupation was the army of an enemy, no matter what might be the name and title, no matter what might be the friendly or hostile professions of the sovereign who gave it orders to establish itself on Spanish soil. In fact, the war, like most wars in those days, was made in the interests of princes and dynasties only, and had as little to do with the condition and the sympathies of the population of Spain as with those of the population of England. The troops of the Duke of Ormond made their appearance off Cadiz in August 1702. One or two small towns were captured, but the Duke of Ormond proved himself utterly unequal to the occasion. Macaulay tells us what came of these captures. No discipline was kept. The soldiers were suffered to rob and insult those whom it was most desirable to conciliate. Churches were robbed, images were pulled down, nuns were violated. The officers shared the spoil instead of punishing the spoilers. Cadiz, was not taken, and after a few weeks of this worse than futile and absolutely disgraceful work, it was decided by the Allied commanders that the enterprise should be abandoned. Still, however, the whole enterprise was not abandoned, without at least one exploit, although the exploit did not tend much to the advantage of the general policy or to the national glory of the Allies. When the fleet was on its way back to England, and was off the coast of Portugal, the Duke of Ormond received news that the treasure ships from America had arrived within European waters and were making for the harbor of Vigo in order to escape the armament of the Allies. The treasure ships, which were said to be carrying a cargo of more than three millions in gold and silver, had actually got into Vigo Harbor. Here, the blundering regulations of the Spanish authorities suddenly came to the help of those whom we may fairly call the invaders. It was one of the laws governing Spanish trade that the treasure ships should unload nowhere but at Cadiz. A long delay, therefore, took place while the defenders of Vigo were striving to communicate with the central authorities and to obtain permission for the landing of the precious cargo at Vigo. In the meantime, the English fleet was able to settle the whole question. Some attempt was made to defend Vigo, but the troops of Ormond captured the forts, a large part of the treasure was sunk forever in the waters of the harbor, and the victors were only able to secure a portion of the spoil. As Macaulay tells us, when all the galleons had been captured or destroyed, came an order in due form allowing them to unload. Never was there a more curious illustration of the effect which mere routine 
in the business of administration can sometimes work. If the central authorities had only sent their permission a little earlier for the unloading of the treasure ships at Vigo, their whole cargoes might easily have been landed and removed to a place of security before the fleet of the Allies had come up. The Allies got some solid plunder out of their expedition and had the satisfaction of knowing that the Spanish authorities got nothing whatever. That ended the attempt upon the Spanish coast for the year, but in the following year, the alliance with Portugal being now secured, a new attempt was made, and this time Sir George Rook had command of an expedition which was destined to leave a lasting monument of its success in history. Sir George Rook made an ineffectual attempt at Barcelona and then suddenly attacked Gibraltar. Rook disembarked some of his troops on the narrow link of land which connects the rock and the fortress with the inhabited shore. The attack was wholly unexpected. It was the Saints' Day, August 3, 1704. And many of the defenders of the fortress had gone to attend religious services a little while off. A body of English sailors accomplished the remarkable feat of clambering by a path which to observers from a distance might have seemed impossible, even for the agility of a goat, to the very top of the rock, and there they hoisted the English flag. The few defenders of the garrison who were left to look after its safety had nothing for it but to capitulate, and the fortress of Gibraltar thus suddenly became a part of the dominions of the English crown and has remained an English fortress to this day. Bishop Burnet's cool and matter-of-fact comments on this capture have a certain curious interest even now for the reader. The bishop certainly does not seem to have shared in the general enthusiasm of his country. It has been much questioned, Burnet says, by men who understand these matters well, whether our possessing ourselves of Gibraltar and our maintaining ourselves in it so long was to our advantage or not. It has certainly put us to a great charge, and we have lost many men in it. But it seems the Spaniards, who should know the importance of the place best, think it so valuable that they have been at a much greater charge and have lost many more men while they have endeavored to recover it than the taking or keeping it has cost us, and it is certain that in war whatever loss on one side occasions a greater loss of men or of treasure to the other must be reckoned a loss only to the side that suffers most. England, however, did not regard the capture of Gibraltar in this easy mood of methodical calculation. The old saying, which couples lightly won with lightly lost, does not apply to the occupation of Gibraltar. The capture of the fortress had been made with all the ease and the light suddenness which might belong to some military feat in melodrama or even in comic opera. But England seemed only to grow more and more resolute in her determination to hold on to her prize in each succeeding generation. The sovereign who followed Queen Anne on the English throne was at one time well inclined to enter into arrangements with Spain for the restoration of Gibraltar, but his ministers understood too well the strength of public feeling to give any countenance to such a proposal, and the king had to back out of his suggestion very quickly and try as best he could to convey the idea that he really had nothing of the kind in his mind, or that if he had, it was only his fun. Since that time, no English statesman in office has ever entertained the idea of giving back the fortress of Gibraltar, and only the other day a commission was appointed by the English government for the purpose of ascertaining whether the defenses of the rock and the fortress were still strong enough to defy any attack from a possible enemy, whether the enemy might come from within or without the country to which Gibraltar once belonged. In 1705, after the fortress of Gibraltar had maintained with triumph a siege by the combined forces of France and Spain, 
in which the defeated besiegers suffered a severe loss of men, and the English defenders lost very few, the government of Queen Anne thought the time had come to open an effective campaign on a large scale in Spain. Queen Anne's advisers were probably inspired as much by the victories which Sir George Rook had so suddenly and easily accomplished as by the comparative failure of the expedition under the Duke of Ormond. This time they made up their minds that something more definite must be done. They had reason to believe that the provinces of Catalonia and Valencia were but little inclined to favor the cause of the claimant, whose relationship with King Louis seemed only too clearly to indicate a policy which must reduce the whole of Spain into the condition of a French province forever. The first object of the new expedition, so far as the ministers of Queen Anne could plan it, was to obtain possession of the great commercial city of Barcelona, the capital of Catalonia, and then to capture also some of the other seaport towns on the Spanish coast, and thus make sure of a convenient field of operations for a systematic invasion of Spain. The first movement for the carrying out of this plan was to find the man who could most safely be entrusted with its conduct, and Queen Anne's ministers had not much difficulty in making their choice. Charles Mordaunt, afterwards Earl of Peterborough, was one of the most brilliant and adventurous figures in that age of brilliant adventure. During his youthful days, he had served in the fleet and afterwards had been engaged in exploring enterprises of various kinds in the wild regions of Barbary. It was not uncommon in those days for young men of family to try their fortune and test their capacity in both the fighting professions, and Charles Mordaunt soon changed his naval career for the life of a soldier. He was born not long before the Restoration, and as a young peer he had opposed, in the House of Lords, much of the religious policy of James the Second. This course of action brought him so much into disfavor with the king and the king's court that he found it prudent to take refuge for a time in Holland, and while there he came into close association with William the Third. It is believed that he was among the most earnest of those who urged on William the advisability of putting himself forward as the representative of the rising opposition to the Stuart dynasty, and even as the invader of England for the rescue of the English people from the Stuart dominion. It is believed that he was the first Englishman of recognized rank who strove to persuade William that the enterprise had every chance of being crowned with complete success. Most assuredly, it was an undertaking which would have suited thoroughly with the whole spirit of Morden's character, and with his genius for adventure, and nothing could well have seemed more delightful to such a man than to risk his life on so perilous an undertaking. When the revolution had been accomplished and William was on the throne of England, Mordaunt was made Earl of Monmouth and held office as First Lord of the Treasury. He did not, however, get on very well with the new sovereign, and indeed any rule which seemed likely to bring about a steady progress in peaceful and practical government would not have much fascination for a man of his restless and ardent temperament. He was suspected and accused of encouraging plots against the new sovereign, and he not only lost his high public offices, but he was actually committed as a prisoner to the Tower of London. In those days, a change like that was not uncommon for a public man. The uncertainty which seemed to attend each new system of government, the absence of any clearly recognized constitutional principles applicable to all governments, and the fluctuation of opinions from this side to that will explain many of the sudden changes in the career of men who can hardly be suspected of conscious duplicity or of mere self-seeking motives. There was no conclusive evidence to be brought against Charles Mordaunt, and he was soon released from his imprisonment, which must probably have appeared to him only one other incident in his life of continuous adventure. When he found that he had nothing else to do, he was in the habit of starting out as a traveler to any part of Europe 
whither his restless temperament directed him, and perhaps it might be said of him, without extravagance of statement, that the only thing that his untiring activity would not allow him to do was to keep quiet and do nothing. He was very winning in manners, and although his figure and personal appearance had not the grace and beauty which belonged to Marlborough, he was always a great favorite with women, and in the midst of all his enterprises he could find time to pay devoted attention to a charming woman. Swift, in some animated lines, tells a mordant that in journeys he outrides the post, that he travels not, but runs a race. As a leader of men, he had hardly a rival in those days, and the soldiers who served under him were so readily filled with his own enthusiasm that they only wanted his word of command to undertake any enterprise, no matter how difficult, no matter how dangerous, no matter how seemingly hopeless, if he would lead the way. The qualities of a really great commander for a long undertaking and over a wide field of action he could not be said to possess. He had all the quickness of conception, all the sudden impulses of energy and daring, which often made so telling, so practical, and so successful a part of Marlborough's plans. But then these were only a part, and an occasional part, of Marlborough's military qualities, and Charles Mordaunt had none of Marlborough's patience, none of that cool, calculating foresight which enabled Marlborough to make arrangements for the far future and to wait resolute and motionless until the opportunity should arise for making the right movement at the right moment. Macaulay says of Mordaunt that he was, if not the greatest, yet assuredly the most extraordinary character of that age, the King of Sweden himself not even excepted. Macaulay goes on to say that he might be described as a polite, learned, and amorous Charles the Twelfth. Macaulay describes him as a kind friend, a generous enemy, and in deportment a thorough gentleman. As in truth the last of the knights errant, brave to temerity, liberal to profusion, courteous in his dealings with enemies, the protector of the oppressed, the adorer of women. But the same historian does not fail to tell us that Morden's splendid talents and virtues were rendered almost useless to his country by his levity, his restlessness, his irritability, his morbid craving for novelty and excitement. Before Queen Anne came to the throne, Mordaunt had already become Earl of Peterborough on the death of his uncle, and on Anne's accession he at once began to take a public part in life again. Marlborough had a high opinion of Peterborough's military capacity, and indeed it was one of Marlborough's valuable gifts as a great commander that he had an instinctive appreciation of the high qualities of other men. It was believed at the time that Marlborough's personal recommendation secured for Peterborough the important post which was given to him and proved so well suited to his peculiar genius the command of the Queen's forces in Spain. No other part of that immense enterprise could have been so admirably adapted for the full development of Peterborough's romantic energy as the field which was assigned to him in Spain. The very atmosphere of the region must have been congenial to him. He was a Don Quixote of a later day, made happy by conditions which allowed his knight-errant spirit to find opportunities for genuine chivalry in a service to which he had become devoted and in enterprises which made romance itself a living reality. The position assigned to Peterborough in this new Spanish expedition was one which gave him full command over the military force and so much of control over the fleet that so long as he was actually on board a vessel, he was to have a divided authority with the British Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel. The military force was not very great, amounting to about 5,000 men, of whom two-thirds were English and the remainder were supplied by the Dutch allies. The fleet first made for Lisbon, and by the time it had arrived there, 
Peterborough found that he was miserably provided with food or with stores of any kind, and that the government had given him the disposal of very little money with which to supply all that was wanting. Peterborough's first act, when he discovered the defective condition of his fleet, was peculiarly characteristic. At his own cost, or at any events at his own risk and responsibility, he supplied his ships and his men with all that was needed to keep them in good condition for the work they had to undertake. He was fortunately enabled also to increase his military strength by two cavalry regiments put at his disposal by the Earl of Galway, the French Protestant soldier who has been already mentioned as engaged in Portugal on the side of the Grand Alliance. The Archduke Charles himself had been serving with Galway, and he now took a part in the movement conducted by Peterborough. Bishop Burnet always speaks deferentially of the Archduke Charles as the King of Spain. Of course, the Archduke Charles was the claimant whom the Grand Alliance proposed to put upon the throne of Spain, and already recognized by the Allies as King. The design of Peterborough was not to linger over the capture of Barcelona, but to make a bold attempt and move directly on Madrid itself. The Archduke Charles and the Prince of Hesse were strongly in favor of the attempt on Barcelona, and both these princes were opposed to Peterborough's daring project, which appeared to them to be surrounded by insuperable difficulties. Peterborough was convinced that if he accomplished his bold and thorough design, he could, by seizing on the capital, which was only 150 miles away, bring the war to a close by that one decisive stroke. On the other hand, his belief was that the army at his command was not strong enough in numbers to effect the capture of Barcelona without a very heavy loss of men, and that, in fact, he should be only wasting his strength upon an enterprise which, even if successful, might fail to have any conclusive influence on the fortunes of the war. Barcelona was defended on one side by the sea and on the other side by the fortifications of Montjuic. These fortifications were so strong that Peterborough did not see how it would be possible even to attempt their investment without a much larger force than he had at his disposal. The idea entertained by some of his allies that there would be a general rising of the Catalonian populations in favor of the invasion found no confirmation in the events which were passing under Peterborough's eyes. Only a few hundreds of the Catalonian peasantry, furnished with such poor weapons as they could bring to the service, had come to the aid of the Allies, and the task of providing them with mere food threatened to be a severe trial on Peterborough's resources. The usual councils of war the familiar arguments and delays interfered with Peterborough's plans. Burnet says that King Charles, as he somewhat prematurely describes him, spoke on one occasion for several hours in the exposition and enforcement of his views. At last, Peterborough became disgusted with the whole business and seems to have made up his mind that as he could not, under the conditions, attempt to carry out his own enterprise, it would be better to abandon the siege altogether and try some other plan. For this suggestion he was severely blamed by some of his comrades in arms, and it is curious to read by the light of subsequent history that there were those among them who did not hesitate to accuse him of what they believed to be a want of daring and of enterprise. While the Archduke Charles and the Prince of Hesse kept on still urging him to attempt the capture of Barcelona, they did not appear to have been able even to suggest any plan by means of which the venture might be safely attempted. Weeks were wasted in this futile discussion. With the instructions which were given to him, Peterborough did not see his way to carry out his own original project in defiance of some of his allies. He therefore conceived a new and daring project of his own, and by the sheer force of his military genius and energy, he carried it to success. He outdid the most venturesome of his allies in this sudden project, risked everything in an enterprise much more audacious than anything which they had contemplated, and carried out his purpose. 
he accomplished by storm what they had only proposed to execute by a regular siege. The citadel of Montjuic had practical command of Barcelona. It was for this reason splendidly fortified and was garrisoned by some of the best officers and men in the Spanish service. It stood upon one of the range of hills the most distant from the Allies, and it would have required for them a march of nearly ten miles if they did not mean to announce at once to the occupying garrison the real purpose of a forward movement on their part. For this very reason, the occupying forces believed themselves to be perfectly safe from any attempt at a sudden attack, and were therefore likely to be off their guard if an audacious scheme of the kind should be attempted. This very fact only gave a new impulse to the daring spirit of Peterborough, who at once realized the possibility of its existence, and found in it a new inspiration for the design he had just conceived. At the dead hour of the night he paid a visit to the Prince of Hesse and told him that he was resolved to make a decisive attempt upon the citadel. He gave the Prince of Hesse his choice to join in the attack or to remain behind, telling him at the same time that, happen what might, his mind was fully made up and that the prince must soon see whether British officers and men were quite the laggards and weaklings he had seemed inclined to believe them. Under these conditions there was nothing for the prince, who was a thoroughly brave man, but to take his chance in the enterprise, and without further altercation Peterborough was allowed to have his way. Peterborough had only 1,500 English soldiers to follow him into the assault, and about 1,000 more had been stationed as a reserve force under the command of Stanhope, the distinguished soldier and diplomatist of those days. Peterborough and his small band of followers made a circuitous march and came to a halt only under the walls of Montjuic. Then there came to pass exactly what Peterborough had counted on as the first result of his appearance under the walls and exactly what he hoped and expected to see. The defenders of the fortress, surprised by the audacious attempt, advanced into the outer ditch of defense to meet their assailants, and the English troops prepared by Peterborough for such a movement rushed upon their enemies, and after a desperate struggle, completely defeated and scattered the Spaniards and occupied this first line of defense. The Spanish troops in the garrison were so bewildered by the attack that Peterborough was able, almost with a single stroke, to become master of all the outworks. At this critical moment, an unexpected accident came in his way. News was suddenly brought to him that a large force was already on the march from Barcelona to the aid of the garrison at Montjuic. Peterborough at once left his place and rode out some distance in order to ascertain, if possible, whether there was any truth in the alarming report. During his short absence, something happened which might not unreasonably have been looked for under such critical conditions. A sort of panic seized upon Peterborough's troops. They became bewildered by the absence of their leader, they had heard the story of forces coming to the rescue of the garrison, and in their sudden confusion they were actually preparing to evacuate the outworks altogether and fall back on their reserves. Peterborough returned just in time, and like some hero of romance he retrieved by his own presence and daring the fortunes of that eventful night. He rallied in a moment the men who were abandoning their position he inspired them with new courage by his voice and his leadership, and he led them back to their former position before the enemy had time to take advantage of their confusion and their retreat. Some of us still living can well remember the occasion during the great civil war in the United States of America when the sudden return of General Sheridan rallied a dispersing army and led it back to the scene of battle and to a complete victory. The troops under Stanhope soon came to the rescue. The Spanish force, which had, too late, been marching out of Barcelona to the assault of the garrison, fell back, and almost in another moment the capture of Montjuic was completely accomplished. The Prince of Hesse was one of the first victims. 
he was killed by a shot during the assault. But the assault itself was a complete success, and with the capture of Montjuic, there was nothing left for Barcelona but to capitulate to the victorious English commander. Peterborough made good use of his victory. He was now occupying the capital of the province, and he at once issued a decree restoring and guaranteeing to the population of that province all the ancient rights and liberties of which they had once been in possession. He thus succeeded in obtaining their cordial support for the cause of which he was then the living and conquering representative. There had been many jealousies among some of the Spanish provinces, and the Catalonians felt in especial a strong resentment of the superior position given to the inhabitants of Castile, who were in fact the somewhat arrogant and overmastering race in Spain, proud of their ancient descent and of their historical position and dignities, and looking on themselves as the ruling people of the country. Thus Peterborough won for himself by one successful stroke the allegiance and support of all that region, and many of its towns threw open their gates and welcomed the sympathetic conqueror. The Spanish government sent an army of more than 7,000 men to recapture one of these towns. Peterborough, with a force not a fifth of that number, succeeded in frustrating this attempt and rendered it, in fact, a hopeless failure. Thereupon arose fresh difficulties with some of his companions. The Archduke Charles thought that enough had been done for fame, so far at least as the immediate enterprise was concerned, and strongly urged on the commander the prudence of returning to Barcelona and resting quietly there. Peterborough, however, was not content. He knew that there was immediate work still to do. Like Charles the Twelfth, as described by Johnson, he thought nothing done while aught remained to do. He overruled all the counsellors who talked to him of prudence. In the heart of winter, in the midst of a mountainous country, where there were hardly any roads worthy of the name, with a force poorly armed and poorly provided in every way, and with the army of the retreating enemy still much stronger in numbers than his own, he kept on his energetic movement, and in the February of 1706 he made his way into Valencia. This was not enough for him. He learned there that a large body of Spanish troops were marching to the assistance of the retreating army, he still pushed on, and before his foes could have supposed that he was close on their quarters, he attacked the whole encampment and killed, captured, or dispersed the new army which had been brought out against him. He returned to Valencia, bringing with him several hundred prisoners. Yet a little, and he was on his way to Madrid. Yet a little more, and the army of the invaders under Galway had made their entry into the Spanish capital, from which its royal occupant had fled in dismay. And there, in the capital city, the conquerors proclaimed the Archduke Charles as King of Spain. So splendid a success, accomplished by the indomitable energy and the military spirit of one man, has seldom been recorded in the history of war. Some words from Shakespeare might well be employed in description of Peterborough's success. He had wrestled well and overthrown more than his enemies. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of The Reign of Queen Anne, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Events and Parties at Home Addison, in his poem The Campaign, to which some reference has already been made, likens the destructive work and the crash of the Blenheim battlefield to the tumult of a storm, such as of late or pale Britannia past. Addison's allusion went home to the memory and heart of everyone in England just then. On November 26th, 1703, a tempest raged over a large part of Europe and especially over England, which was long remembered as one of the destroying prodigies of all time. 
For generations after, it was spoken of in England as the great storm, and was ranked as an event with the great fire and the great plague of London. No cause has ever been definitely assigned among the atmospheric, meteorological, or other conditions of the times for this terrible work of destruction, and indeed those who tell of its fury and who saw with their own eyes the damage it was doing did not trouble themselves much to make any careful inquiries into its origin, even if the scientific acquirements of the age had been qualified to lend much help toward the forming of a right conclusion. London, having then as now the largest population of any city in the civilized world, gave the most striking and most widespread evidences of the storm's destructive power. The river was swollen by inundations and Westminster Hall was flooded through by the overflowing Thames. Whole fleets of merchant ships were torn from their anchorage and dashed ashore, and Queen Anne's navy suffered severely from the influence of the tempest. The spires and towers of churches were torn away and flung down in shapeless masses of ruined masonry. The palace of St. James's underwent severe injury, and the chapel of King's College, Cambridge, was almost totally reduced to ruin. The Bishop of Bath and Wells was killed with his wife by the fall of a stack of chimneys. John Evelyn, the author of The Immortal Diary, saw and suffered by the tempest. Methinks I still hear, he says, sure I am that I still feel, the dismal groans of our forests, when that dreadful hurricane subverted so many thousands of goodly oaks, prostrating the trees, laying them in ghastly postures, like whole regiments fallen in battle by the sword of the conqueror, and crushing all that grew beneath them. Then he goes on to tell of what happened in the forest of Dean, in the new forest of Hampshire, and in many other parks and groves. Evelyn introduces this description into his book, Sylvia, or A Discourse of Forest Trees, and he pictures the work of the storm as its effects made themselves especially appropriate to that subject. The Eddystone Lighthouse was shattered to pieces, and those who occupied it at the time and had it in charge lost their lives with its fall. Vast numbers of cattle and sheep were destroyed, and it is believed that on land and sea more than 8,000 persons perished in and around this island. Britannia might well turn pale, in poetic metaphor at least, as Addison has described her when she had to look on such a storm. We have to turn for a while from the story of the war. The campaigns which were brought about by the question of the Spanish succession lasted so long that they occupied by far the greater part of the reign of Queen Anne. Moreover, the vicissitudes of the war affected so often and so directly the fortunes of political parties at home, and the strife of these political parties had so close and immediate a bearing on the movements of the war, that it is not possible for the historian to make a separate chapter of the struggle on the continental battlefields, and having followed it uninterruptedly to its conclusion, return to take up the thread of the domestic story, just as if the one set of events had been wholly disconnected from the other. One who wrote of English history during the reign of Queen Victoria might very well treat the account of the Crimean War or of the Indian Mutiny as a mere episode in his work, and when he had brought each chapter of history to its conclusion, go quietly back to the movement of occurrences at home with the conviction that his reader's comprehension of the whole narrative and the bearing of one set of events on the other would in no wise be disturbed by the interruption. But it is not possible to follow such a course in dealing with the reign of Queen Anne and the events which marked and made or marred its satisfactory progress. While Marlborough was leading the Allies in the Low Countries and Germany, while Peterborough was carrying on his adventurous enterprises in Spain, while disaster to the arms of the Allies was following victory and victory was once again retrieving disaster, 
events were going on at home which had an abiding influence on the fortunes of England as a state, and yet were so dependent on the fortunes of the war, and had so much influence over those fortunes, that we cannot contemplate what was happening abroad and at home as separate parts of history. The two great parties into which English public life was then divided, the Tories and the Whigs, were profoundly influenced from time to time by the conditions of the Continental Campaign, and it would not always have been possible for the observer at home to predict with any certainty the course which this or that party might take in striving to influence the fortunes of the war. The Tories were not in the beginning well disposed toward the whole policy of the war. They believed, first of all, in the divine right of kings. They had to recognize the force of circumstances which they could not hope to resist and to accept the situation, as the modern phrase goes, or at least to put up with it as long as they saw no reasonable chance of converting it into other than it was. They had been compelled to go so far as to take up with the principle of hereditary succession and to try to regard it as a sort of divine right. But deep in the hearts of many influential Tories was the hope that even yet some interposition of providence might restore the divine right to its old recognized place in the Constitution of England. Many of the Tories were strongly disinclined toward a war with France, if only for the reason that the representatives of the Stuart dynasty had still their home in that country and were receiving the protection and even the recognition of Versailles. These, however, found themselves totally unable to resist the popular demand for war when Louis the Fourteenth made the political mistake of recognizing the exiled Stuarts as the rightful royal family of England. The war policy had to be adopted by the Tory party, and the great soldier of the day who was leading the armies of England to victory on continental battlefields was himself known to be a Tory in convictions and at heart. The Tories, therefore, had to make the war their own and to proclaim their delight in every triumph which it accomplished. One of the events of the time was a growing struggle between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. The hereditary chamber and the representative chamber might still be regarded as, to a great extent, rival powers in the state. The representative principle, although long established at least in form as the basis of the House of Commons, was still very new in its practical operation, and the period had only just begun when it was a settled condition of the constitutional system that the sovereign could no longer raise armies and dispose of the national funds without the consent and cooperation of the representative chamber. A conflict of authority had been making itself manifest between the principles of the present and the principles of the past, and this conflict found a remarkable illustration in the political events of the reign about the time at which we have arrived in this narrative. A dispute, or indeed it might be called a quarrel, had been going on for some time between the two houses of the English Parliament which involved a constitutional question of the highest importance to the state. The dispute had begun in the last Parliament elected under William III and had continued in the first Parliament, elected under Anne, but there had been for a while nothing more than the murmurings and grumblings which usually prelude a great storm. The whole dispute arose out of the election of a member of the House of Commons to represent the town of Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. It seemed to be a very small and trivial subject of dispute in the beginning. It might even have been regarded as involving nothing more than a merely personal claim and a demand for civil damages by an obscure citizen. The sheriff of the county of Buckinghamshire had issued his writ for the election of two burgesses to represent Aylesbury in the House of Commons. When the time for the election came, a man named Matthew Ashby tendered his vote for two candidates and announced himself as a duly qualified voter. The official in charge declined to receive his vote, 
and Ashby straightway brought an action, which was tried at the next assizes, where he obtained a verdict with five pounds damages as compensation for the injury done to him by his exclusion from his right as a duly qualified voter. An appeal was made to the court of the Queen's Bench, and the decision of that tribunal was a reversal of the verdict given at the assizes. It was declared that the man was not properly qualified to vote at the election. This judgment was founded on a resolution passed by the House of Commons before the action was brought, to the effect that the right of election for the borough of Aylesbury belonged only to inhabitants not receiving parochial alms. The plaintiff, in making out his case, described himself as an inhabitant of that borough not receiving alms, and went on to say that the constables falsely and maliciously obstructed and hindered him from giving his vote at the election there. As the proceedings went on, the evidence made it clear enough that the plaintiff in the action was certainly in such a condition as to excuse the constables if they mistook him for a person who actually received public alms. His occupation was that of an ostler, and he had been for a long time steeped in a condition of such utter poverty that if not actually in the receipt of alms at the time when he tendered his vote, he unquestionably came to be a recipient of parochial charity almost immediately after. Here, then, had come up for the decision of the legal authorities what an eminent English judge of a later day sarcastically described as a delightful point of law. A very different issue, however, presented itself for settlement along with this delightful point of law. The case was carried out of the range of the ordinary law courts by a writ of error, and the judgment of the Queen's Bench was reversed by the House of Lords. The Lords, by their decision, affirmed that the constables at the Aylesbury election had no right to reject the vote of an inhabitant of the borough, otherwise duly qualified, who had not actually been in the receipt of public charity up to the time when he presented himself as a voter. This would seem to be a very reasonable decision on the part of the House of Lords, for if a man had not up to the time of tendering his vote been in the receipt of parochial alms, it could hardly be considered quite fair and reasonable that the constables should be allowed to act on a kind of prophetic inspiration and to declare that although the man had not been a pauper in the past, he was a sort of person very likely to become a pauper in the near future and therefore ought not to be regarded as a qualified voter. Under such conditions, the apothecary in Romeo and Juliet, if it were possible for him to be a resident of Aylesbury, must have been in perpetual disqualification as a voter because of the prima facie evidence that he must before long be a recipient of public charity. The decision of the House of Lords raised a great constitutional question during the discussion of which the personal solvency of the Aylesbury claimant soon passed out of public notice. That question was whether the House of Lords had any right to dictate the terms on which votes should be given for the election of members to the House of Commons. Of course, there were legal conditions under which alone a man could be entitled to vote for the election of a member to the representative chamber, and over these distinctly legal conditions, the House of Lords could not profess to exercise any power. But when some question arose as to the validity of a vote given for the election of a member to the House of Commons, was it for the House of Lords, the hereditary chamber, the parliamentary body which had nothing to do with the representative principle? Was it for that House to decide a question which only affected the rights of the House of Commons? Other points of dispute soon began to show themselves in this complicating controversy. Several inhabitants of Aylesbury followed the examples set them by Ashby and brought actions against the local constables on the ground that these had unjustly disallowed their right to tender a vote at the election. The bewildering prospect seemed to be 
that everybody in any part of the country who believed he had a right to vote and whose vote had been disallowed by the local authorities would straightway bring his action against these local authorities and that the whole machinery of the law would be kept in lively motion for a long time to come in the vain effort to dispose of all this indefinite multiplication of claims. Here again, the House of Commons showed itself concerned about the maintenance of its own privileges and rights. The House of Commons particularly wanted to know who had any right to interfere with the manner in which its elections were conducted. It was especially the interest of the stronger party in the House to make such a demand, for if every claimant whose vote was disallowed could forthwith bring his action against the local authorities, a new terror would be added to the electoral contest, and the candidate who had secured his triumphant majority would find a fresh campaign opening upon him the moment he had taken his seat in Parliament. The House of Commons then took the very decided step of committing for breach of privilege each of the luckless individuals who had brought actions against the constables for refusing to accept their votes. At the same time, the House issued an address to the throne, justifying the somewhat imperious course which it had taken against the men who brought these actions, on the ground that it is the undoubted right and privilege of the Commons of England in Parliament assembled to commit for breach of privilege, and that the commitments of this House are not examinable in any other court whatever. Then, as if to show how absolutely resolved they were to maintain what they considered to be their rights, the Commons actually ordered the committed claimants to be removed from Newgate and taken into the custody of the sergeant-at-arms. It appears that this order was for some reason or other put into execution at the mid-hour of night, thereby adding a stern gloom to the enforcement of the Commons' authority, which might be worthy of a Turkish pasha or what Disraeli once called the tyrant of a twopenny tragedy. The Commons, however, went a step still farther. They appointed a committee to discover what persons had been engaged in soliciting or advising or prosecuting upon the writs of habeas corpus or writs of error on the part of the persons committed for offending against the privileges of the representative chamber. The result of this inquiry was that three barristers at law and two attorneys at law were found to have given legal advice and assistance to the committed offenders, and the House directed the sergeant-at-arms to take into custody these professional gentlemen as aiders and abettors in the breach of privilege. The sergeant-at-arms actually arrested one of the three barristers and held him in custody, but he reported that he was not able to find any of the other legal advisers. It now became the turn of the peers to assert their rights and privileges. An order was issued by the Lords Spiritual and Temporal in Parliament, assembled, declaring that the legal gentlemen already mentioned shall, and they have hereby, the protection and privilege of this House, in the advising, applying for, and prosecuting the said writs of error, and that all keepers of prisons and jailers and all sergeants at arms and other persons whatsoever be, and they are hereby for or in respect of any of the cases aforesaid, strictly prohibited from arresting, imprisoning, or otherwise detaining or molesting or charging the said persons, or any or either of them, as they and every of them will answer the contrary to this house. Here was a very pretty quarrel indeed between the Lords and the Commons. A more distinct issue could hardly have been contrived by the perverse ingenuity of man, desirous to bring rival claims of authority into hostile and decisive action. The Commons proclaimed in substance to the Lords, We have a right to arrange all matters pertaining to our elections for ourselves, and if any one presumes to bring an action against one of our officials, we have a right to commit him to prison under the custody of our sergeant-at-arms. The House of Lords declared in reply, We are the highest court of law, as well as a court of Parliament, and we have a right to protect any person acting on the decree of a court of law which we have sanctioned from being taken into custody under your warrant, 
and by your sergeant at arms. Nor did the lords hesitate to show that they meant to be as good as their word in the assertion of their privileges. A few days after this warning had been given to the commons, the sergeant at arms presented himself at the bar of the representative chamber to inform its members that a person had that morning brought him a writ of habeas corpus under the great seal, calling on him to hand over one of the persons in his custody, in order that this person might be brought before the Lord Keeper of the Great Seal of England. The embarrassed sergeant-at-arms naturally desired to know which authority he was to recognize as supreme. He held in custody a certain person under an order of the House of Commons, and now, behold, he was summoned to surrender his captive in obedience to an order from the House of Lords. The Commons were not long in deciding as to his course of action. A resolution was promptly passed that the sergeant-at-arms attending this house do make no return of or yield any obedience to the said writ of habeas corpus and for such his refusal that he have the protection of the House of Commons. Readers now would probably think that an opinion expressed by Chief Justice Holt one of the most eminent and enlightened lawyers of his time, or of any time, fairly defined the limitations of the authority which the House of Commons claimed to exercise over the manner of their own elections. When the question was discussed before the Court of the Queen's Bench, the Lord Chief Justice differed on this point from the three other judges who sat with him. These three judges held that an election to the House of Commons was a matter solely for the jurisdiction of the House of Commons. Lord Chief Justice Holt declared that he saw a great difference between the election of a member to the House and the right to vote for a candidate at such an election. He admitted that the House of Commons alone had the right to judge whether an election had or had not been rightfully carried out, whether it was properly conducted without bribery, corruption, fraud, or violence, but he maintained that the right of voting in an election was quite a different matter and was, in fact, an original right founded on the man's legal qualification to vote. Such a qualification, he insisted, was made by Act of Parliament, and therefore every question relating to the claim of the voter was the proper subject for the decision of a court of law. The House of Commons still held to its former position and acted on the principle that the question had now come to be strictly a question as to the right of the House of Lords to override the authority of the House of Commons in the election of its own members. The House of Commons insisted that any dispute as to the validity of the vote accepted by the officers whom the Commons had appointed to receive votes was a question which directly affected the right of the commons to a full authority over the manner in which the elections to the representative chamber were to be conducted. The position of the commons was that if the House of Lords were to say, we have the right to declare invalid a vote which you, by your officers, have accepted as valid, that would be in effect to claim a right which is as fatal to the privileges of the elected chamber as if the Lords were to assert a power of control over the validity of the whole election, and this is a power which belongs to the Commons and to the Commons alone. The Lords sent a message expressing a desire to hold a conference with the other House in the Painted Chamber, in order that a good understanding might be arrived at between the two Houses, which the Lords declared they would always endeavour to preserve. When either House of Parliament, the message went on to say, shall have apprehended the proceedings of the other to be liable to exception. The ancient parliamentary method has been to ask a conference, it being ever supposed that when the matters are fairly laid open and debated, that which may have been amiss will be rectified, or else the house that made the objections will be satisfied that their complaint was well grounded." The terms of the message seemed to announce and to invite a policy of conciliation. But then the Lords distinctly maintained the judicial claims of their House as rights, which were in no wise affected by the existing dispute, and this was just the position which the House of Commons was not willing to recognize. The conference, therefore, did not seem likely to bring the two Houses to a better understanding. 
the commons declared that they could not but see how your lordships are contriving by all methods to bring the determination of liberty and property into the bottomless and insatiable gulf of your lordship's judicature which would swallow up both the prerogatives of the crown and the rights and liberties of the people furthermore the commons went on to declare that the bringing writs of habeas corpus upon the commitments of the commons and a writ of error thereupon before the lords would bring all the privileges of the commons to be determined by the judges and afterwards by the lords upon such writs of error such writs of error it was argued would bring the liberty of every commoner in england to the arbitrary disposition of the peers if a writ of error cannot be denied in any case and the lords alone are to judge whether the case be proper for a writ of error then all the queen's revenues all her prerogatives and all the lives and liberties of the people of england will be in the hands of the lords and by writs of error and appeals as already exercised they will have all our properties by such newly invented actions they will have all our elections and by such writs of habeas corpus and writs of error thereupon they will have all our privileges liberties and even lives at their determination finally the commons declared that the novelty of those things and the infinite consequences of them is the greatest argument in the law that they are not of right the conference came to nothing and as it did not seem probable that further consultation would lead to any better result the lords intimated that they had nothing more to say on the subject and the friendly negotiations were broken off the lords issued an address to the queen in which they set forth their own view of the whole case and wound up with a prayer that no importunity of the house of commons nor any other consideration whatsoever may prevail with your majesty to suffer a stop to be put to the known course of justice but that you will be pleased to give effectual orders for the immediate issuing of the writs of error the queen made a prompt reply it was concise as well as prompt it merely said my lords i should have granted the writs of error desired in this address but finding an absolute necessity of putting an immediate end to the session i am sensible there could have been no further proceeding in that matter the queen therefore left the controversy exactly as she found it acting no doubt under advice she availed herself of the supposed necessity for bringing the session to a close in order to get rid of the immediate dispute and leave it to settle itself by the course of events in the development of this or that competing power in the work of legislation those who represented the claims of the house of lords maintained of course that in the end there must be some law supreme over all the struggles of political parties as an abstract proposition this is no doubt reasonable and clear in point of fact the right which the house of commons exercised down to our own times in the hearing and decision of election petitions has for many years been transferred with the approval of all intelligent men to the legal tribunals of the country at a time well within the memory of living men the house of commons had the right of hearing and deciding upon all petitions brought against the election of a member to sit in the representative chamber the course which the house adopted was to refer each such petition for trial and decision to a committee of members elected by the house itself when the question raised by any such petition represented a conflict between the two great political parties it often happened that any one hearing the names of the committee who had been chosen by ballot read aloud in the house would have told at once which way the decision of the committee would go it came to be in too many cases purely a question of party and the grossest instances of bribery corruption or intimidation might be proved in vain if the majority of the committee happened to belong to that political party which would be likely to suffer if the prayer of the petition were granted it may be admitted without hesitation that there was a great deal to be said for the case which the house of lords endeavoured to set up in the early days of queen anne moreover the advocates of the house of lords argued at the time and with only too much substantial reason for their argument 
that the political party in power was in the habit of making its arrangements for elections to the House of Commons by appointing officials in each electoral district who would take good care not to disallow any votes which were given on the side of those who had appointed them, and to disallow as many as possible of those that were tendered on the opposite side. On the other hand, it was already becoming evident to every thinking observer that the House of Commons was destined to be the real governing power of the state. The sovereign was to rule according to the advice of the ministers of the crown, and even already it was coming to be more and more clearly understood that the only real authority which the House of Lords could claim was the right to act as a sort of check in the last resort upon the action of the representative chamber, and thus to obtain time for reconsideration of the particular question which a passing crisis might involve, and, if necessary, to compel a new appeal to the constituencies before that decision could be regarded as final. Even this power has been growing more limited in its actual operation, and its exercise has been gradually becoming a rarer event in constitutional history. Therefore, Although the House of Commons may have shown a disposition during the controversy which the Aylesbury election brought up to strain its constitutional right beyond its natural province, yet it will now readily be admitted by all that the whole question of popular election to the representative chamber was a singularly ill-chosen subject as an occasion for the House of Lords to bring to a test the extent of its constitutional power in the business of government. The advisers of Queen Anne could not help seeing that the occasion was peculiarly ill-suited for such a trial of strength, and the Queen no doubt was led to believe that the easiest way out of the difficulty was to bring the parliamentary session to a close and leave it to the growth of events and the lapse of time to develop a state of affairs which might ultimately settle the whole embarrassing controversy. Some such controversy has indeed been renewed again and again, even in our own times, but the obvious effect of years and of political change has unquestionably been to extend the governing powers of the commons and to restrict more and more the right of control which public opinion could allow to the House of Lords. Perhaps the whole controversy arising out of the Aylesbury election could not be more fairly summed up than by the judgment that while the House of Lords may have been technically in the right, the House of Commons was acting unconsciously, perhaps, in the true spirit of the Constitution, and that a decisive struggle between the two authorities could only lead to the triumph of that one which based its claims on the principle of popular representation. Perhaps this is the right time at which to tell the story of that new arrangement instituted by the Sovereign which called into existence the system known ever since by the name of Queen Anne's Bounty. The Queen Anne's Bounty was, in fact, the application of the first fruits and the tenths of benefices to the increase of the small livings which were held by so many clergymen of the Church of England. The existence of the fund, thus for the first time devoted to this purpose, carries us a long way back in history. When the religion of Rome prevailed throughout England, there was an arrangement that the whole income of a benefice during its first year, and a tithe or tenth part of it during each succeeding year, was claimed and made over to the Vatican as England's contribution toward the maintenance of the papal revenues. During the reign of Henry VIII, when the Protestant Church was established in England, the grant was withheld from the Church of Rome, but for a while without any definite application of it to any other purpose. After a time, this revenue was settled by Parliament as part of the regular income of the Crown, and this was declared to be a perpetual arrangement. The bishops were supposed to be the distributors of the fund, and it was distributed for the most part among persons who enjoyed the favor of the king or of the bishops, without any special reference to charitable purposes or even to the benefit of ill-paid clergymen. Bishop Burnet tells us that during the reign of Charles II, it went chiefly among his women and his natural children. Bishop Burnet goes on to say, 
when I wrote the history of the Reformation, I considered this matter so particularly that I saw here was a proper fund for providing better subsistence to the poor clergy, we having among us some hundreds of cures that have not of certain provision twenty pounds a year, and some thousands that have not fifty. The bishop justly observes, it is a crying scandal that at the restoration of King Charles the Second the bishops and other dignitaries, who raised much above a million in fines, yet did so little this way. Bishop Burnet, it will be seen, evidently regards himself as the author of the reform, which was carried out by Queen Anne. We are not inclined to dispute his claim to its authorship, which indeed he distinctly asserted at a time when some public contradiction must have been called forth by his statement, if there were any likelihood that his modest claim could have been effectively disputed. His own account is well worth quotation. I laid the matter before the late king, when there was a prospect of peace, as a proper expression both of his thankfulness to Almighty God and of his care of the church. I hoped that this might have gained the hearts of the clergy. It might at least have put a stop to a groundless clamor raised against him that he was an enemy of the clergy, which began to have a very ill effect on all his affairs. He entertained this so well that he ordered me to speak to his ministers about it. They all approved it. The Lord Somers and the Lord Halifax did it in a most particular manner. But the Earl of Sunderland obtained an assignation upon two dioceses for two thousand pounds a year for two lives, so that nothing was to be hoped for after that. I laid this matter very fully before the present Queen in the King's time, and had spoken often of it to the Lord Godolphin. In November 1703, the measure was introduced to the House of Commons with a special message from the Queen containing an expression of her strong desire that the bill should be passed into law. The preamble of this measure set forth that, whereas a sufficient settled provision for the clergy in many parts of this realm hath never yet been made, by reason whereof divers mean and stipendiary preachers are in many places entertained to serve the cures and officials there, who, depending for their necessary maintenance on the goodwill and liking of their hearers, have been and are hereby under temptation of too much complying and suiting their doctrines and teaching to the humors rather than the good of their hearers, which hath been a great occasion of faction and schism and contempt of the ministry. Then the preamble goes on to say that, Your Majesty, taking into your princely and serious consideration the mean and insufficient maintenance belonging to the clergy and diverse parts of this your kingdom, has been most graciously pleased out of your most religious and tender concern for the Church of England, whereof Your Majesty is the only supreme head on earth, and for the poor clergy thereof, not only to remit the arrears of your tenths due from your poor clergy, but also to declare unto your most dutiful and loyal commons your royal pleasure and pious desire that the whole revenue arising from the first fruits and tenths of the clergy might be settled for a perpetual augmentation of the maintenance of the said clergy in places where the same is not already sufficiently provided for an act of Parliament was passed accordingly, and the institution which we know as Queen Anne's bounty became a part of the system by which the state church is conducted. There were difficulties in the way of making a practical arrangement, which prevented the Queen's sincere and high-minded purpose from being carried into full effect during her own lifetime. Nobody can pretend to say that even at the present time the distribution of the church revenues is so reasonable and beneficently adjusted as to make fair provision for the maintenance of large numbers of the clergy, or that the distribution of the church revenues has approached within measurable distance of perfection. It still happens that in numberless instances throughout England, the hardest working, the most highly gifted, and the most thoroughly devoted clergymen of the state church find the poorest earthly reward for their services as pastors and as religious teachers. But it is beyond question 
that the principle of a great reform was established by the legislation of Queen Anne's reign, and that the Queen herself was deeply and sincerely interested in the settlement. We may give to Bishop Burnet the full credit for having originated the idea, but it must be owned that Queen Anne appreciated and welcomed his suggestions and took care that they should be carried as far as possible into effect. Perhaps the popular name given to the new arrangement and still retained in ordinary speech is in itself the most appropriate tribute which could be paid to the sovereign who saw it carried into law, and Queen Anne's bounty becomes a goodly epitaph. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of The Reign of Queen Anne, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Union with Scotland. One of the greatest events of Queen Anne's reign was the accomplishment of the union between England and Scotland. This event had been a long time in contemplation and under discussion. When the union of the two crowns was definitely accomplished, after the formal and, as it proved, the final abolition of the Stuart dynasty, the legislative union of the two countries being, as they were, geographically only one country, naturally came up for consideration as a necessary step towards the establishment of the imperial system. William the Third had taken the project in hand and given it his full approval and recommendation. One of the last acts of King William was to commend the Legislative Union in a message to the House of Commons. It was on February 23rd, in that year of 1702, which was destined so soon to see the close of his great career, and at a moment when the shadow of death was already on him, that he urged upon the House of Commons the imperative necessity of a complete union between the northern and southern divisions of the island. In this message, William declared his full conviction that nothing can more contribute to the present and future security and happiness of England and Scotland than a firm and entire union between them. William went on to say that he would esteem it a peculiar felicity if during his reign some happy expedient for making both kingdoms one might take place. The king's speech added some words of peculiar and melancholy significance. The king expressed his regret that he was hindered by an unhappy accident from coming in person to his Parliament, and so could only testify to the Commons by message what he desired to have spoken to both houses from the throne. This was his last message to Parliament. The unhappy accident to which he made allusion was that fall from his horse which has been described in an earlier chapter, and the message to the Commons was issued only a few days before his death. During the earlier part of Queen Anne's reign, new difficulties arose in the way of that union which once appeared to commend itself to the cordial approval of both populations, and for some time the consummation of William's desire seemed to be only farther and farther removed from accomplishment. The difficulties were not merely or indeed mainly connected with questions of legislation or with the political tendencies of each country. The very progress of England and Scotland, alike in trade, commerce, and navigation, led to new and increasing antagonisms between the trading and commercial classes of the two communities. Scotland had been rapidly establishing a commerce and trade of her own, and much fear was felt among the Scotch that a legislative union would only tend to give England a supremacy and a monopoly of trading advantages which might be fatal 
to the rising activity and prosperity of the northern country. These difficulties had been already felt in the reign of King William and for some time before, but it so happened that events seemed to make them more serious and formidable during the early part of Queen Anne's reign. This was a time when the spirit of modern progress was infusing itself with an increasingly marked influence into the commercial undertakings of the two countries. Men were beginning to discover that great fortunes were to be made by sudden strokes of enterprise which had nothing to do with the steady and peaceful ways of trade or with the mere extension of recognized empire. There were glittering bubbles of speculation which allured the minds of the bold and imaginative with the prospect of great fortunes made in a moment by some happy stroke of venturesome enterprise. The Bank of England had been created, land banks had come to be formed, there were schemes of great plantations in colonies, there were companies organized with large capital for pearl fisheries, for fisheries in Greenland and Newfoundland. Joint stock companies were created for all manner of commercial ventures at home and abroad, and that modern system of commercial enterprise which has its center in the Stock Exchange of London, then an entirely new creation, was making itself a conspicuous and powerful factor in the business life of the two countries. Scotland at the time was much more active than England in these trading enterprises, and the check maintained by the mere slowness of action which almost necessarily characterized the doings of the two houses of Parliament in the southern part of the island was not known to the constitutional practices of the northern kingdom. The English and Scotch trading companies regarded themselves as rivals. The one set of capitalists and speculators was jealous of the legislative privileges accorded to the other. Scotchmen were afraid that their spirit of adventure would be controlled and kept inactive by the protection, the special and exclusive protection, which the English system accorded to the joint stock companies of England. Englishmen, on the other hand, were jealous of the more energetic and far-reaching enterprises of their Scotch rivals, and the idea widely prevailed that Scotland was unduly favoured to the restriction and disadvantage of England. The same kind of feeling began to exist between England and Scotland, which already existed in both countries, with regard to such a foreign state as Holland, for example, and the question was even raised whether the rivalries of trade between the two parts of the island might not sooner or later lead to actual war between England and Scotland. At that time the idea of a system of genuine and general free trade had not come up as an accepted influence in European affairs, and men only saw in the successful undertakings of one part of the country an exclusion and hindrance to the trading efforts of the other. Many authorized conferences were held between English and Scotch commissioners for the purpose of arranging some system of common legislation which might make a constitutional union possible without undue restriction to the trading projects of either community. Time after time these consultations came to nothing or were abruptly broken off by what seemed to be the impossibility of any satisfactory arrangement. It so happened, however, that one of the most adventurous and, in the end, disastrous speculations in that day of speculations had a direct and unexpected influence in promoting the legislative union between England and Scotland. This was the famous Darien Company, an enterprise which might be regarded in some sense as a precursor of John Law's famous Mississippi scheme, the South Sea Bubble of a later day. The Estates of Scotland passed an act a few years before Queen Anne's accession, which was described as an act for company trading to Africa and the Indies, 
and aroused but little attention at the time of its passage. The schemes which were afterwards developed by this company were the outcome mainly of the enterprising spirit of William Patterson. Patterson was a man of unquestionable ability as a financier. He was a Scotsman by birth, but had settled in London at an early period of his life and made himself conspicuous there. He will always be remembered in history as the founder of the Bank of England, although some of his later projects brought him to be classed with John Law, the promoter of the South Sea Bubble. He had passed some years of his early life in the West Indies, and his name was well known in the financial circles of Hamburg, Amsterdam, and Berlin. He amassed a large fortune by his commercial dealings in London. He was one of the first directors of the Bank of England, which he may fairly be said to have created. He was unquestionably a man of much foresight and sound judgment in finance, despite the one great failure which he brought upon himself and upon others, and he had clearly defined ideas of free trade long before the genuine principle of free trade came to be recognized as a principle of statesmanship. Patterson was the guiding spirit of the new undertaking, and by his direction it took the form of a great colonization scheme. He laid his plans fully before the leading financiers of Edinburgh and Scotland generally, but under his guidance the company was to begin its operations in London. The directors of the company were to found a new colony in some suitable land of rich soil accessible to all the world, and this new colony was to invite all the communities of the earth to an equality of trade in buying and selling import and export. The colony was to work the land they possessed to the fullest extent in the production of everything which the soil was especially qualified to bring forth, and were thus, in fact, to call into being a new world of productions especially commending themselves to the wants of the exhausted old world. The ports of the new colony were to be unrestricted by any of the special arrangements which were unwisely believed to protect the ports of civilized nations in those days, when it was thought to be for the benefit of a community that only privileged and friendly traders should be allowed to enter its harbors. Patterson fixed upon the region of Darien in the Isthmus of Panama as the home of his new colony. The Isthmus of Panama, which it need hardly be said is the connecting link between North and South America, has had more than once since the days of Patterson the disadvantage of being associated with a doubtful or disastrous game of speculation. The new colony advertised itself and its objects with splendid audacity. It offered itself as buyer and seller to the whole trading world. It said, in so many words, we, the Scottish owners of this new colony, have got goods of priceless value to sell, which can only be produced from a soil like ours, by such skill as we are able to bring to the work, and by the liberal use of that capital which we possess, and of which we know how to dispose in the best manner for the due development of such productions. That was the spirit of its invitation to the buyers, but then on the other hand it also issued its invitation to the sellers. It invited all the peoples who had anything rich and rare for sale to come to the new colony, where they were assured that they would find eager purchasers of everything worth buying and with plenty of capital to meet all demands. In our modern days, when even the most restrictive duties on import and export trade are but light compared with those which had to be endured by former generations of traders, it may not seem easy to realize the temptation which Patterson's new scheme offered to the speculators of his time but it is certain that the idea of forming a new colony which was free to trade with all the world, and with which all the world was free to trade, had a strong fascination even for shrewd and practical men 
in the days when Patterson started his project. Great wars had been going on in Europe, and it has always been found that great wars foster the spirit of speculation. The New World was beginning to be regarded as a region of unlimited and indefinite promise to men possessed of courage enough to risk much in the hope of making a fortune. Patterson himself had courage enough to throw in his own lot with the fortunes of his colony. He went out to Darien and did his best to make the project successful. Now the project was in the meantime regarded with great jealousy by many English trading companies. Perhaps the very jealousy with which it was regarded was only a new tribute to its pretensions and a new argument furnished to its promoters with which to make good the reasonableness of their advertisements. The great English companies, they might have said, were jealous of this Scottish company because it is developing a magnificent idea and is certain to make the fortunes of all who are wise enough and lucky enough to have shares in it. The English companies were full of complaint because of the fact that the estates of Scotland had thus been allowed by their own authority to confer such privileges upon a merely Scottish company, and on the other hand, patriotic Scotsmen asked, what would be likely to become of Scottish enterprises if there were a legislative union with a people who would want to secure every great financial enterprise for themselves and to shut out their Scottish rivals from their fair share of commercial and trading profits? For a time, therefore, the floating of the Darien Company seemed only to raise new difficulties in the way of that legislative union which King William had recommended and so many enlightened public men on both sides of the border sincerely desired. At one time, the feeling ran so high that the English subscribers to the company, by a sort of common consent, refused to pay up the installments on their shares. The shares were consequently forfeited, and the Scottish owners, who were now left to run all the risks and enjoy all the profits of the undertaking, were allowed to pursue the venture for themselves. The company, however, did not prosper. The hopes which its projectors had of securing a great trading monopoly for themselves were destined to a speedy blight. The first trouble came from the fact that Spain, even in her decaying days, still asserted an absolute claim over undefined and illimitable territory in the New World. The region of Panama, on which the new colony was settled, might up to that time have been absolutely regarded as no man's land, but it stood in the close neighborhood of recognized Spanish possessions, and it soon became apparent that Spain would assert her claims, whether well-founded or ill-founded, and that the colonists would have to fight for their holding or give it up. A Spanish fleet appeared off the coast, and a Spanish army was on the march to attack Darien. The colonists made one gallant attempt to maintain their territory. A small but most resolute force, suddenly summoned to arms by the authorities of the new colony, crossed the isthmus, encountered the Spanish troops, who were utterly unprepared for any such attack, and never supposed that an attempt of the kind would be made. The audacious assailants completely dispersed the soldiers of the Spanish monarchy. There was wild exultation in the new colony. A medal was struck in commemoration of the victory, and when the news reached Edinburgh, in due course it was celebrated by a somewhat tumultuous demonstration which much alarmed the more peaceful and less enterprising citizens. In the meantime, it should be said that the representatives of King William III at foreign courts took good care to display no sympathy whatever with the doings of the Darian colonists, and indeed did their very best to make it known that these enterprising colonists were regarded in England as men in opposition to the policy of the king 
and as no better than adventurers, freebooters, and pirates. All this was not very likely to invite the world in general to any enthusiastic rivalry of trading with the new colony. Even the victory obtained over the Spanish force, however glorious a performance for the victors, did not seem just the kind of event to encourage peaceful trading and to mark out the spot on which it took place as the most favorable scene for the quiet making of enormous fortunes. The new colonists, it was plain, would have to maintain their title by force of arms for some time to come, and the immediate question in the minds of outside observers was whether the Darien Company would have to encounter a war with Spain or a war with England. The colony itself was suffering from disease and something like starvation. The climate of Darien was utterly unsuited to many or most of the Scotch colonists who were trying to settle there, and the whole foundation of the scheme was laid on the assumption that the colonists would be free to do a roaring trade in a region especially adapted by kindly nature for such a purpose. The project soon came to complete disaster. The colonists had to surrender the territory on which they had settled to the peremptory demand of Spain in March 1700. Patterson and some others had escaped before the final disaster, and Patterson continued to be an energetic promoter of financial schemes for many years after, but the Darien enterprise had come to an end, and its fate served, as we have already said, to form an effective argument in favor of the legislative union between England and Scotland. It was evident that the energy of the Scottish trading spirit and the trade competition between England and Scotland could not long go on without bringing the two countries into frequent and dangerous dispute, unless a common parliament were invested with equal dominion over both communities. The views of Bishop Burnet on this subject may be studied with much interest, if only because they are those of a contemporary observer who must have had ample opportunity for conversing with most of the leading men in England having to do with the working of the Union project. I cannot, upon such a signal occasion, the bishop observes with his usual gravity, restrain myself from making some reflections on the directions of providence in this matter. It is certain the design on Darien, the great charge it put the nation to, in the total miscarriage of that project, made the trading part of that kingdom see the impossibility of undertaking any great design in trade, and that made them the more readily concur in carrying on the Union. The wiser men of that nation had observed long that Scotland lay at the mercy of the ministry, and that every new set of ministers made use of their power to enrich themselves and their creatures at the cost of the public, that the judges being made by them were in such a dependence that since there are no juries allowed in Scotland in civil matters, the whole property of the kingdom was in their hands, and by their means in the hands of the ministers, they had also observed how ineffectual it had been to complain of them at court. It put those who ventured on it to a vast charge, to no other purpose but to expose them the more to the fury of the ministry. The poor noblemen and the poor boroughs made a great majority in their parliament and were easily to be purchased by the court. So they saw no hopes of a remedy to such a mischief but by incorporating union with England. These thoughts were much quickened by the prospect of recovering what they had lost in that ill-concerted undertaking of Darien, and this was so universal and so operative that the design on Darien, which the Jacobites had set on foot and prosecuted with so much fury and with bad intentions, did now engage many to promote the Union, who without that consideration would have been at least neutral if not backward in it. Patterson himself became, after his return home, 
one of the most earnest advocates of the projected union, and was indeed one of the first Scottish members elected when the time came to the United Parliament. Such were the conditions under which William III sent his last message to his House of Commons, the message recommending the legislative union between England and Scotland. When Queen Anne came to the throne, she was advised to appoint under her sign manual a royal commission on the part of England to treat with commissioners from the Scottish estates on the subject of the proposed union between the two divisions of her kingdom. Once again, the difficulty created by the supposed rivalry of trading interests threatened to obstruct any satisfactory settlement. The Scottish Commission was appointed, and the commissioners put forward, as what may be called a basis of negotiations, their national claim for such an union as entitles the subjects of both kingdoms to a mutual communication of trade privileges and advantages. The English commissioners accepted the basis of negotiation, but they qualified their acceptance by a very important condition. Their declaration set forth that while the English commissioners recognized the communication of trade and other privileges to be the necessary result of a complete legislative union, yet in the method of proceeding they must first settle with your lordships the terms and conditions of this communication of trade and other privileges. In effect, by these words, the English commissioners stated that they would cheerfully accept the principle laid down by the Scottish commissioners, provided only it made clear to them that the definition of that principle in the minds of the Scottish commissioners was precisely identical with its definition in the minds of the English commissioners. We are quite in agreement, so far as words go, but had we not better find out clearly whether we attach exactly the same meaning to the words before we commit our agreement to the articles of a treaty? Such was in substance the meaning of the English commissioner's reservation. This course of procedure naturally brought the discussion to a point, and the Scottish commissioners found it necessary to put their meaning into words which admitted of no misunderstanding. They set forth four conditions. The first was that there be a free trade between the two kingdoms without any imposition or distinction. The second, that both kingdoms be under the same regulations and liable to equal impositions for exportation and importation, and that a book of rates be adjusted for both. The third article required that the subjects of both kingdoms and their seamen and shipping have equal freedom of trade and commerce to and from the plantations and be under the same regulation. The fourth clause addressed itself even more directly and positively to some questions of recent dispute. Its stipulation was that the acts of navigation and all other acts in either kingdom, in so far as contrary to or inconsistent with any of the above-mentioned proposals, be rescinded. The English commissioners spent a week in considering these clearly defined conditions and then proceeded to set forth their own ideas of free trade in relation to the first article. They declared it as their opinion that there be a free trade between the two kingdoms for the native commodities of the growth, product, and manufactures of the respective countries, with an exception to wool, sheep, and sheep fells, and without any distinction or imposition other than equal duties upon the home consumption. The meaning of this opinion cannot probably be more clearly deduced than as we find it in the comment of John Hill Burton, the Scottish historian, who says that it implied an exclusion on importation of foreign merchandise into England in Scots vessels, restricted the importation of Scots produce to the market for home consumption, and made important exceptions to the articles of home produce that might be imported. Then the English commissioners took up the third article, and on this they declared 
that the plantations are the property of Englishmen, and that this trade is of so great a consequence and so beneficial as not to be communicated, as is proposed, till all other particulars which shall be thought necessary to this union be adjusted. It may perhaps be as well to explain that the commissioners use the word communicated in the sense of making common to both countries. Furthermore, the English commissioners declared that with the exception of some rather unimportant commodities, as the case now stands by law, no European goods can be carried to the English plantations but what have been first landed in England. And they added that the produce of the plantations cannot be carried to other parts of Europe till it has been first landed in England. After some further delay and discussion, the commissioners, English and Scotch, held a full and, as it turned out, a very friendly conference on the trade questions, and an agreement was come to by the court that there be a free trade between all the subjects of the island of Great Britain without any distinction in the same manner as is now practiced from one part of England to another, and that the masters, mariners, and goods be under the same securities and penalties in the coasting trade, and furthermore, that both kingdoms be under the same regulations and prohibitions and liable to equal impositions for exportation and importation, and that a book of rates be adjusted for both, and that the subjects of both kingdoms and their seamen and shipping have equal freedom of trade and commerce to and from the plantations, under such and the same regulations and restrictions as are and will be necessary for preserving the said trade to Great Britain. We need not follow out the further progress of these conferences through all their details. The events of the time were unquestionably leading or forcing both sides on to an agreement. The outbreak of war on the continent and the part which England had to take in it made it clear to all minds capable of calm and judicious observation that a legislative union of both parts of the kingdom would be the only possible security against the uprising of events which might force the North and South into actual war. There was nothing like a real and general opposition, so far as England was concerned, to such a settlement of the question. Queen Anne herself was very anxious that nothing should be done which might affect in any way the supremacy of the English church at home, and she appeared during one part of the discussion to be afraid that something of the kind might be the result of an immediate compromise. But it was hardly within the range of probability that any danger of that sort could be seriously threatened, and the general feeling of England was undoubtedly in favor of an amicable and final arrangement. In Scotland there was for a time much opposition to the proposed union. There was a strong feeling that a legislative union would lead to the dethronement of Edinburgh as a capital, and that the representatives of Scotland would lose their importance and their power when once Westminster had become the legislative center for the two kingdoms. Then, of course, there existed in Scotland the not unnatural or even unreasonable dread that the result of an act of union might imperil the independent constitution of the Scotch Church. In order to meet this difficulty, a distinct and definite understanding had to be arrived at that the legislative union should make no change in the condition of either church. This was an agreement of absolutely vital importance, for it made quite certain that under no conditions would the majority of the Scottish people consent to any union which might affect the independence and the constitution of the Church of Scotland? To this end, the English Parliament and the Estates of Scotland passed definite acts declaring that each state should be free to maintain its own church in its existing form and conditions. In other words, it made clear by preliminary enactments that while there was to be only one crown, one parliament, and one kingdom, there were to be two absolutely independent churches. There were agreements also fixing the proportion of taxation to which Scotland, according to her means, 
should be held liable, and ordering that the proportion of Scottish representatives in the English Parliament should be fixed on reasonable terms. These terms were rather favourable than otherwise to the Scottish people, for it was felt that the growing population and the growing activity of trade and commerce in Scotland could not be adequately represented if the number of Scottish representatives in the Parliament of Westminster were to be estimated by a merely arithmetical proportion to the existing conditions. Another question of great importance which had to be settled as essential to any act of union had to do with the laws and administration of justice in Scotland. The Scottish system of law differed in many momentous characteristics from the system existing in England. This question was settled as it could only be settled by an agreement that the Scottish system should remain as it was, absolutely independent of that which existed in England. The law of Scotland, with regard to marriage and the legitimacy of children, differed materially from that of England, and it was felt to be out of the question that Scotland should be induced to submit to any serious change in the long-established principles taken from the old Roman law which regulated her institutions. When this agreement had been arrived at, there was little trouble in coming to an understanding upon other subjects. It had to be settled, for instance, what the national flag of the new and united kingdoms should be, and the final agreement was that the crosses of St. George and St. Andrew should be borne by the national banner for the future, the ensign, which we now know as the Union Jack, was the historical creation of this agreement. Queen Anne delivered an address to both houses of the English Parliament. The royal address declared that, You have now an opportunity before you of putting the last hand to a happy union of the two kingdoms, which, I hope, will be a lasting blessing to the whole island, a great addition to its wealth and power, and a firm security to the Protestant religion. The advantages which will accrue to us all from an union are so apparent that I will add no more, but that I shall look upon it as a particular happiness if this great work, which has been so often attempted without success, can be brought to perfection in my reign. After some discussion in both houses, and after several divisions had been taken in the House of Lords, which only served to show that there was a strong majority in favor of the measure, the act was passed, and on March 6, 1707, the Queen came to the House of Lords and delivered her royal assent to the Union of England and Scotland. In an interesting and well-prepared volume by Edward E. Morris, which forms one of the series called Epochs of Modern History and describes The Age of Anne, the author calls attention to the fact that the conditions under which the union between England and Scotland was affected differed essentially from those under which, at the opening of the next century, the Act of Union between England and Ireland was passed into law. He shows the injustice in the Irish Act of Union, which consisted in the fact that the dominant church in Ireland was not the church of the people, a very large majority of which were Roman Catholics. He points out as a fact that requires notice that whilst the Scotch do not desire a repeal, the Irish as a nation do. This is indeed a fact of which history has been compelled since the passing of the Irish Act to take account more and more seriously with each succeeding year. In Scotland, the religion of the people was protected by special enactment, whereas in Ireland, the church of a small minority was made, by law, a dominant establishment. More than a quarter of a century had to pass after the Irish Act of Union before the first Roman Catholic representative of Ireland was allowed by legislation to take a seat in the House of Commons. Even then, that tardy measure of religious equality was only accepted by the Parliament at Westminster, 
because Sir Robert Peel, a genuine statesman, had become convinced that unless it was passed he must have to encounter a civil war, and the great Duke of Wellington emphatically declared that he would not accept the responsibility of further resistance to the national demand of Ireland. There was, therefore, no gratitude felt or professed by the Irish people for the concession of Catholic emancipation, on the plain ground that the concession had been made not to the demands of justice or generosity, but as an alternative which the ruling English statesmen preferred to the certainty of civil war. For more than another generation after the passing of the Act of Catholic Emancipation, the Protestant State Church was still maintained as an establishment in a country where at least five out of six of the inhabitants were Roman Catholics by religion. Mr. Gladstone completed the work of religious equality which Sir Robert Peel had begun. It will be seen that without any reference to other national sentiments or national claims, the act of union between Great Britain and Ireland differed in one of its essential conditions from the act of union between England and Scotland. No surprise can be felt by any reasonable man that on this ground alone the union was utterly unwelcome to Ireland, while it was cordially accepted by Scotland. It is certain that the union between England and Scotland was welcome and accepted by the one part of the island as well as by the other, and has proved thus far a complete success. Even if the growth of new conditions and the development of that principle of local government, which is becoming more and more recognized as the essential part of every system of federation, including different nationalities in one state system, should lead to some further modification of the terms under which England and Scotland are to remain in imperial union, that fact would not in the least degree affect the judgment of history on the working of the measure passed in the reign of Queen Anne. The act of union between England and Scotland must always be regarded as one of the greatest and most successful events which mark with honor the momentous history of that reign. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of The Reign of Queen Anne, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Trivial Round, The Common Task. While the armies of Queen Anne are engaged on the battlefields of the Low Countries of Germany and of Spain, and the controversies of religious denominations and political parties are going on at home, it may be a convenient time for us to endeavor to form some idea as to the manner in which the trivial round and the common task of life went on in England for the ordinary citizen. So far as regards the methods and the rate of passenger traffic in these countries, life was going on in the days of Queen Anne, very much as it had gone on in the days of Elizabeth, or in those of King John, or indeed, for that matter, in the days of Julius Caesar. What sails and horses could do for travellers was done, and there was nothing more just then to be done. But our ancestors who lived under Queen Anne were already beginning to enjoy the advantages of a regular system of postal communication. Of course, there could be no quicker means of transmission at that time than during any former age, since anything like civilization had set in. When Marlborough could put such a pressure on himself as to overcome his inherent dislike of formal letter-writing and pen a dispatch from the battlefield for the instruction of the government at home, his dispatch traveled at just the same rate of speed and by much the same methods of conveyance as one of Julius Caesar's dispatches might have gone from Gaul or from Britain to Rome. 
but in Queen Anne's days there was at least a regulated system for such communication all over the kingdom, over the greater part of the European continent, and even across the ocean to some of England's distant colonies. A citizen of London was then well aware that on certain days of the week he could send a letter to this or that part of the continent, or farther off still, with a reasonable hope of its reaching its address. In our modern days, we are apt to regard the penny post as an institution deriving its existence from the inventiveness and the practical methods of Rowland Hill. But while we do unquestionably owe what may be called the national penny post, that is, the penny post circulating through all parts of the kingdom to Rowland Hill's reform, it is certain that there was a penny post existing in the days of Queen Anne, although the range of its operations was practically limited to the metropolitan district. There was, in fact, a postal delivery every two hours to or from any part of the city or suburbs of London at the cost of one penny for each letter. This post was started somewhere about the opening of Charles II's reign. It was, in the first instance, only a private institution, or more properly, a private speculation, and after a while it was annexed by the government and incorporated with the ordinary postal system. In Mr. John Ashton's interesting and instructive work, Social Life in the Reign of Queen Anne, we can read a full and explicit account of the keen and personal disputations which took place as to the actual authorship of the penny postal system. We need not, however, enter into any discussion here with regard to the identity of the original inventor. There are few inventions known to modern civilization which have not been closely accompanied by some controversy as to the rival claims of authorship. It is enough for our purpose to know that the penny post, within its prescribed limits, was an institution in full existence and recognition at the opening of Queen Anne's reign. When a letter had to travel beyond the metropolitan limits, the charge was tuppence a sheet for 80 miles, all letters traveling more than that distance having to pay threepence for a single sheet and sixpence for a double letter or twelve pence if the ponderous missive was swelled to greater dimensions. A single letter went to Dublin for sixpence, a double letter for one shilling, and one and sixpence an ounce was charged for any communication of greater bulk or weight. The cost of foreign postage might be regarded as comparatively cheap. A single letter could be sent to the West Indies for one and threepence, and a double letter for two and sixpence, but letters coming from the West Indies to England had to pay one and sixpence or three shillings each, or of bulky enough to be rated according to mere weight, six shillings for each ounce. There were separate days assigned for the sending of letters to foreign countries and, indeed, to any places outside the metropolitan range. On Monday, letters went out to Spain, Italy, Germany, Flanders, and some of the North Countries, and also to some parts of England. Tuesday was devoted to Germany, Holland, Sweden, Denmark, and also to North Britain, Ireland, and Wales. Wednesday occupied itself exclusively with the postal service of Kent and the Downs. Thursday sent out letters to Spain, Italy, and all parts of North Britain and England. Friday's missives ranged over Italy, Germany, Flanders, Holland, Sweden, Denmark, and also the much-favored Kent and the Downs. Saturday gave itself up to the service merely of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Now, if we consider for even a moment, we shall see that the Londoner of those days or the resident of any part of Great Britain and Ireland must have found his work of letter-writing embarrassed and bewildered by a variety of considerations and calculations wholly unknown to our happier days. 
leaving out of the question altogether the cost of mere postage and the heavy tax thus imposed on those who were anxious to communicate with their friends abroad, we shall find that the effort to keep in recollection the particular days when the latest news from home could be conveyed to friends abroad must have brought a serious and continuous perplexity into the perturbed mind of the faithful correspondent. Now, when we write a letter and address it to its destination, we have nothing to do but simply to drop it into the post, and we know that as a matter of course it will be carried on its way by the next and for the time the only channel of transport. But in the days of Queen Anne, the dweller in England who was anxious to send news of himself to a friend in Spain or Italy, and who missed his Monday post, had the discomfort of knowing that his letter could not begin to go on its way before the following Thursday. Many a man who was, like most of us, not particularly tenacious in his memory of dates, must have dispatched his letter just too late for Spain and Italy, and might have found something of peculiar interest to write about during the two or three following days, if he had remembered in time that Monday and Thursday were the only parts of the week directly applicable to his purpose. In point of fact, the nearest parts of the European continent, and for that matter a large portion of the British counties as well, were under the same conditions with regard to postage as those which now apply to America and Australasia and other regions beyond the ocean. Most of us, even in these present days of almost incessant postal transit everywhere, must have been sometimes a little perplexed by the trouble of remembering the precise days when the latest post can be secured for America or for Australia. If we just bring our minds to a comprehension of the mental trouble which must have been created when the same consideration had to come up with regard to Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and even to many parts of England itself, we shall begin to understand that the work of correspondence with one's friends was a troublesome business in those days for even the easiest letter-writer. Enterprise, however, was not wanting in the steady-going years of Queen Anne's postal system. We read that one adventurous personage set up in London a postal institution all of his own device, a system by which letters were to be conveyed through all parts of the London district by messengers on foot at the reduced charge of one halfpenny for the single sheet. The post office authorities were not disposed to put up with audacious rivalry, and they took steps to restrain this reckless innovator from his interference with their monopoly. The authorities, in fact, went so far as to issue through the columns of the Gazette, then as now the official organ of the government, a solemn proclamation against these amateur rivals of the regular postal system. The proclamation set forth that, whereas Charles Povey and divers traders and shopkeepers in and about the cities of London and Westminster, borough of Southwark and parts adjacent, and several persons ringing bells about the streets of the said cities and borough have set up, employed, and for some time continued a footpost for collecting and delivering letters within the said cities and borough and parts adjoining for hire under the name of the halfpenny carriage, contrary to the known laws of the kingdom and to the great prejudice of Her Majesty's revenues arising by posts. The Postmaster General directed informations to be laid against these offenders for the recovery of one hundred pounds from each one of them for such an act, the fine to be renewed for every week's continuance of these doings, and also five pounds for every offence in the collecting and delivering of letters for hire under such conditions. The halfpenny post struggled on for a little against the resolute intervention of the postmaster general, but competition was not likely to be profitable under these difficulties, and the public had soon to confine itself to the authorized plans and charges for the delivery of its correspondence. The cost of communication through the medium of the government post office naturally induced a considerable proportion of the letter-writing class to hunt up their influential and privileged friends in order to obtain the benefit of the franking system, 
the system which allowed members of either house of parliament and others in office or authority to secure a free passage through the post for any letters which they might honour by their signature on the outside the practice of franking did not then it is only fair to say make anything like the exorbitant demands on the postal revenue which became a peculiarity of later days and went on increasing steadily until the early years of queen victoria's reign the fact is that the habit of letter writing had not become even for business men anything like so engrossing a part of each day's work as it grew to be in times more near to our own during queen anne's reign letter writing for the great bulk of the population entered but little into the ordinary occupations and enjoyments of existence public men officials and persons largely engaged in commerce or business of any kind were necessarily in the habit of writing letters every day but in ordinary life the penning and dispatching of a letter was quite an event and the majority of the population hardly ever went to the trouble of writing letters at all indeed it may be very safely affirmed that the majority of the population did not write letters for the very good reason that they did not know how to write england was yet a long way from the busy times and the educational zeal which set up the system of board schools in the matter of popular education the england of queen anne was far behind the scotland of the same reign and still farther behind the greater number of the German states. The London Exchange was already the centre of the country's financial business, and was the centre for the financial business of many other countries as well. Dutch, German, and Italian traders and traffickers were conspicuous figures at this great marketplace of speculation. The business of speculation itself was beginning in Queen Anne's time to be a trade and traffic all of its own. A statue of Charles II ornamented the centre of the exchange, although the real life of that quarter, as we now understand it, had not begun its movement in the days of the Merry Monarch. A contemporary writer quoted by Mr. Ashton describes it as a vast heap of stones, and he goes on to tell us that the noise in it is like that of bees, a strange humming or buzzing of walking tongues and feet. It is a kind of a still roaring or loud whisper. Then he describes it as the great exchange of all discourses, and he affirms, very correctly no doubt, that no business whatsoever but is here on foot. Hereupon the writer becomes somewhat sarcastic, and he informs his readers that all things are sold here, and honesty by inch of candle, but woe be to the purchaser, for it will never thrive with him. All manner of salesmen crowded round the place, and at the entrance to the front portico, nostrums of every kind were advertised by placards and commended in loud voices by the vendors, and the credulous could buy, at varying rates, any species of drug which they were led to believe of service to humanity in the removal of every bodily infirmity and even the unlimited prolongation of life. Crowds of merely curious citizens and strangers always gathered around at exchange hours, and many of these brought their wives, daughters, or sweethearts to enjoy the sights, and all the shops in the neighborhood did a roaring trade. The names of some of the well-known bankers of that time are identified with great financial business even in our own day. The millionaires, the multi-millionaires of our present era, were unknown figures in the reign of Queen Anne. The greatest fortune amassed in trade or commerce or accomplished by successful speculation at that time would seem but very modest wealth if compared with the vast sums of money realized by the successful projector or speculator of a more recent day. The great private companies or trusts, as they would be called in the United States, were the creation of an age nearer to our own, and of business developments which had not blossomed into full existence, had hardly, indeed, 
come into existence at all during the period pictured in Mr. Ashton's volumes. Education, as we have said, had not spread itself in Queen Anne's days, or even in days much later, among that vast proportion of the population where the parents of the children could not afford to pay for their teaching, or did not regard book-learning as a thing worth paying for or worth the trouble of daily attendance. But it has to be stated that Queen Anne's times saw the systematic beginning of the charity school institution, which did something toward that work of free education now put within the reach even of the very poorest by our modern creation of board schools. Some of the famous schools existing in our own times were recognized institutions in London then. The Westminster School, the Merchant Tailors, Greyfriars, Christ's Hospital, and many others were flourishing. Among the classes which were above the restrictions of mere poverty, a classical education, as we still term it, and more especially the teaching of Latin, obtained much favor with parents. It was regarded as an essential part of every gentleman's education that he should be compelled, in his scholastic days, to go through a certain study of Latin and the Latin authors, with at least an infusion of the literature of classic Greece. The famous saying of Prince Bismarck, that it was better for a man to have forgotten Latin and Greek than never to have learned anything of them, appears to have been the central theory of education when Anne was Queen of England. The modern languages, at least French, Italian, and German, were special studies which were only insisted upon when they were regarded as likely to be of direct and practical advantage in the student's future course of life. The education of girls seldom went beyond French, a little music, skill in dancing, the use of the needle, and, of course, reading and writing of English without, however, any very pedantic attention to precision in the perplexing work of spelling. On the other hand, greater pains were probably taken at that time than in our own for the training of every girl to be an accomplished housewife and to regard the cooking of dainty dishes as one of the accomplishments necessary to a well-brought-up young lady. The age undoubtedly produced many highly cultured women in England, but the general ideas as to the mental education of a woman were entirely different from those which dictated the mental education of a man, and that a sister should read and study the books which were thought essential for the proper bringing up of her brother was no more held in favor than the idea that she ought to learn as well as he how to swim and how to handle the rapier. Well-bred parents during the reign of Queen Anne would have been as much surprised to hear of a girl studying Latin as they would have been to hear of the same girl learning how to take her part in open-air contests of skill with her brother and his schoolboy friends. The club was now becoming a favorite social institution, although it was not yet anything like the widespread organization which has interwoven itself so universally into the social and political life of all civilized countries at the present time. The October Club was, for a while, the principal and the most prosperous institution of the kind in the reign of Anne. This was the Club of the High Tories, who then regarded themselves as especially representing the gentlemen and the gentlemanlike traditions of England. The country party met in social and political converse there, and the name of the club was taken from the good old October ale, which was popularly and traditionally supposed to be the favorite beverage of all sound country Tories. In one of his letters to Stella, Swift tells that we are plagued here with an October club that is a set of above a hundred Parliament men of the country who drink October beer at home and meet every evening at a tavern near the Parliament to consult affairs and drive things on to extremes against the Whigs, to call the old ministry to account, and he adds that the ministry seems not to regard them Yet one of them in confidence told me 
that there must be something thought on to settle things better. We can perhaps without difficulty form a kind of comparison between the October Club and certain political institutions of a time nearer to our own, although the party organizations of a more recent date have quite outgrown the idea of holding their meetings within the walls of an ordinary Westminster tavern, and must have their own private edifices of vast extent, solid structure, and imposing frontage. The Cavs Head Club will perhaps assist us to carry on the comparison. This club was the centre of opposition to Toryism, and it was described and denounced by Tory pamphleteers of that day as a downright Republican institution, or even worse, which was accustomed to celebrate with musical rejoicing the anniversary of the day on which Charles I was done to death. Some of these pamphleteers point as conclusive evidence of the truth of their charges to the fact that the members of the Cavs Head Club consisted in great part of independents and Anabaptists and other nonconformists. In other words, the Cavs Head Club was described by its enemies in very much the same spirit as that in which one of the earlier radical clubs might have been shown up by a Tory zealot in the days before the representative system had yet expanded into something like household suffrage. The Kit Kat Club was one of the most famous clubs of the time. It was called from the mutton pies, then known as Kit Kats, although why they were thus designated is not quite certain. It succeeded in establishing a distinct reputation of its own, and we need not trouble ourselves now by any revival of the controversy about the derivation of its whimsical title. So far as it was a political organization, it may be set down as belonging to the Whig Party, but it was especially the meeting place of wits and humorists and literary men of all political orders and shades. Its leading members had the honor of having their portraits painted by Sir Godfrey Kneller in three-quarter lengths, and for a time all sketches in such form obtained the generic name of Kit Kats. The drinking glasses used by the club were adorned by mottos taken from verses written by Sir Samuel Garth, author of The Dispensary, and Sir Richard Blackmer wrote in 1708 a poem called The Kit Kats. This club held its meetings at a tavern in King Street, Westminster. The Beefsteak Club and the Saturday Club held a leading place among the social gatherings of the day. Swift often speaks of the Saturday Club, and he tells Stella that, I dined with Lord Treasurer and shall again tomorrow, which is his day when all the ministers dine with him. The clubhouse in Queen Anne's reign, if we can call that a club which seldom aspired to meet in a building of its own, seems always to have been the meeting place of men who gathered together for some special purpose to promote political objects or to discuss art and literature or to bring together a number of kindred spirits for the sake of mere social companionship and hilarity. The club rooms of modern times where men go to write their letters and read the newspapers and are not supposed to enter of necessity into friendly relationship or even into casual conversation with other members whom they happen to meet there do not seem to have flourished much during the reign of Queen Anne. Then, as now, there were certain clubs which, apart from any question of political organization, were supposed to confer distinction on every one who was fortunate enough to be received as a member. At that time, as in our own, a young man's chances of finding a favorable reception in good society of this or that political order, or of no political order in particular, might be greatly advanced by the mere fact that he belonged to some club of high and established reputation. The coffee houses and chocolate houses were a special feature of London's social life in Queen Anne's reign, and the names and the ways of some of them have found an abiding place in literature. 
The coffee house was not a novelty at that time, but in Queen Anne's reign it reached its highest popularity. It must not be supposed that the coffee houses served out to their customers no drinks stronger than coffee, for some of them had the reputation of recognizing no scrupulous teetotal restrictions as to the character of the potations they were willing to supply to all who entered the premises. In general, however, the coffee house was used as a place for the sipping of coffee and the hearing of news. Certain of these houses had a distinct political character, and Defoe tells us that a Whig would no more go to the Cocoa Tree Chocolate House than a Tory would be seen at the coffee house of St. James. Buttons has won a distinct fame of its own because it was so much frequented by Addison and his friends. It stood in Russell Street, Covent Garden. The lion's head, which was used there as a letter box, has been mentioned in many a brilliant paper of that time, and after various removals when Buttons' coffee house was taken down, came into the possession of the Bedford family, and was preserved as a relic. The names of Garraways, of Lloyds, and some others are still remembered by everyone, and represent important institutions which have long outgrown the original purpose of the founders. The coffee house of the better order was indeed a sort of club without the exclusiveness belonging to actual enrollment as a member. There was a certain exclusiveness maintained, in fact, although not in name, by the character which each of the important coffee houses gradually came to acquire. One, as we have said, became the resort of Tories in general, and after a while few but Tories ever cared to cross its threshold. Another was frequented by leading Whigs and visitors who were not Whigs, soon found themselves out of place there and ceased to enter it. A third was recognized as the haunt of literary men and wits, and although mere strangers, whether residents of London or visitors from the country, were glad to look in for the sake of seeing distinguished men and the chance of hearing good things said, and were proud to be able to talk to their friends about all they had seen and all they had heard, and perhaps a good deal that they had not seen or heard, yet they did not feel themselves quite at home in such a place and were regarded as mere outsiders even by themselves. It often happened that when a man of political or literary distinction gave a dinner to some of his friends at the coffee house, which he especially patronized, the host entertained his guests with wine supplied from his own cellar, and the proprietor of the coffee house received a small payment for his acquiescence in this foreign importation. The coffee house, in fact, held a place between the club and the tavern. It was more free and easy than the club, but anybody, however eminent his name or exalted his class, might go there without causing any of the scandal, which would have been certain to arise if he were seen to enter an ordinary tavern. The coffee house was one of the characteristic institutions of the age and the literature of Queen Anne's reign pays ample tribute to its peculiarities, its popularity, and its influence on the manners of the time. Queen Anne was not a patroness of the drama, and appears even to have had a conscientious objection to giving it any encouragement by her own presence within the walls of a theatre but she showed a close and keen interest in the dramatic performances of her time, at least so far as that interest could be manifested by frequent and no doubt well-meant endeavors to make the manners of the theatre conform with her own ideas of decorum and propriety. Again and again she issued manifestations of her royal will that certain freedoms of speech, of gesture, or of costume on the stage or behind the scenes should be modified in accordance with seemliness and modesty. The good queen, although she never entered a playhouse, evidently kept herself well informed about all that was going on in the London theatres, and was ready at any moment to interpose by royal admonition 
when she had reason to believe that something was said or done which it would have offended her eyes to see and her ears to hear. One of these proclamations, which is prefixed and are, admonishes that we have already given orders to the master of our revels and also to both the companies of comedians acting in Drury Lane and Lincoln's Inn Fields to take special care that nothing be acted in either of the theatres contrary to religion or good manners upon pain of our high displeasure and of being silenced from further acting and being further desirous to reform all other indecencies and abuses of the stage which have occasioned great disorders and justly give offence our will and pleasure therefore is and we do hereby strictly command that no person of what quality soever presume to go behind the scenes or come upon the stage either before or during the acting of any play that no woman be allowed or presume to wear a vizard mask in either of the theatres and that no person come into either house without paying the prices established for their respective places it concludes by threatening severe penalties for any infraction of these orders on january twentieth seventeen o four the house of lords returned thanks to the queen for her determination to restrain the playhouses from immorality and indecent behaviour another proclamation issued not long after in the same year takes notice that complaints have been made to her majesty of many indecent profane and immoral expressions that are usually spoken by players and mountebanks contrary to religion and good manners and requiring that the master of the revels shall take care to have all plays and other performances brought fairly written to him at his office in somerset house to be corrected by him before they shall be set on the stage under severe penalties in case of neglect of this revision the same orders were specially applied to all companies of strolling actors all mountebanks and keepers of puppet shows and announced that without the revision and permission of the master of the revels these exhibitions too would be subject to penalties no matter what other licenses they might profess to have the queen even issued orders to regulate the conduct of the lackeys and footmen sent by persons of rank to keep places for them until their arrival at the theatre inasmuch as it appeared that the conduct of these lackeys and footmen sometimes caused much offence to the regular frequenters of the theatre some of us can well remember that her late majesty queen victoria on more than one occasion published a letter with her own signature condemning certain performances chiefly acrobatic exhibitions and such like because they brought with them danger to the lives of the acrobats and led to accidents which ended in the death of women taking part in such performances but queen victoria never seems to have had occasion to proscribe any of the ordinary performances at the theatre and no doubt felt that she could safely trust to the care of the lord chamberlain who held office under the authority of the court perhaps the modern reader might be inclined to wonder why queen anne when she interfered so often with the practices of the theatres did not feel it necessary to issue any orders against the representation of certain pieces the scenes and dialogue of which contained so much that in modern days would have been regarded as intolerable by any audience queen anne however could only act according to her lights and according to the manners of her age and some of the most popular and successful plays of that time written by authors of established renown contained scenes and dialogues which a barn-door company of strolling actors would not venture to produce before any audience of our time indeed the good queen anne when on rare occasions she had plays performed in her own palace of st james was content to authorize and look upon such pieces as dryden's all for love or the world well lost 
which would certainly startle a modern audience out of its propriety. The fact is worthy of notice merely as an illustration of the different ideas as to dramatic seemliness which prevail in different ages, for there can be no question as to the purity of Queen Anne's mind and her rigorous resolve to encourage or tolerate nothing which seemed to her likely to contaminate the morals of the performers or the spectators. It has also to be borne in mind that the comedies of the Restoration were many of them so grossly indecent, in purpose as well as in language, that the new order of things introduced under Queen Anne's authority must have seemed like the work of a complete moral reformation. London during Queen Anne's reign had three great theatres generally open throughout the season. There were indeed four or five theatres altogether, but all these seldom invited audiences at one time. Drury Lane, the Queen's Theatre in the Haymarket, Dorset Gardens, and the House in Lincoln's Inn Fields were those which especially commanded public attention. The Italian opera was then an institution of recent origin and was the object of much satirical criticism among writers of the day who regarded it as rather an effeminate and ignoble sort of innovation. It was not until a late period of the reign that Handel, then a young man, began to be appreciated in England. Betterton was still acting during the reign of Queen Anne, although he had passed his prime when Queen Anne came to the throne, and his death was hastened in April of 1710 by his persistency in keeping up his performances when he was suffering from a severe attack of the gout, which had been his constant enemy through life, and then proved fatal to him. Betterton was unquestionably one of the great actors of the English stage, he had to strive against many serious physical defects. He had small eyes and a broad face, a very stout figure, thick legs and large feet, and his voice was naturally low and unmusical. Yet he was able to manage and modulate his voice so that he could make every note and tone of it tell upon the largest audience and could command the rapt attention of every listener. Addison, Dryden, and other men, whose recommendation must carry immortal praise with it, have borne testimony to the commanding power of his dramatic genius. His grave in Westminster Abbey was the well-deserved national recognition of the great work he had done for the English stage. Richard Steele declared of him that he ought to be recorded among the English with the same respect as Roscius among the Romans. Another actor of a very different order, Thomas Doggett, an Irishman by birth, was one of the most distinguished performers in Queen Anne's time. He outlived the reign by many years, but he had given up acting at any regular theater before Queen Anne's death. From all we read of him, he would seem to have been inspired by the very genius of comedy. Perhaps he is best remembered in later days by the fact that he left in his will the provision for the annual sculling prize, Doggett's Coat and Badge, to be contended for by Thames Waterman on the anniversary of the accession of George I. Collie Sibber was one of the dramatic celebrities of the age. He made himself so much of a celebrity that the satirists and wits of the time found endless theme for droll comment on his personal peculiarities. He was a dramatic author, poet, or at least a composer of lines and rhymes, and he was also an actor. He began his career upon the boards at a salary of ten shillings a week, which was increased to fifteen, and at that rate of pay he continued to perform for some time, but he afterwards became successful as a dramatic manager and held a partnership in some of the best London theatres. As an actor, comedy was his peculiar line, and he seems to have had the good fortune to hit on certain parts which exactly suited his physical peculiarities. He was not one of the performers who insist on playing great parts for which neither age nor appearance gives them natural adaptation. His voice was weak and thin, 
neither his face nor his figure had anything picturesque or commanding. One or two of his comic parts won for him the praise of Congreve, which was commendation enough to entitle him to be recorded in the history of the stage. Some of his plays, The Careless Husband, for instance, are still remembered, and the version of Moliere's Tartuffe, which he called The Non-Juror, was distinctly a paying success. The Provoked Husband, he wrote in combination with Vanbrugh, Many years after Queen Anne's death, he was actually made poet laureate, and he is the author of some birthday odes, which are perhaps not much inferior to other works having a similar purpose by authors with much better claims than his to the poet laureate's place. He adapted to the stage of his time some of Shakespeare's plays, and his version of Richard III might have been called, in one sense, a theatric success. One is inclined to think that no sharper satire on the poetic taste of the English public in his time could be recorded than the fact that his Richard III was accepted as a distinct improvement on Shakespeare's dramatic effort. We have to bear in mind that although the age of Anne produced some genuine poets of high order, it was certainly not an age which appreciated the genius of Shakespeare. The fact has already been mentioned that Dryden's All for Love or the World Well Lost was, during Queen Anne's reign, regarded as an improvement upon Antony and Cleopatra. There came, indeed, a long interval in the history of English dramatic art when the fame of Shakespeare suffered an eclipse, and when it seemed almost doubtful whether it was likely to shine again through the clouds of mannerism and unreality which hung over the intellectual atmosphere. England had apparently to wait for the time when the great German authors, Lessing and Goethe, were to teach the world that the England of Queen Elizabeth had brought forth a dramatic poet worthy to rank with the greatest of classic Greece. Barton Booth, the Booth of Addison's Cato, and one or two other actors of the same age are still remembered. Acting by women was comparatively new to the English stage, but Mrs. Berry, Mrs. Bracegirdle, and Mrs. Oldfield were actresses who would have made a mark on the history of any stage. The ballet was coming into favor about this time and had a place in the theatrical performances at most of the London houses. But it had as yet reached nothing like the position of importance which was given to it in more recent times. No splendor of decoration set off its unpretending display, nor was it possible then for a ballet dancer to win by any skill or charm the fame in the fashion of a Talione, a Cerito, or a Fanny Elsler. The time had not yet arrived when a successful ballet dancer could have been thought by fashionable people to make a maise alliance when she condescended to marry a rising tragedian like Garrick. End of chapter 11